Preface of Pamela, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Pamela, Volume Two, by Samuel Richardson. Preface. The author's original preface to Volume Two. The first part of Pamela met with a success greatly exceeding the most sanguine expectations and the editor's hopes that the letters which compose this part will be found equally written to nature, avoiding all romantic nights, improbable surprises, and irrational machinery, and the passions are touched where requisite and rules equally new and practicable inculcated throughout the whole, for the general conduct of life, and therefore he flatters himself that they may expect the good fortune which few continuations have met with to be judged not unworthy the first part nor disproportioned to the more exalted condition in which pamela was destined to shine as an affectionate wife a faithful friend a polite and kind neighbour an indulgent mother and a beneficent mistress after having in the former part supported the character of a dutiful child a spotless virgin and a modest and amiable bride the reader will easily see that in so great a choice of materials as must arise from a multitude of important subjects in a married life to such geniuses and friendships as those of mr and mrs b the editor's greatest difficulty was how to bring them within the compass which he was determined not to exceed and it having been left to his own choice in what manner to digest and publish the letters and where to close the work he had intended at first in regard to his other avocations to have carried the piece no farther than the first part it may be expected therefore that he should enter into an explanation of the reasons whereby he was provoked into a necessity of altering his intention but he is willing to decline saying anything upon so well known a subject the editor has been much pressed with importunities and conjectures in relation to the person and family of the gentlemen who are the principal persons in the work all he thinks himself at liberty to say or is necessary to be said is only to repeat what has already been hinted that the story has its foundation in truth and that there was a necessity for obvious reasons to vary and disguise some facts and circumstances as also the names of persons, places, etc. End of preface. Letter one of Pamela, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. Pamela, volume two by Samuel Richardson. Letter one my dear father and mother we arrived here last night highly pleased with our journey and the occasion of it may god bless you both with long life and health to enjoy your sweet farm and pretty dwelling which is just what i wished it to be and don't make your grateful hearts too uneasy in the possession of it by your modest diffidence of your own unworthiness for at the same time that it is what will do honour to the best of men it is not so very extraordinary considering his condition as to cause any one to censure it as the effect of a too partial and injudicious kindness for the parents of one whom he delighteth to honour. My dear master, why should I not still call him so, bound to reverence him as I am, in every light he can shine into the most obliging and sensible heart, still proposes to fit up the large parlour and three apartments in the commodious dwelling he calls yours, for his entertainment and mine, when I pay my duty to you both, for a few happy days, and he has actually given orders to that effect, and that the three apartments be so fitted up as to be rather suitable to your condition than his own, for he says the plain and simple elegance, which he will have observed in the rooms, as well as the furniture, will be a variety in his retirement to this place, that will make him return to his own with the greater pleasure, and at the same time, when we are not there, will be of use for the reception of any of your friends, and so he shall not, as he kindly says, rob the good couple of any of their accommodations. The old bow-windows he will have preserved, 
but will not have them sashed, nor the woodbines, jessamines, and vines, that run up against them destroyed. Only he will have larger panes of glass, and more convenient casements, to let in the sweet air and light, and make amends for that obstructed by the shades of those fragrant climbers. For he has mentioned, three or four times, how gratefully they dispensed their intermingled odours to us, when the last evening we stood at the window, to hear the responsive songs of two warbling nightingales, one at a distance, the other near, which delighted us for above two hours, and the more, as we thought their season had been over. And when they had done, he made me sing him one, for which he rewarded me with a kiss, saying, How greatly do the innocent pleasures I now hourly taste exceed the guilty tumults that used formerly to agitate my unequal mind! Never talk, my Pamela, as you frequently do, of obligation to me. One such hour as I now enjoy is an ample reward for all the benefits I can confer on you and yours in my whole life. The parlour will indeed be more elegant, though that is to be rather plain than rich, as well in its wainscot as furniture, and to be new floored. The dear gentleman has already given orders, and you will soon have workmen to put them in execution. The parlour doors are to have brass hinges and locks, and to shut as close, he tells them, as a watch-case. For who knows, said he, my dear, but we shall have still added blessings in two or three charming boys and girls to place there in their infancy, before they can be of age to be benefited by your lessons and example. And besides, I shall no doubt entertain there some of my chosen friends in their excursions for a day or two. How am I, every hour of my life, overwhelmed with instances of God's almighty goodness in his? O oh, spare, blessed Father of mercies, the precious life of this excellent man! Increase my thankfulness and my worthiness, and then— But what shall I say? Only that I may continue to be what I am, for more blessed and happy in my own mind I cannot be. The beds he will have of cloth, as he thinks the situation a little cold, especially when the wind is easterly and purposes to be down in the early spring season, now and then, as well as in the latter autumn, and the window curtains of the same, in one room red and the other green, but plain, lest you should be afraid to use them occasionally. The carpets for them will be sent with the other furniture, for he will not alter the old oaken floors of the bedchamber, nor the little room he intends for my use, when I choose not to join in such company as may happen to fall in. Which, my dear, says he, shall be as little as is possible, only particular friends, who may be disposed, one in a year or two, to see when I am there, how I live with my Pamela and her parents, and how I pass my time in my retirement, as I shall call this, or perhaps they will be apt to think me ashamed of company I shall always be pleased with. Nor are you, my dear, to take this as a compliment to yourself, but a piece of requisite policy in me. For who will offer to reproach me with marrying, as the world thinks, blow me, when they shall see that I not only pride myself in my Pamela, but take pleasure in owning her relations as mine, and visiting them, and receiving visits from them, and yet offer not to set them up in such a glaring light, as if I would have the world forget, who in that case would always take the more pleasure in remembering what they were? And how will it anticipate low reflection when they shall see— I can bend my mind to partake with them the pleasure of their humble but decent life. I, continued he, and be rewarded for it, too, with better health, better spirits, and a better mind. So that, my dear, added he, I shall reap more benefit by what I propose to do than I shall confer. In this generous manner does this best of men endeavour to disclaim, though I must be very ungrateful if, with me, it did not enhance— the proper merit of a beneficence natural to him, and which indeed, as I tell him, may be in one respect deprecated, inasmuch as, so excellent is his nature, he cannot help it if he would. Oh, that it was in my power to recompense him for it! But I am poor, as I have often said, in everything but will, and that is wholly his, and what a happiness it is to me, a happiness I could not so early have hoped for, that I can say without reserve, since the dear object of it requires nothing of me but what is consistent with my duty to the supreme benefactor, the first mover, and to the cause of all his own happiness, of my happiness, and that of my dear, my ever-dear parents. Your dutiful and happy daughter. End of letter one. Letter number two of Pamela, volume two. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela, Volume 2, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 2 My dearest daughter, I need not repeat to you the sense your good mother and I have of our happiness and of our obligations to your honoured spouse. You both were pleased witnesses of it every hour of the happy fortnight you passed with us. Yet, my dear, we hardly know how to address ourselves even to you, much less to the squire, with the freedom he so often invited us to take. For I don't know how it is, but though you are our daughter, and so far from being lifted up by your high condition, that we see no difference in your behaviour to us, your poor parents, yet, viewing you as the lady of so fine a gentleman, we cannot forbear having a kind of respect, and, I don't know what to call it, that lays a little restraint upon us. And yet we should not, methinks, let our minds be run away with the admiration of worldly grandeur, so as to set too much by it. But your merit and prudence are so much above all we could ever have any notion of, and to have gentry come only to behold and admire you, not so much for your gentleness and amiableness, or for your behaviour and affability to poor as well as rich, and to hear every one calling you an angel, and saying you deserve to be what you are, make us hardly know how to look upon you, but as an angel indeed. I am sure you have been a good angel to us since for your sake God Almighty has put it into your honoured husband's heart to make us the happiest couple in the world. But little less we should have been had we only in some far distant land heard of our dear child's happiness, and never partaken of the benefits of it ourselves. But thus to be provided for, thus kindly to be owned, and called father and mother by such a brave gentleman— and so placed as to have nothing to do but to bless God, him, and you, and hourly pray for you both, is a providence too mighty to be borne by us with equalness of temper. We kneel together every morning, noon, and night, and weep and rejoice and rejoice and weep, to think how our unworthiness is distinguished, and how God has provided for us in our latter days, when all our fear was that, as we grew older and more infirm and worn out by hard labour, we should be troublesome, where— not our pride, but our industrious wills, would have made us wish not to be so, but to be entitled to a happier lot, for this would have grieved us the more, for the sake of you, my dear child, and your unhappy brother's children, for it is well known that, though we pretend not to boast of our family, and indeed have no reason, yet none of us were ever sunk so low as I was, to be sure, partly by my own fault, for— had it been for your poor aged mother's sake only, I ought not to have done what I did, for John and William, for so unhappy were they, poor lads, that what I could do was but as a drop of water to a bucket. You command me, let me as writing to Mr. B.'s lady say command, though as to my dear daughter I will only say desire, and indeed I will not, as you wish me not to do, let the one condition which was accidental put the other, which was natural, out of my thought. You spoke it in better words, but this was the sense. But you have the gift of utterance, and education is a fine thing where it meets with such talents to improve upon as God has given you. Yet uh, let me not forget what I was going to say. You command, or if you please, you desire me to write long letters, and often— and how can I help it if I would? For when here in this happy dwelling and this well-stocked farm, in these rich meadows and well-cropped acres, we look around us, and which way soever we turn our head, see blessings upon blessings, and plenty upon plenty, see barns well stored, poultry increasing, the kine lowing and crowding about us, and a bid to call them our own, then think that all is the reward of our child's virtue. Oh, my dear daughter, who can bear these things? Excuse me, I must break off a little, for my eyes are as full as my heart, and I will retire to bless God and your honoured husband. So, my dear child, I now again take up my pen, but reading what I had written in order to carry on the thread, I can hardly forbear again being in one sort affected. But do you think I will call all these things my own? 
Do you think I would live rent-free? Can the honoured squire believe that having such a generous example before me, if I had no gratitude in my temper before, I could help being touched by such as one as he sets me? If this goodness makes him know no mean in giving, shall I be so greedy as to know none in receiving? Come, come, my dear child, your poor father is not so sordid a wretch neither. He will show the world that all these benefits are not thrown away upon one who will disgrace you as much by his temper as by his condition. But though I cannot be as worthy of all these favours as I wish, I will be as worthy as I can. And let me tell you, my dear child, if the king and his royal family, God bless them, be not ashamed to receive taxes and duties from his subjects, if dukes and earls and all the top gentry cannot support their bravery without having their rents paid, I hope I shall not affront the squire to pay to his steward what any other person would pay for his noble stock and improving farm, and I will do it if it please God to bless me with life and health. I should not be worthy to crawl upon the earth if I did not. And what did I say to Mr. Longman, the faithful Mr. Longman? Sure no gentleman had ever a more worthy steward than he. It was as we were walking over the grounds together, and observing in what good order everything was, he was praising some little contrivances of my own for the improvement of the farm, and saying how comfortably he hoped we might live upon it. I, Mr. Longman, said I, comfortably, indeed, but do you think I could be properly said to live if I was not to pay as much rent for it as another? I can tell you, said he, the squire will not receive anything from you, Goodman Andrews. Why, man, he has no occasion for it. He's worth a power of money, besides a noble and clear estate in land. Ads heart likens, you must not affront him, I can tell you that. He's as generous as a prince, where he takes, but he is hasty and will have his own way. Why, for that reason, Mr. Longman, said I, I was thinking to make you my friend. Make me your friend? You have not a better in the world to my power, I can tell you that, nor your dame neither, for I love such honest hearts. I wish my own brother would let me love him as well, but let that pass. What I can do for you I will, and here's my hand upon it. Well then, said I, it is this. Let me account to you at the rent Farmer Dickens offered— and let me know what the stock cost, and what the crops are valued at, and pay the one as I can, and the other quarterly, and not let the squire know it till you can't choose, and I shall be as happy as a prince, for I doubt not by God's blessing to make a comfortable livelihood of it besides. Why, dost believe, Goodman Andrew, said he, that I would do such a thing? Would not his honour think if I hid one thing from him I might hide another? Go to, honest heart, I love thee dearly, but can Mr. B. do too much for his lady, thinkest thou? Come, come! And he jeered me so, I knew not what to say. I wish at bottom there is not some pride in this. What I warrant, you would not be too much beholden to his honour, would you? No, said I, it is not that, I am sure. If I have any pride, it is only in my dear child, to whom under God all this is owing. But somehow or other it shall be so. And so, my dear daughter, I resolve it shall and it will be, over and above, one of the greatest pleasures to me to do the good squire service, as well as to be so much benefited and obliged by him. Our eldest grandson Thomas desires to come and live with us. The boy is honest, and I hear industrious, and Cousin Burroughs wants me to employ his son Roger, who understands the business of a farm very well. It is no wonder that all one's relations should wish to partake of our happy lot, and if they can and will do their business as well as others, I see not why relationships should be an objection. But yet I think one should not beleaguer, as one may say, your honoured husband with one's relations. You, my best child, will give me always your advice, as to my carriage in this my new lot, for I would not for the world be thought an encroacher, and you have so followed than yours. Our blessing, I am sure you have blessed us, attend you, my dearest child, and may you be as happy as you have made us. I cannot wish you to be happier, because I have no notion how it can be in this life. Conclude us, your ever-loving father and mother, John and Eliz Andrews. May we hope to be favoured now and then with a letter from you, my dear child, like some of your former, to let us know how you go on. It would be a great joy to us, indeed it would. But we know you'll have enough to do without obliging us in this way. So must acquiesce.
End of letter two. Recording by Nigel Carrington. Letter three of Pamela, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Pamela, Volume 2, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 3. My dear father and mother, I have showed your letter to my beloved. Don't be uneasy that I have, for you need not be ashamed of it, since it is my pride to have such honest and grateful parents. And I'll tell you what he said to it, as the best argument I can use, why you should not be uneasy, but enjoy without pain or anxiety all the benefits of your happy lot. Dear good souls, said he, now everything they say and write manifests the worthiness of their hearts. No wonder, Pamela, you love and revere such honest minds, for that you would do, were they not your parents, and tell them that I am so far from having them believe what I have done for them, were only from my affection for their daughter, and let them find out another couple as worthy as they are, and I will do as much for them. I would not place them, he continued, in the same country, because I would wish two counties to be blessed for their sakes. Tell them, my dear, that they have a right to what they enjoy on the foot of their own proper merit, and bid them enjoy it at their patrimony and if anything arise that is more than they themselves can wish for in their way of life, let them look among their own relations, where it may be acceptable, and communicate to them the like solid reasons for rejoicing in the situation they are pleased with. And do you, my dear, still farther enable them, as you shall judge proper, to gratify their enlarged hearts for fear they should deny any comfort to themselves, in order to do good to others i could only fly to his generous bosom for this is a subject which most affects me and with my eyes swimming in tears of grateful joy and which overflowed as soon as my bold lips touched his dear face bless god and bless him with my whole heart for speak i could not but almost choked with my joy sobbed to him my grateful acknowledgments he clasped me in his arms and said, How, my dearest, do you overpay me for the little I have done for your parents, if it be thus to be blessed for conferring benefits so insignificant to a man of my fortune? What joys is it not in the power of rich men to give themselves whenever they please? For tastes, indeed, of those we are bid to hope for, which can surely only exceed these, as then we shall be all intellect and better fitted to receive them tis too much too much said i in broken accents how am i oppressed with the pleasure you give me oh sir bless me more gradually and more cautiously for i cannot bear it and indeed my heart went flutter 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 at his dear breast as if it wanted to break its too narrow prison to mingle still more intimately with his own. Surely, my beloved parents, nobody's happiness is so great as mine. If it proceeds thus from degree to degree, and is to be augmented by the charming hope that the dear second author of our blessings be the uniformly good as well as the partially kind man to us, what a felicity will this be! And if our prayer shall be heard, and we shall have the pleasure to think that his advances in piety are owing not a little to them, and to the example God shall give us grace to set, then indeed may we take the pride to think we have repaid his goodness to us, and that we have satisfied the debt which nothing less can discharge. Forgive me, my worthy parents, if my style on this subject be raised above the natural simplicity more suited to my humble talents. But how can I help it? For when the mind is elevated, ought not the sense we have of our happiness to make our expressions soar equally? 
can the affections be so highly raised as mine on these occasions and the thoughts creep groveling like one's ordinary self no indeed call not this therefore the gift of utterance if it should appear to you in a better light than it deserves it is the gift of gratitude a gift which makes you and me to speak and write as i hope it will make us act above ourselves thus will our gratitude be the inspirer of joy to our common benefactor and his joy will heighten our gratitude and so we shall proceed as cause and effect to each other's happiness to bless the dear man who blesses us and will it be right then to say you are uneasy under such at least as to your wills returned and discharged obligations god almighty requires only a thankful heart for all the mercies he heaps upon the children of men my dear mr b who in these particulars imitates divinity desires no more you have this thankful heart and that to such a high degree of gratitude that nobody can exceed you but yet when your worthy minds would be too much affected with your gratitude so as to lay under the restraints you mention to the dear gentleman and for his sake to your dependent daughter let me humbly advise you with more particular more abstracted aspirations than at other times to raise your thoughts upwards and consider who it is that gives him the opportunity and pray for him and for me for him that all his future actions may be of a peace with his noble disposition of mind for me that i may continue humble and consider myself blessed for your sakes and in order that i may be in some sort a rewarder in the hands of providence of this its dear excellent agent and then we shall look forward all of us with pleasure indeed to that state where there is no distinction of degree and where the humble cottager shall be upon a par with the proudest monarch oh my dear parents how can you as in your postscript say may we not be favoured now and then with a letter call me your daughter your pamela i am no lady to you i have more pleasure to be called your comfort and thought to act worthy of the sentiments with which your example and instructions have inspired me than in any other thing in this life my determined duty to our common benefactor the best of gentlemen and husbands excepted god has blessed me for your sakes and has thus answered for me all your prayers nay more than answered all you or i could have wished or hoped for we only prayed only hoped that god would preserve you honest and me virtuous and oh see my excellent parents how we are crowned with blessings upon blessings till we are the talk of all that know us hence my dear parents i mean from the delight i have in writing to you which transports me far above my own sphere you'll see that i must write and cannot help it if i would and will it be a great joy to you and is there anything that can add to your joy think you in the power of your pamela that she would not do oh that the lives and healths of my dearest mr b and you my parents may be continued to me and who can then be so blessed as your pamela i will write depend on it in every occasion and you augment my joys to think it is in my power to add to your comforts nor can you conceive my pleasure in hoping that this your new happy lot may by relieving you from corroding care and the two wearying effects of hard labor add in these your advanced years to both your days for so happy am i i can have no grief no pain in looking forward but from reflecting that one day we must be separated but it is fit that we so comport ourselves as not to embitter our present happiness with prospects too gloomy but bring our minds to be cheerfully thankful for the present wisely to enjoy that present as we go along and at last when all is to be wound up lie down and say not mine but thy will be done i have written much yet have still more to say relating to other parts of your kind acceptable letter 
and so will soon write again for i must think every opportunity happy whereby i can assure you how much i am and will ever be without any addition to my name if it will make you easier you dutiful pamela end of letter three Letter four of Pamela Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Pamela Volume two by Samuel Richardson. Letter four. My dearest father and mother. I now write again as I told you I should in my last but I am half afraid to look at the copy of it for your worthy hearts so visible in your letter and my beloved's kind deportment upon showing it to him raised me into a frame of mind bordering on ecstasy yet I wrote my heart but you must not my dear father write to your Pamela so affectingly your steadier mind could hardly bear your own moving strain and you were forced to lay down your pen and retire how then could i who love you so dearly if you had not increased that love by fresh and stronger instances of your worthiness forbear being affected and raised above myself but i will not again touch upon this subject you must know then that my dearest spouse commands me with his kind respects to tell you he has thought of a method to make your worthy hearts easy those were his words and this is said he by putting that whole estate with the new purchase under your father's care as i at first intended he shall receive and pay and order everything as he pleases and longman who grows in years shall be eased of that burden your father writes a very legible hand and shall take what assistance he pleases and do you pamela see that this new task be made as easy and pleasant to him as possible he shall make up his accounts only to you my dear and there will be several pleasures arise to me upon it first that it will be a relief to honest longman who has business enough on his hands next it will make the good couple easy to have an opportunity of enjoying that as their due which now their two grateful hearts give them so many causeless scruples about thirdly it will employ your father's time more suitably to your liking and mine because with more ease to himself for you see his industrious will cannot be satisfied without doing something in the fourth place the management of this estate will gain him more respect and reverence among the tenants and his neighbours and yet be all in his own way for added he You'll see that it is always one point in view with me to endeavour to convince every one that I esteem and value them for their own intrinsic merit, and want not anybody to distinguish them in any other light than that in which they have been accustomed to appear. So, my dear father, the instrument will be drawn and brought you by honest Mr. Longman, who will be with you in a few days to put the last hand to the new purchase and to give you possession of your new commission if you accept it as i hope you will and the rather for my dear mr b s third reason and knowing that this trust will be discharged as worthily and as sufficiently after you are used to it as if mr longman himself was in it and better it cannot be mr longman is very fond of this relief and longs to be down to settle everything with you as to the proper powers the method etc and he says in his usual phrase that he'll make it as easy to you as a glove if you do accept it my dear mr b will leave everything to you as to rent where not already fixed and likewise as to acts of kindness and favour to be done where you think proper and he says that with his bad qualities he was ever deemed a kind landlord and that i can confirm in fifty instances to his honour so that old gentleman said he need not be afraid of being put upon severe or harsh methods of proceeding where things will do without and he can always befriend an honest man by which means the province will be entirely such as one as suits with his inclination if anything difficult or perplexing arises continued he or where a little knowledge in law matters is necessary 
Longmen shall do all that, and your father will see that he will not have in those points a coadjutor. Too hard-hearted for his wish, for it was a rule my father set me, and I have strictly followed, that although I have a lawyer for my steward, it was rather to know how to do right things than oppressive ones, and Longman has so well answered this intention, that he was always more noted for composing differences than promoting lawsuits. I dare say, my dear father, this will be acceptable to you, on the several accounts my dearest Mr. B. was pleased to mention. And what a charming contrivance is here! God for ever bless his considerate heart for it! To make you useful to him, and easy to yourself, as well as respected by, and even a benefactor to, all around you. What can one say to all these things? But what signifies exulting in one's gratitude for one's benefit? Every hour the dear man heaps new ones upon us, and we can hardly thank him for one, but a second, and a third, and so on, to countless degrees, confound one, and throw back our words upon our hearts before they are well formed, and oblige us to sit down under all with profound silence and admiration. As to the desire of cousin Thomas and Roger to live with you, I endeavour to sound what our dear benefactor's opinion was. He was pleased to say, I have no choice in this case, my dear. Your father is his own master. He may employ whom he pleases, and if they show respect to him and your mother, I think, as he rightly observes, relationship should rather have the preference, and as he can remedy inconveniences, if he finds any, by all means to let every branch of your family have reason to rejoice with him. But I have thought of this matter a good deal since I had the favour of your letter, and I hope, since you condescend to ask my advice, you will excuse me if I give it freely, yet entirely submitting all to your liking. First, then, I think it better to have anybody than relations, and for these reasons. One is apt to expect more regard from them, and they more indulgence than strangers can hope for. That where there is such a difference in the expectations of both, uneasiness cannot but arise that this will subject you to bear it, or to resent it, and to part with them. If you bear it, you will know no end of impositions. If you dismiss them, it will occasion ill-will. They will call you unkind, and you them ungrateful. And as your prosperous lot may raise your enviers, such will be apt to believe them rather than you. Then the world will be inclined to think that we are crowding upon a generous gentleman a numerous family of indigent people, and it will be said, the girl is filling every place with her relations, and beleaguering, as you significantly express it, a worthy gentleman, should one's kindred behave ever so worthily. So, in the next place, one would not, for their sakes, that this should be done. Who may live with less reproach and equal benefit anywhere else? For I would not wish any one of them to be lifted out of his station and made independent at Mr. B.'s expense, if their industry will not do it. Although I would never scruple to do anything reasonable to, to promote or assist that industry in the way of their callings. Then, my dear father, I apprehend that our honoured benefactor would be under some difficulty from his natural politeness and regard for you and me. You see how kindly, on all occasions, he treats you both, not only as the parents of his Pamela, but as if you were his own and if you had any body as your servants there, who called you cousin, or grandfather, or uncle, he would not care, when he came down, to treat them on the foot of common servants, though they might think themselves honoured, as they would be, and as I shall always think of myself, with his commands. And would it not, if they are modest and worthy, be as great a difficulty upon them, to be thus distinguished, as it would be to him and to me, for his sake? For otherwise, believe me, I hope you will, my dear father and mother, I could sit down and rejoice with the meanest and remotest relation I have. But in the world's eye, to everybody but my best of parents, I must, if ever so reluctant to it, appear in a light that may not give discredit to his choice. Then again, as I hinted, you will be able, without the least injury to our common benefactor, to do kinder things by any of our relations, when not with you, than you can do if they live with you. 
you may lend them a little money to put them in a way if anything offers that you think will be to their advantage you can fit out my she cousins with good reputable places the younger you can put to school or when fit to trades according to their talents and so they will of course be in a way to get an honest and creditable livelihood but above all things one would discourage such a proud and ambitious spirit in any of them as should want to raise itself by favour instead of merit and this the rather for undoubtedly there are many more happy persons in low than in high life take number for number all the world over i am sure although four or five years of different life have passed with me i had so much pride and pleasure in the thought of working for my living with you if i could but get honest to you that it made my confinement the more grievous and if possible aggravated the apprehensions attending it but i beg of you not to think these my reasons proceed from the bad motives of a heart tainted with pride on its high condition indeed there can be no reason for it to one who thinks after this manner the greatest families on earth have some among them who are unhappy and low in life and shall such a one reproach me with having twenty low relations because they have peradventure not above five let us then my dear parents endeavour to judge of one another as god at the last day will judge of us all and then the honest peasant will stand fairer in our esteem than the guilty peer in short this shall be my own rule every one who acts justly and honestly i will look upon as my relation whether so or not and the more he wants my assistance the more entitled to it he shall be as well as to my esteem while those who deserve it not must expect only compassion from me and my prayers were they my brothers or sisters tis true had i not been poor and lowly i might not have thought thus but if it be a right way of thinking it is a blessing that i was so and that shall never be matter of reproach to me which one day will be matter of justification upon the whole i should think it advisable my dear father and mother to make such kind excuses to the offered service of my cousins as your better reason shall suggest to you and to do anything else for them of more value as their circumstances may require or occasions offer to serve them but if the employing and having them about you will add comfort to your lives i give up entirely my own opinion and doubt not everything will be well thought of that you shall think fit to do and so i conclude with assuring you that i am my ever dear parents your dutiful and happy daughter the copy of this letter i will keep for myself till i have your answer that you may be under no difficulty how to act in either of the cases mentioned in it end of letter four Letter five of Pamela, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Pamela, Volume two, by Samuel Richardson. Letter five. My dearest daughter, how shall I do to answer, as they deserve, your last two letters? sure no happy couple ever had such a child as we have but it is in vain to aim at words like yours and equally in vain for us to offer to set forth the thankfulness of our hearts on the kind office your honoured husband has given us for no reason but to favour us still more and to quiet our minds in the notion of being useful to him god grant i may be able to be so happy shall i be if i can but i see the generous drift of his proposal it is only to make me more easy from the nature of my employment and in my mind too overloaded as i may say with benefits and at the same time to make me more respected in my new neighbourhood i can only say i most gratefully accept of the kind offer and since it will ease the worthy mr longman shall with still greater pleasure do all i can in it but i doubt i shall want ability but i will be just and honest however that by god's grace will be within my own capacity and that i hope i may answer for 
it is indeed to put it in my power to do good to those who shall deserve it and i will take double pains to find out the true merit of such as i shall recommend to favour and that their circumstances be really such as i shall represent them but one thing let me desire that i make up my accounts to mr longman or to his honour himself when he shall be here with us i don't know how but it will make me uneasy if i am to make up my accounts to you for so well known is your love to us that though you would no more do an unjust thing than by god's grace we should desire you yet this same ill-willing world might think it was like making up accounts to oneself do my dearest child get me off this difficulty and i can have no other for already i am in hopes i have hit upon a contrivance to improve the estate and to better the condition of the tenants at least not to worse them and which i hope will please everybody but i will acquaint mr longman with this and take his advice for i will not be too troublesome either to you my dear child or to your spouse if i could act so for his interests as not to be a burden what happy creatures should we both be in our own minds we find ourselves more and more respected by every one and so far as shall be consistent with our new trust we will endeavour to deserve it that we may interest as many as know us in our good wishes and prayers for the happiness of you both but let me say how much convinced i am by your reasons for not taking to us any of our relations every one of those reasons has its force with us how happy we are to have so prudent a daughter to advise with and i think myself obliged to promise this that whatever i do for any of them above the amount of forty shillings at one time i will take your direction in it that your wise hints of making every one continue their industry and not to rely upon favour instead of merit may be followed i am sure this is the way to make them happier as well as better men and women for as i have often thought if one were to have a hundred pounds a year it would not do without industry and with it one may do with a quarter of it and less in short my dear child your reasons are so good that i wonder they came not into my head before and then i needed not to have troubled you about the matter but yet it ran in my own thought that i could not like to be an encroacher for i hate a dirty thing and in the midst of my distresses never could be guilty of one thank god for it you rejoice our hearts beyond expression at the hope you give us of receiving letters from you now and then it will be the chief comfort of our lives next to seeing you as we expect we sometimes shall but yet my dear child don't let us inconvenience you neither pray don't you'll have enough upon your hands without to be sure you will the workmen have made a good progress and wish for mr longman to come down as we also do you need not be afraid we should think you proud or lifted up with your condition you have weathered the first dangers but for your fine clothes and jewels we should not see any difference between our dear pamela and the much respected mrs b but god has given you too much sense to be proud or lifted up i remember in your former writings a saying of your squires speaking of you that it was for persons not used to praise and who did not deserve it to be proud of it every day brings us instances of the good name his honour and you my dear child have left behind you in this country here comes one and then another and a third and a fourth good man andrews cries one and goody andrews cries another and some call us mr and mrs but we like the other full as well when heard you from his honour how does his lady do what a charming couple they are how lovingly do they live what an example do they give to all about them then one cries god bless them both and another cries amen and so says a third and a fourth and all say but when do you expect them down again such a one longs to see em and will ride a day's journey to have but a sight of them at church and then they say how this gentleman praises them and that lady admires them oh what a happiness is this how do your poor mother and i stand fixed to the earth to hear both your praises our tears trickling down our cheeks and our hearts heaving as if they would burst with joy till we are forced to take leave in half words and hand in hand go in together to bless god and bless you both oh my daughter what a happy couple have god and you made us 
your poor mother is very anxious about her dear child i will not touch upon the matter so very irksome to you to hear of but though the time may be some months off she every hour prays for your safety and happiness and all the increase of felicity that his honour's generous heart can wish for that is all we will say at present only that we are with continued prayers and blessings my dearest child your loving father and mother j and e andrews end of letter five Letter six of Pamela, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Pamela, Volume two, by Samuel Richardson. Letter six. From Lady Davis to Mrs. B. My dear Pamela. I intended to have been with you before this, but my lord has been a little indisposed with the gout, and Jackie has had an intermitting fever, but they are pretty well recovered, and it shall not be long before I see you, now I understand you are returned from your Kentish expedition. We have been exceedingly diverted with your papers. You have given us, by their means, many a delightful hour that otherwise would have hung heavy upon us, and we are all charmed with you. Lady Betty, and her noble mamma, has been of our party, whenever we have read your accounts. She is a dear, generous lady, and has shed with us many a tear over them, and my lord has not been unmoved, nor Jackie neither, at some of your distresses and reflections. Indeed, Pamela, you are a charming creature, and an ornament to your sex. We wanted to have had you among us a hundred times, as we read, that we might have loved and kissed and thanked you. But after all, my brother, generous and noble as he seemed, when your trials were over, was a strange, wicked young fellow, and happy it was for you both that he was so cleverly caught in the trap he had laid for your virtue. I can assure you, my lord longs to see you, and will accompany me for he says he has but a faint idea of your person. I tell him, and them all, that you are the finest girl, and the most improved in person and mind I ever beheld, and I am not afraid, although they should imagine all they can in your favour, from my account, that they will be disappointed when they see and converse with you. But one thing more you must do, and then we will love you still more, and that is, send us the rest of your papers, down to your marriage at least, and father, if you have written father, for we all long to see the rest as you relate it, though we know in general what has passed. You leave off with an account of an angry letter I wrote to my brother to persuade him to give you your liberty, and a sum of money, not doubting but his designs would end in your ruin, and, I own, not wishing he would marry you. For little did I know of your merit and excellence. Nor could I, but for your letters so lately sent me, have had any notion of either. I don't question, but if you have recited my passionate behaviour to you, when, at the hall, I shall make a ridiculous figure enough. But I will forgive all that, for the sake of the pleasure you have given me, and will still farther give me, if you comply with my request. Lady Betty says, it is the best story she has heard and the most instructive and she longs to have the conclusion of it in your own words she says now and then what a hopeful brother you have lady davis oh these intriguing gentlemen what rogueries do they not commit i should have had a fine husband of him had i received your proposal the dear pamela would have run in his head and had i been the first lady in the kingdom I should have stood but a poor chance in his esteem, for, you see, his designs upon her began early. She says you had a good heart to go back again to him, when the violent wretch had driven you from him on such a slight occasion. But yet she thinks the reasons you give in your relation and your love for him, which then you began to discover was your case, as well as the event showed you did right. But we'll tell you all our judgments when we have read the rest of your accounts So pray send them as soon as you can to I won't write myself sister till then your affectionate etc 
B. Davis. End of letter six. Letter seven of Pamela, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Pamela, Volume 2 by Samuel Richardson. Letter 7. My good dear lady, you have done me great honour in the letter your ladyship has been pleased to send me, and it is a high pleasure to me now all is so happily over that my poor papers in the least diverted you and such honourable and worthy persons as your ladyship mentions i could wish i might be favoured with such remarks on my conduct so nakedly set forth without any imagination that they would ever appear in such an assembly as may be of use to me in my future life and thus make me more worthy than it is otherwise possible i can be for the honour to which i am raised do dearest lady favour me so far i am prepared to receive blame and to benefit by it and cannot expect praise so much from my actions as from my intentions for indeed these were always just and honourable but why even for these do i talk of praise since being prompted by impulses i could not resist it can be no merit in me to have been governed by them as to the papers following those in your hands when i say that they must needs appear impertinent to such judges after what you know i dare say your ladyship will not insist upon them yet i will not scruple briefly to mention what they contain all my dangers and trials were happily at an end so that they only contain the conversations that passed between your ladyship's generous brother and me his kind assurances of honourable love to me my acknowledgments of unworthiness to him mrs jukes's respectful change of behaviour towards me mr b s reconciliation to mr williams his introducing me to the good families in the neighbourhood and avowing before them his honourable intentions a visit from my honest father who not knowing what to conclude from my letter to him before i returned to your honoured brother desiring my papers from him came in great anxiety of heart to know the worst doubting i had at least been caught by a stratagem ending in my ruin his joyful surprise to find how happy i was likely to be all the hopes given me answered by the private celebration of our nuptials an honour so much above all that my utmost ambition could make me aspire to and which i never can deserve your ladyship's arrival and anger not knowing i was actually married but supposing me a vile wicked creature in which case i should have deserved the worst of usage mr b s angry lessons to me for daring to interfere though i thought in the tenderest and most dutiful manner between your ladyship and himself the most acceptable goodness and favour of your ladyship afterwards to me of which as becomes me i shall ever retain the most grateful sense my return to this sweet mansion in a manner so different from my quitting it where i had been so happy for four years in paying my duty to the best of mistresses your ladyship's excellent mother to whose goodness in taking me from my poor honest parents and giving me what education i have i owe under god my happiness the joy of good mrs jervis mr longman and all the servants on this occasion mr b s acquainting me with miss godfrey's affair and presenting to me the pretty miss goodwin at the dairy house our appearance at church the favour of the gentry in the neighbourhood who knowing your ladyship had not disdained to look upon me and to be favourable to me came the more readily into a neighbourly intimacy with me and still so much the more readily as the continued kindness of my dear benefactor and his condescending deportment to me before them as if i had been worthy of the honour done me did credit to his own generous act 
these my lady down to my good parents setting out to this place in order to be settled by my honoured benefactor's bounty in the kentish farm are the most material contents of my remaining papers and though they might be the most agreeable to those for whom only they were written yet as they were principally matters of course after what your ladyship has with you as the joy of my fond heart can be better judged of by your ladyship than described by me and as you are acquainted with all the particulars that can be worthy of any other person's notice but my dear parents i am sure your ladyship will dispense with your commands and i make it my humble request that you will for madam you must needs think that when my doubts were dispelled when confident all my trials were over when i had a prospect of being so abundantly rewarded for what i suffered when every hour rose upon me with new delight and fraught with fresh instances of generous kindness from such a dear gentleman my master my benefactor the son of my honoured lady your ladyship must needs think i say that i must be too much affected my heart too much opened and especially as it then relieved from its past anxieties and fears which had kept down and damped the latent flame first discovered impressions of which before i hardly thought it susceptible so that it's scarce possible that my joy and my prudence if i were to be tried by such judges of delicacy and decorum as lord and lady davers the honoured countess and lady betty could be so intimately so laudably coupled as were to be wished although the continued sense of my unworthiness and the disgrace the dear gentleman would bring upon himself by his generous goodness to me always went hand in hand with my joy and my prudence and what these considerations took from the former being added to the latter kept me steadier and more equal to myself than otherwise it was probable such a young creature as i could have been wherefore my good lady i hope i stand excused and shall not bring upon myself the censure of being disobedient to your commands besides madam since you inform me that my good lord davers will attend you hither i should never dare to look his lordship in the face if all the emotions of my heart on such affecting occasions stood confessed to his lordship and if i am ashamed they should to your ladyship to the countess and to lady betty whose goodness must induce you all three to think favourably in such circumstances of one who is of your own sex how would it concern me for the same to appear before such gentlemen as my lord and his nephew indeed i could not look up to either of them in the sense of this and give me leave to hope that some of the scenes in the letters your ladyship had were not read to gentlemen your ladyship must needs know which i mean and will think of my two grand trials of all for though i was the innocent subject of wicked attempts and so cannot i hope suffer in any one's opinion for what i could not help yet for your dear brother's sake as well as for the decency of the matter one would not when having the honour to appear before my lord and his nephew be looked upon methinks with that levity of eye and thought which perhaps hard-hearted gentlemen may pass upon one by reason of those very scenes which would move pity and concern in a good lady's breast for a poor creature so attempted so my dear lady be pleased to tell me if the gentlemen have heard all i hope not and also to point out to me such parts of my conduct as deserve blame indeed i will try to make a good use of your censure and i am sure i shall be thankful for it for it will make me hope to be more and more worthy of the honour i have of being exalted into such a distinguished family and the right the best of gentlemen has given me to style myself your ladyship's most humble and most obliged servant p b End of letter seven. Letter eight of Pamela, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Pamela, volume two by Samuel Richardson. Letter eight 
from lady davis in reply my dear pamela you have given us all a great disappointment in declining to oblige me with the sequel of your papers i was a little out of humour with you at first i must own i was for i cannot bear denial when my heart is set upon anything but lady betty became your advocate and said she thought you very excusable since no doubt there might be many tender things circumstanced as you were well enough for your parents to see but for nobody else and relations of our side the least of all whose future intimacy and frequent visits might give occasions for raillery and remarks not otherwise agreeable i regard her apology for you the more because i knew it was a great balk to her that you did not comply with my request but now child when you know me more you'll find that if i am obliged to give up one point i always insist on another as near it as i can in order to see if it be only one thing i am to be refused or everything in which last case i know how to take my measures and resent now this is what i insist upon that you correspond with me the same as you did with your parents and acquaint me with every passage that is of concern to you beginning with your account how both of you spent your time when in kent for you must know we are all taken with your duty to your parents and the discretion of the good couple and think you have given a very edifying example of filial piety to all who shall hear your story for if so much duty is owing to parents when nothing can be done for one how much more is it to be expected where there is power to add to the natural obligation all the comforts and conveniences of life we people in upper life love to hear how gratitude and unexpected benefits operate upon honest minds who have little more than plain artless nature for their guide and we flatter ourselves with the hopes of many a delightful hour by your means in this our solitary situation if obliged to pass the next winter in it as my lord and the earl threaten me and the countess and lady betty that we shall then let us hear of everything that gives you joy or trouble and if my brother carries you to town for the winter while he attends parliament the advices you can give us of what passes in london and of the public entertainments and diversions he will take you to related in your own artless and natural observations will be as diverting to us as if at them ourselves for a young creature of your good understanding to whom all these things will be quite new Will give us perhaps a better taste of them their beauties and defects than we might have before for we people of quality go to those places dressed out and adorned in such a manner outvying one another as if we considered ourselves as so many parts of the public entertainment and are too much pleased with ourselves to be able so to attend to what we see as to form a right judgment of it but some of us behave with so much indifference to the entertainment as if we thought ourselves above being diverted by what we come to see and as if our view was rather to trifle away our time than improve ourselves by attending to the story of the action see pamela i shall not make an unworthy correspondent altogether for i can get into thy grave way and moralize a little now and then and if you'll promise to oblige me by your constant correspondence in this way and divest yourself of all restraint as if you were writing to your parents and i can tell you you'll write to one who will be as candid and as favourable to you as they can be then i am sure we shall have truth and nature from you and these are things which are generally so much lifted above by our conditions that we hardly know what they are but i have written enough for one letter and yet having more to say i will after this send another without waiting for your answer which you may give to both together and am um, yours etc b davis end of letter 8letter 9 of pamela volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson Pamela volume 2 by Samuel Richardson letter 9 dear Pamela I am very glad thy honest man has let thee into the affair of Sally Godfrey 
but prithee pamela tell us how he did it and thy thoughts upon it for that is a critical case and as he has represented it so shall i know what to say of it before you and him for i would not make mischief between you for the world this let me tell you will be a trying part of your conduct for he loves the child and will judge of you by your conduct towards it he dearly loved her mother and notwithstanding her fault she well deserved it for she was a sensible ay and a modest lady and of an ancient and genteel family but he was heir to a noble estate was of a bold and enterprising spirit fond of intrigue don't let this concern you you'll have the greater happiness and merit too if you can hold him and tis my opinion if anybody can you will then he did not like the young lady's mother who sought artfully to entrap him so that the poor girl divided between her inclination for him and her duty to her designing mother gave into the plot upon him and he thought himself vile wretch as he was for all that at liberty to set up plot against plot and the poor lady's honour was the sacrifice i hope you spoke well of her to him i hope you received the child kindly i hope you had presence of mind to do this for it is a nice part to act and all his observations were up i dare say on the occasion do let me hear how it was and write without restraint for although i am not your mother yet i am his eldest sister you know and as such come i will say so in hopes you'll oblige me your sister and so entitled to expect a compliance with my request for is there not a duty in degree to elder sisters from younger as to our remarks upon your behaviour they may have been much to your credit but nevertheless i will to encourage you to enter into this requested correspondence with me consult lady betty and will go over your papers again and try to find fault with your conduct and if we see anything censurable will freely let you know our minds but beforehand i can tell you we shall be agreed in one opinion and that is that we know not who will have acted as you have done upon the whole so pamela you see i put myself upon the same foot of correspondence with you not that i will promise to answer every letter no you must not expect that your part will be of a kind of narrative purposely designed to entertain us here and i hope to receive six seven eight or ten letters as it may happen before i return one for such a part i will bear in it as shall let you know our opinion of your proceedings and relations of things and as you wish to be found fault with you shall freely have it though not in a splenetic or ill-natured way as often as you give occasion now pamela i have two views in this one is to see how a man of my brother's spirit who has not denied himself any genteel liberties for it must be owned he never was a common town rake and had always a dignity in his roguery will behave himself to you and in wedlock which used to be freely sneered at by him the next that i may love you more and more as by your letters i shall be more and more acquainted with you as well as by conversation so that you can't be off if you would i know however you will have one objection to this and that is that your family affairs will require your attention and not give the time you used to have for this employment but consider child the station you are raised to does not require you to be quite a domestic animal you are lifted up to the rank of a lady and you must act up to it and not think of setting such an example as will draw upon you the ill-will and censure of other ladies for will any of our sex visit one who is continually employing herself in such works as either must be a reproach to herself or to them you'll have nothing to do but to give orders you will consider yourself as a task mistress and the common herd of female servants as so many negroes directing themselves by your nod or yourself as the master wheel in some beautiful pieces of mechanism whose dignified grave motions is to set a-going all the underwheels with a velocity suitable to their respective parts let your servants under your direction do all that relates to household management they cannot write to entertain and instruct as you can so what will you have to do i'll answer my own question 
in the first place endeavour to please your sovereign lord and master and let me tell you any other woman in england be her quality ever so high would have found enough to do to succeed in that secondly to receive and pay visits in order for his credit as well as your own to make your fashionable neighbours fond of you then thirdly you will have time upon your hands as your monarch himself rises early and is tolerably regular for such a brazen face as he has been to write to me in the manner i have mentioned and expect and i see plainly by your style nothing can be easier for you than to do this thus and with reading may your time be filled up with reputations to yourself and delight to others till a fourth employment puts itself upon you and that is shall i tell you boys transcriber's note text missing in the original to perpetuate a family for many hundred years esteemed worthy and eminent which being now reduced in the direct line to him and me expects it from you or else let me tell you nor will i balk at it my brother by descending to the wholesome cot excuse me pamela will want one apology for his conduct be as excellent as you may i say this child not to reflect upon you since the thing is done for i love you dearly and will love you more and more but to let you know what is expected from you and encourage you in the prospect already opening to you both and to me who have the welfare of the family i sprung from so much at heart although i know this will be attended with some anxieties to a mind so thoughtful and apprehensive as yours seems to be oh but this puts me in mind of your solicitude lest the gentleman should have seen everything contained in your letters but this i will particularly speak to in a third letter having filled my paper on all sides and am till then yours etc b davers you see and i hope will take it as a favour that i break the ice and begin first in the indispensably expected correspondence between us End of letter nine letter ten of pamela volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson pamela volume two by samuel richardson letter ten from the same and so pamela you are solicitous to know if the gentlemen have seen every part of your papers i can't say but they have or except in regard to the reputation of your saucy man do i see why the part you hint at might not be read by those to whom the rest might be shown i can tell you lady betty who is a very nice and delicate lady had no objection to any part though read before men only now and then crying out oh the vile man see lord davers what wretches you men are and commiserating you ah the poor pamela and expressing her impatience to hear how you escaped at this time and at that and rejoicing in your escape and now and then oh lady davis what a vile brother you have i hate him perfectly the poor girl cannot be made amends for all this though he has married her who that knows these things of him would wish him to be hers with all his advantages of person mind and fortune and his wicked attempts but i can tell you this that except one had heard every tittle of your danger how near you were to ruin and how little he stood upon taking any measures to effect his vile purposes even daring to attempt you in the presence of a good woman which was a wickedness that every wicked man could not be guilty of i say except one who has known these things one could not have judged of the merit of your resistance and how shocking those attempts were to your virtue for that life itself was endangered by them nor let me tell you could i in particular have so well justified him for marrying you i mean with respect to his own proud and haughty temper of mind if there had been room to think he could have had you upon easier terms it was necessary child on twenty accounts that we your and his well-wishers and his relations should know that he had tried every stratagem to subdue you to his purpose before he married you 
and how would it have answered to his intrepid character and pride of heart had we not been particularly led into the nature of those attempts which you so nobly resisted as to convince us all that you have deserved the good fortune you have met with as well as all the kind and respectful treatment he can possibly show you nor ought you to be concerned who sees any the most tender parts of your story except as i said for his sake for it must be a very unvirtuous mind that can form any other ideas from what you relate than those of terror and pity for you your expressions are too delicate to give the nicest ear offence except at him you paint no scenes but such as make his wickedness odious and that gentleman much more lady must have a very corrupt heart who could from such circumstances of distress make any reflections but what should be to your honour and in abhorrence of such actions i am so convinced of this that by this rule i would judge of any man's heart in the world better than by a thousand declarations and protestations i do assure you rakish as jacky is and freely as i doubt not that lord davers has formerly lived for he has been a man of pleasure they gave me by their behaviour on these tender occasions reason to think they have more virtue than not to be very apprehensive for your safety and my lord often exclaimed that he could not have thought his brother such a libertine neither besides child were not these things written in confidence had not recited all you could recite would there not have been room for any one who saw what you wrote to imagine they had been still worse and how could the terror be supposed to have had such effects upon you as to endanger your life without imagining you had undergone the worst a vile man could offer unless you had told us what that was which he did offer and so put a bound as it were to one's fears of what you suffered which otherwise must have been injurious to your purity though you could not help it moreover pamela it was but doing justice to the libertine himself to tell your mother the whole truth that she might know he was not so very abandoned but he could stop short of the execution of his wicked purposes which he apprehended if pursued would destroy the life that of all lives he would choose to preserve and you owed also thus much to your parents peace of mind that after all their distracting fears for you they might see they had reason to rejoice in an uncontaminated daughter and one cannot but reflect now he has made you his wife that it must be satisfaction to the wicked man as well as to yourself that he was not more guilty than he was nor took more liberties than he did for my own part i must say that i could not have accounted for your fits by any description short of those you give and had you been less particular in the circumstances i should have judged he had been still worse and your person though not your mind less pure than his pride would expect from the woman he should marry for this is the case of all rates that though they indulge in all manner of libertinism themselves there is no class of men who exact greater delicacy from the persons they marry though they care not how bad they make the wives the sisters and daughters of others i will only add and send all my three letters together that we all blame you in some degree for bearing the wicked dukes in your sight after her most impudent assistance in his lewd attempt much less we think ought you to have left her in her place and rewarded her for her vileness could hardly be equalled by the worst actions of the most abandoned procuress i know the difficulties you labour under in his arbitrary will and intercession for her but lady betty rightly observes that he knew what a vile woman she was when he put you into her power and no doubt employed her being sure she would answer all his purposes and that therefore she should have had very little opinion of the sincerity of his reformation while he was so solicitous in keeping her and having put upon a foot in the present of your nuptials the honest jervis she would she says had she been in your case have had one struggle for her dismission let it have been taken as it would and he that was so well pleased with your virtues must have thought this a natural consequence of it if he was in earnest to reclaim 
I know not whether you show him all I write, but I have written this last part in the cover, as well for want of room, as that you may keep it from him if you please. Though if you think it will serve any good end, I am not against showing to him all I write. For I must ever speak my mind, though I were too smart for it, and that nobody can or has the heart to make me do, but my bold brother. So, Pamela, for this time, adieu. End of Letter 10 Letter 11 of Pamela, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Pamela, Volume 2, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 11. My good lady, I am honoured with your ladyship's three letters, the contents of which are highly obliging to me and I should be inexcusable if I did not comply with your injunctions, and be very proud and thankful for your ladyship's condescension in accepting my poor scribble, and promising such a rich and valuable return, of which you have already given such ample and delightful instances. I will not plead my defects to excuse my obedience. I only fear that the awe which will be always upon me when I write to your ladyship will lay me under so great a restraint that I shall fall short even of the merit my papers have already made for me through your kind indulgence yet sheltering myself under your goodness i will cheerfully comply with everything your ladyship expects from me that it is in my power to do you will give me leave madam to put into some little method the particulars of what you desire of me that i may speak to them all for since you are so good as to excuse me from sending the rest of my papers which indeed would not bear in many places I will omit nothing that shall tend to convince you of my readiness to obey you in everything else First then your ladyship would have the particulars of the happy fortnight We passed in Kent on one of the most agreeable occasions that could befall me Secondly an account of the manner in which your dear brother acquainted me with the affecting story of Miss Godfrey and my behavior upon it and thirdly I presume your ladyship and Lady Betty expect me to say something upon your welcome remarks on my conduct towards mrs. Jukes The other particulars your ladyship mentions will naturally fall under one or other of these three heads But expect not my lady though I begin in method thus that I shall keep up to it If you will not allow for me and keep in view the poor Pamela Andrews in all I write But have mrs. B in your eye what will become of me? But I promise myself so much improvement from this correspondence that I enter upon it with a greater delight than I can express Notwithstanding the mingled awe and diffidence that will accompany me in every part of the agreeable task To begin with the first article Your dear brother and my honest parents I know your ladyship will expect from me that on all occasions I should speak of them with the duty that becomes a good child with myself set out on the monday morning for kent passing through st albans to london at both which places we stopped to-night for our dear benefactor would make us take easy journeys and on wednesday evening we arrived at the sweet place allotted for the good couple we were attended only by abraham and john on horseback for mr colbrand having sprained his foot was in the travelling coach with the cook the housemaid and polly barlow a genteel new servant whom mrs. Brooks recommended to wait on me Mr. Longman had been there a fortnight employed in settling the terms of an additional purchase of this pretty well wooded and well watered estate and His account of his proceedings was very satisfactory to his honored principal He told us he had much ado to dissuade the tenants from pursuing a formed resolution of meeting their landlord on horseback at some miles distance for he had informed them when he expected us but knowing how desirous mr b was of being retired he had ventured to assure them that when everything was settled and the new purchase actually entered upon they would have his presence among them often and that he would introduce them all at different times to their worthy landlord before we left the country the house is large and very commodious and we found everything about it and in it exceedingly neat and convenient owing to the worthy mr. Longman's care and direction The ground is well stocked 
the barns and outhouses in excellent repair and my poor parents have only to wish that they and i may be deserving of half the goodness we experience from your bountiful brother but indeed madam i have the pleasure of discovering every day more and more that there is not a better disposed and more generous man in the world than himself for i verily think he has not been so careful to conceal his bad actions as his good ones his heart is naturally beneficent and his beneficence is the gift of god for the most excellent purposes as i have often freely told him pardon me my dear lady i wish i may not be impertinently grave but i find a great many instances of his considerable charity which few knew of and which since i have been his almoner could not avoid coming to my knowledge but this possibly is no news to your ladyship everybody knows the generous goodness of your own heart every one wanting relief tasted the bounty of your excellent mother my late honoured lady so that tis a family grace and i have no need to speak of it to you madam this cannot i hope be construed as if i would hereby suppose ourselves less obliged i know nothing so godlike in human nature as this disposition to do good to our fellow creatures for is it not following immediately the example of that generous providence which every minute is conferring blessings upon us all and by giving power to the rich makes them but the dispensers of its benefits to those that want them yet as there are but too many objects of compassion and as the most beneficent cannot like omnipotence do good to all how much are they obliged who are distinguished from others and this being kept in mind will always contribute to make the benefited receive as thankfully as they ought the favours of the obliger i know not if i write to be understood in all i mean but my grateful heart is so overfilled when on this subject that methinks i want to say a great deal more at the, at the same time that i am apprehensive i say too much yet perhaps the copies of the letters i here enclose that marked one written by me to my parents on our return to kent that marked one written by me to my parents on our return to kent that marked two from my dear father in answer to it and that marked three mine in reply to his will at the same time that they may convince your ladyship that i will conceal nothing from you in the course of this correspondence which may in the least amuse and divert you or better explain our grateful sentiments in a great measure answer what your ladyship expects from me as to the happy fortnight we passed in kent i will now conclude choosing to suspend the correspondence till i know from your ladyship whether it will not be too low too idle for your attention whether you will not dispense with your own commands when you see i am so little likely to answer what you may possibly expect from me or whether if you insist upon my scribbling you would have me write in any other way be less tedious less serious in short less or more anything for all that is in my power your ladyship may command from madam your obliged and faithful servant p b your dearest brother from whose knowledge i would not keep anything that shall take up any considerable portion of my time gives me leave to proceed in this correspondence if you command it and is pleased to say he will content himself to see such parts of it and only such parts as i shall show him or read to him is not this good madam oh my lady you don't know how happy i am end of letter eleven letter twelve of pamela volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michelle eaton pamela volume two by samuel richardson letter twelve from lady davers to mrs b my dear pamela you very much oblige me by your cheerful compliance with my request i leave it entirely to you to write as you shall be in the humour when you take up your pen and then i shall have you write with less restraint for you must know that what we admire in you are truth and nature not studied or elaborate epistles 
we can hear at church or read in our closets fifty good things that we expect not from you but we cannot receive from anybody else the pleasure of sentiments flowing with that artless ease which so much affects us when we read your letters then my sweet girl your gratitude prudence integrity of heart your humility shine so much in all your letters and thoughts that no wonder my brother loves you as he does but i shall make you proud i doubt and so by praise ruin those graces which we admire and but for that cannot praise you too much in my conscience if thou canst hold as thou hast begun i believe thou wilt have him all to thyself and that was more than i once thought any woman on this side the seventieth year of his age would ever be able to say the letters to and from your parents we are charmed with and the communicating of them to me i take to be as great an instance of your confidence in me as it is of your judgment and prudence for you cannot but think that we his relations are a little watchful over your conduct and have our eyes upon you to observe what use you are likely to make of your power over your man with respect to your own relations hitherto all is unexampled prudence and you take the right method to reconcile even the proudest of us to your marriage and make us not only love you but respect your parents for their honesty will i perceive be their distinguishing character and they will not forget themselves nor their former condition i can tell you you are exactly right for if you were to be an encroacher as the good old man calls it my brother would be the first to see it and would gradually think less and less of you till possibly he might come to despise you and to repent of his choice for the least shadow of an imposition or low cunning or mere selfishness he cannot bear in short you are a charming girl and lady betty says so too and moreover adds that if he makes you not the best and faithfulest of husbands he cannot deserve you for all his fortune and birth and in my heart i begin to think so too but won't you oblige me with the sequel of your letter to your father for you promise my dear charming scribbler in that you sent me to write again to his letter and i long to see how you answer the latter part of it about your relations desiring already to come and live with him i know what i expect from you but let it be what it will send it to me exactly as you wrote it and i shall see whether i have reason to praise or reprove you for surely pamela you must leave one room to blame you for something indeed i can hardly bear the thought that you should so much excel as you do and have more prudence by nature as it were than the best of us get in a course of the genteelest educations and with fifty advantages at least in conversation that you could not have by reason of my mother's retired life while you were with her and your close attendance on her person but i'll tell you what has been a great improvement to you it is your own writings this itch of scribbling has been a charming help for here having a natural fund of good sense and prudence above your years you have with the observations these have enabled you to make been flint and steel too as i may say to yourself so that you have struck fire when you pleased wanting nothing but a few dry leaves like the first pair in old dubartas to serve as tinder to catch your animating sparks so that reading constantly and thus using yourself to write and enjoying besides a good memory everything you heard and read became your own and not only so but was improved by passing through more salubrious ducks and vehicles like some fine fruit grafted upon a common free stock whose more exuberant juices served to bring to quicker and greater perfection the downy peach or the smooth nectarine with its crimson blush really pamela i believe i too shall improve by writing to you why you dear saucy face at this rate you'll make every one that converses with you better and wiser and wittier too 
as far as I know, than they ever before thought there was room for em to be. As to my own part, I begin to like what I have written myself, I think, and your correspondence may revive the poetical ideas that used to fire my mind, before I entered into the drowsy married life. For my good Lord Davis's turn happens not to be to books, and so by degrees my imagination was in a manner quenched, and I, as a dutiful wife, should endeavour to form my taste by that of the man I chose. But after all, Pamela, you are not to be a little proud of my correspondence, and I could not have thought it ever would have come to this. But you will observe that I am the more free and unreserved to encourage you to write without restraint, for already you have made us a family of writers and readers, so that Lord Davis himself is become enamoured of your letters, and desires of all things he may hear read every one that passes between us. Nay, Jackie, for that matter, who was the most thoughtless, whistling, sauntering fellow you ever knew, and whose delight in a book ran no higher than a song or a catch, now comes in with an enquiring face, and vows he'll set pen to paper, and turn letter-writer himself, and intends, if my brother won't take it amiss, he says, to begin to you, provided he could be sure of an answer. I have twenty things still to say, for you have unlocked all our bosoms, and yet I intended not to write above ten or a dozen lines when I began, only to tell you that I would have you take your own way, in your own subjects and in your style, and if you will but give me hope that you are in the way I so much wish to have you in, I will then call myself your affectionate sister, but till then it shall only barely be your correspondent. B. Davers, you'll proceed with the account of your Kentish affair, I doubt not. End of letter 12letter thirteen of pamela volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson pamela volume two by samuel richardson letter thirteen my dear good lady what kind what generous things you are pleased to say of your happy correspondent and what reason have I to value myself on such an advantage as is now before me, if I am capable of improving it as I ought, from a correspondence with so noble and so admired a lady? To be praised by such a genius, and my honoured benefactor's worthy sister, whose favour, next to his, it was always my chief ambition to obtain, is what would be enough to fill with vanity a steadier and a more equal mind than mine. I have heard from my late honoured lady what a fine pen her beloved daughter was mistress of when she pleased to take it up but i never could have presumed but from your ladyship's own motion to hope to be in any manner the subject of it much less to be called your correspondent indeed madam i am very proud of this honour and consider it as such a heightening to my pleasures as only that could give and I will set about obeying your ladyship without reserve. But first, permit me to disclaim any merit from my own poor writings to that improvement which your goodness imputes to me. What I have to boast of that sort is owing principally, if it deserves commendation, to my late excellent lady. It is hard to be imagined what pains her ladyship took with her poor servant, Besides making me keep a book of her charities dispensed by me, I always set down in my way the cases of the distressed, their griefs from misfortunes, and their joys of her bountiful relief. And so I entered early into the various turns that affected worthy hearts, and was taught the better to regulate my own, especially by the help of her fine observations, when I read what I wrote. For many a time has her generous heart overflowed with pleasure at my remarks and with praises, and I was her good girl, her dear Pamela, her hopeful maiden, and she would sometimes snatch my hand with transport and draw me to her, and vouchsafe to kiss me, and always was saying what she would do for me. 
if God spared her and I continued to be deserving oh my dear lady you cannot think what an encouragement this condescending behavior and goodness was to me madam you cannot think it I used to throw myself at her feet and embrace her knees and my eyes streaming with tears of joy would often cry oh continue to me my dearest lady the blessing of your favor and kind instructions and it is all your happy Pamela can wish for but I will proceed to obey your ladyship and write with as much freedom as I possibly can for you must not expect that I can entirely divest myself of that awe which will necessarily lay me under a greater restraint than if writing to my parents whose partiality for their daughter made me in a manner secure of their good opinions to shorten the work before me in the account I am to give for the sweet fortnight that we passed in Kent I enclose not only the copy of the letter your ladyship requested but my father's answer to it the letters I sent before and those I now send will afford several particulars such as a brief description of the house and farm and your honoured brother's intentions of retiring thither now and then of the happiness and gratitude of my dear parents and their wishes to be able to deserve the comfort his goodness has heaped upon them and that in stronger lights than I am able to set them I will only in a summary manner mention the rest and particularly the behaviour of my dear benefactor to me and my parents he seemed always to delight in being particularly kind to them before strangers and before the tenants and before mr sorby mr bennett and mr shepherd three of the principal gentlemen in the neighbourhood who with their ladies came to visit us and whose visits we all returned for your dear brother would not permit my father and mother to decline the invitation of those worthy families every day we rode out or walked a little about in the grounds and while we were there he employed hands to cut a vista through a coppice as they call it or rather a little wood to a rising ground which fronting an old-fashioned balcony in the middle of the house he ordered it to be planted like a grove and a pretty alcove to be erected on its summit of which he has sent them a draught drawn by his own hand this and a few other alterations mentioned in my letter to my father are to be finished against we go down next the dear gentleman was every hour pressing me while there to take one diversion or other frequently upbraiding me that i seemed not to choose anything urging me to propose sometimes what i could wish he should oblige me in and not always to leave it to him to choose for me saying he was half afraid that my constant compliance with everything he proposed laid me sometimes under a restraint and he would have me have a will of my own since it was impossible that it could be such as he should not take delight in conforming to it i will not trouble your ladyship with any further particulars relating to this happy fortnight which was made up all of white and unclouded days to the very last and your ladyship will judge better than i can describe of the parting between my dear parents and their honoured benefactor and me we set out attended with the good wishes of crowds of persons of all degrees for your dear brother left behind him noble instances of his bounty it being the first time as he bid mr longman to say that he had been down among them since that estate had been in his hands but permit me to observe that i could not forbear often very often in this happy period to thank god in private for the blessed terms upon which i was there to what i should have been had i gracelessly accepted of those which formerly were tendered to me for your ladyship will remember that the kentish estate was to be part of the purchase of my infamy we returned through london by the like easy journeys but tarried not to see anything of that vast metropolis any more than we did in going through it before your beloved brother only stopping at his bankers in desiring him to look out for a handsome house which he proposes to take for his winter residence he chooses it to be about the new buildings called hanover square and he left mr longman there to see one which his banker believed would be fit for him and thus my dear lady i have answered your first commands by the help of the letters which passed between my dear parents and me and conclude this with the assurance that i am with high respect your ladyship's most obliged and faithful servant 
pb end of letter 13letter 14 of pamela volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson pamela volume 2 by samuel richardson letter 14 my dearest lady i now set myself to obey your ladyship's second command which is to give an account in what manner your dear brother broke to me the affair of the unfortunate miss godfrey with my behaviour upon it and this i cannot do better than by transcribing scribing the relation i gave at that time in letters to my dear parents which your ladyship has not seen in these very words thus far my dear lady the relation i gave to my parents at the time of my being first acquainted with this melancholy affair it is a great pleasure to me that i can already flatter myself from the hints you kindly gave me that i behaved as you wished i should behave indeed madam i could not help it for i pitied most sincerely the unhappy lady and though i could not but rejoice that i had had the grace to escape the dangerous attempts of the dear intriguer yet never did the story of any unfortunate lady make such an impression upon me as hers did she loved him and believed no doubt that he loved her too well to take ungenerous advantages of her soft passion for him and so by degrees put herself into his power and too seldom alas i have the noblest minded of the seducing sex the mercy or the goodness to spare the poor creatures that do then tis another misfortune of people in love they always think highly of the beloved object and lowly of themselves such a dismal mortifier is love i say not this madam to excuse the poor lady's fall nothing can do that because virtue is and ought to be preferable to all considerations and to life itself but methinks i love this dear lady so well for the sake of her edifying penitence that i would fain extenuate her crime if i could and the rather as in all probability it was a first love on both sides and so he could not appear to her as a practised deceiver your ladyship will see by what i have transcribed how i behaved myself to the dear miss goodwin and i am so fond of the little charmer as well for the sake of her unhappy mother though personally unknown to me as for the relation she bears to the dear gentleman whom i am bound to love and honour that i must beg your ladyship's interest to procure her to be given up to my care when it shall be thought proper i am sure i shall act by her as tenderly as if i were her own mother and glad i am that the poor unfaulty baby is so justly beloved by mr b but i will here conclude this letter with assuring your ladyship and i am your obliged and humble servant p b End of letter 14letter 15 of pamela volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson pamela volume 2 by samuel richardson letter 15 my good lady i now come to your ladyship's remarks on my conduct to mrs jukes which you are pleased to think too kind and forgiving considering the poor woman's baseness your ladyship said that i ought not to have borne her in my sight after the impudent assistance she gave to his lewd attempts much less to have left her in her place and rewarded her alas my dear lady what could i do a poor prisoner as i was made for weeks together in breach of all the laws of civil society without a soul who durst be my friend and every day expecting to be ruined and undone by one of the haughtiest and most determined spirits in the world and when it pleased god to turn his heart and incline him to abandon his wicked attempts and to profess his love to me his poor servant can it be thought i was to insist upon conditions with such a gentleman who had me in his power 
and who if i had provoked him might have resumed all his wicked purposes against me indeed i was too much overjoyed after all my dangers passed which were so great that i could not go to rest nor rise but with such apprehensions that i wished for death rather than life to think of refusing any terms that i could yield to and keep my honour and though such noble ladies as your ladyship and lady betty who are born to independency and are hereditarily as i may say on a foot with the highest descended gentleman in the land might have exerted a spirit and would have a right to choose your own servants and to distribute rewards and punishments to the deserving and undeserving at your own good pleasure yet what had i a poor girl who owed even more my title to common notice to the bounty of my late good lady and had only a kind of imputed sightliness of person though enough to make me the subject of vile attempts who from a situation of terror and apprehension was lifted up to a hope beyond my highest ambition and was bid to pardon the bad woman mm. as an instance that i could forgive his own hard usage of me who had experienced so often the violence and impetuosity of his temper which even his beloved mother never ventured to oppose till it began to subside and then indeed he was all goodness and acknowledgment of which i could give your ladyship more than one instance what i say had i to do to take upon me lady airs and to resent but my dear ladies let me in this instance bespeak the attention of you both i should be inexcusable if i did not tell you all the truth and that is that i not only forgave the poor wretch in regard to his commands but from my own inclination also if i am wrong in saying this i must submit it to your ladyships and as i pretend not to perfection am ready to take the blame i deserve in your ladyships judgments but indeed were it to be again i verily think i could not help forgiving her and were i not able to say this i should be thought to have made a mean court to my master's passions and to have done a wrong thing with my eyes open which i humbly conceive no one should do when full power was given me over this poor creature seemingly at least though it might possibly have been resumed and i might have been recommitted to hers had i given him reason to think i made an arrogant use of it you cannot imagine what a triumph i had in my mind over the mortified guilt which from the highest degree of insolence and imperiousness that before had hardened her masculine features appeared in her countenance when she found the tables likely to be soon turned upon her this change in behaviour which at first discovered itself in a sullen awe and afterwards in a kind of silent respect showed me what an influence power had over her and that when she could treat her late prisoner when taken into favour so obsequiously it was the less wonder the bad woman could think it her duty to obey commands so unjust when her obedience to them was required from her master to be sure if a look could have killed her after some of her bad treatment she had been slain over and over as i may say but to me who was always taught to distinguish between the person and the action i could not hold my resentment against the poor passive machine of mischief one day together though her actions were so odious to me i should indeed except that time of my grand trial when she appeared so much a wretch to me that i saw her not even after two days that she was kept from me without great flutter and emotion of heart and i had represented to your brother before how hard a condition it was for me to forgive so much unwomanly wickedness but my dear ladies when i considered the latter in one particular light i could the more easily forgive her and having forgiven her bear her in my sight and act by her as a consequence of that forgiveness as if she had not so horridly offended else how would it have been forgiveness especially as she was ashamed of her crime and there was no fear of her repeating it thus then i thought on the occasion poor wretched agent for purposes little less than infernal i will forgive thee since thy master and my master will have it so and indeed thou art beneath the resentment even of such a poor girl as i i will pity thee base and abject as thou art 
and she who is the object of my pity is surely beneath my anger such were then my thoughts my proud thoughts so far was i from being guilty of intentional meanness in forgiving at mr b's interposition the poor low creeping abject self-mortified and master mortified mrs jukes and do you think ladies when you revolve in your thoughts who i was and what i was and what i had been designed for when you revolve the amazing turn in my favour and the prospects before me so much above my hopes that i left them entirely to providence to direct for me as it pleased without daring to look forward to what those prospects seemed naturally to tend when i could see my haughty persecutor become my repentant protector the lofty spirit that used to make me tremble and to which i never could look up without awe except in those animating cases where his guilty attempts and the concern i had to preserve my innocence gave a courage more than natural to my otherwise dastardly heart when this impetuous spirit could stoop to request one whom he had sunk beneath even her usual low character of his servant who was his prisoner under sentence of a ruin worse than death as he had intended it and had seized her for that very purpose could stoop to acknowledge the vileness of that purpose should say at one time that my forgiveness of mrs jukes should stand me in greater stead than i was aware of could tell her before me that she must for the future show me all the respect due to one he must love at another acknowledge before her that he had been stark naught and that i was very forgiving again to mrs jukes putting himself on a level with her as to guilt we are both in generous hands and indeed if pamela did not pardon you i should think she but half forgave me because you acted at my instructions another time to the same we have been both sinners and must be both included in one act of grace when i was thus lifted up to the state of a sovereign forgiver and my lordly master became a petitioner for himself and the guilty creature whom he put under my feet what a triumph was here for the poor pamela and could i have been guilty of so mean a pride as to trample upon the poor abject creature when i found her thus lowly thus mortified and wholly in my power then my dear ladies while i was enjoying the sole charming fruits of that innocence which the divine grace had enabled me to preserve in spite of so many plots and contrivances on my master's side and such wicked instigations and assistances on hers and all my prospects were improving upon me beyond my wishes when all was unclouded sunshine and i possessed my mind in peace and had only to be thankful to providence which had been so gracious to my unworthiness when i saw my persecutor become my protector my active enemy no longer my enemy but creeping with slow doubtful feet and speaking to me with awful hesitating doubt of my acceptance a stamp of an insolent foot now turned into curtsying half bent knees threatening hands into supplicating folds and the eye unpitying to innocence running over with a sense of her own guilt a faltering accent of her late menacing tongue and uplifted handkerchief I see she will be my lady and then I know how it will go with me Was not this my ladies a triumph of triumphs to the late miserable now exalted Pamela Could I do less than pardon her and having declared that I did so was I not to show the sincerity of my declaration? Would it not have shown my master that the low-born Pamela was incapable of a generous action had she refused the only request her humble condition had given her the opportunity of granting at that time with innocence would he not have thought the humble cottager as capable of insolence and vengeance too in her turn as the better born and that she wanted but the power to show the like unrelenting temper by which she had so grievously suffered and might not this have given him room to think me and to have resumed and prosecuted his purposes accordingly fitter for an arrogant kept mistress than a humble and obliged wife i see might he not have said the girl has strong passions and resentments and she that has will be sometimes governed by them 
I will improve upon the hint she herself has now given me by her inexorable temper I will gratify her revenge till I turn it upon itself I will indulge her pride till I make it administer to her fall For a wife I cannot think of in the low-born cottager Especially when she has lurking in her all the pride and arrogance You know my ladies his haughty way of speaking of our sex of the better descended and by a little perseverance and watching her unguarded hours and applying temptations to her passions i shall first discover them and then make my advantage of them might not this have been the language and this the resolution of such a dear wicked intriguer for my lady you can hardly conceive the struggles he apparently had to bring down his high spirit to so humble a level and though i hope all would have been even in this worst case ineffectual through divine grace yet how do i know what lurking vileness might have appeared by degrees in this frail heart to encourage his designs and to augment my trials and my dangers and perhaps downright violence might have been used if he could not on one hand have subdued his passions nor on the other have overcome his pride a pride that every one reflecting upon the disparity of birth and condition between us would have dignified with the name of decency a pride that was become such an essential part of the dear gentleman's character in this instance of a wife that although he knew he could not keep it up if he made me happy yet it was no small motive of his choosing me in one respect because he expected from me more humility more submission than he thought would be paid him by a lady equally born and educated and of this i will send you an instance in a transcription from that part of my journal you have not seen of his lessons to me on my incurring his displeasure by interposing between yourself and him in your misunderstanding at the hall for madam i intend to send at times anything i think worthy of your ladyship's attention out of those papers you were so kind as to excuse me from sending you in a lump and many of which must needs have appeared very impertinent to such judges thus could your ladyship have thought it have i ventured upon a strange paradox that even this strongest instance of his debasing himself is not the weakest of his pride and he ventured once at sir simon darnford's to say in your hearing as you may remember that in his conscience he thought he should hardly have made a tolerable husband to anybody but pamela and why for the reasons you will see in the enclosed papers which give an account of the noblest and earliest curtain lecture that ever girl had one of which is that he expects to be born with complied with he meant even when in the wrong another that a wife should never so much as expostulate with him though he was in the wrong till by complying with all he insisted upon she should have shown him she designed rather to convince him for his own sake than for contradiction's sake and then another time perhaps he might make better resolutions i hope from what i have said it will appear to your ladyship and to lady betty too that i am justified or at least excused in pardoning mrs jukes but your dear brother has just sent me word that supper waits for me and the post being ready to go off I defer till the next opportunity which I have to say as to these good effects and am in the meantime your ladyship's most obliged and faithful servant P B End of letter fifteen Letter sixteen of Pamela Volume two This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela, Volume 2 by Samuel Richardson Letter 16 My dear lady, I will now acquaint you with the good effects my behaviour to Mrs. Jukes has had upon her, as a farther justification of my conduct towards the poor woman, that she began to be affected as I wished, appeared to me before I left the hall, not only in the conversations I had with her after my happiness was completed, but in her general demeanour also to the servants, to the neighbours, and in her devout behaviour at church. And this still further appears by a letter I have received from Miss Darnford, 
I dare say your ladyship will be pleased with the perusal of the whole letter, although a part of it would answer my present design, and in confidence that you will excuse, for the sake of its other beauties, the high and undeserved praises, which she so lavishly bestows upon me, I will transcribe it all. From Miss Darnford to Mrs. B. My dear neighbour that was, it must depend upon your known goodness, to excuse me for not writing before now, in answer to your letter of compliment to us, for the civilities and favours, as you call them, which you received from us in Lincolnshire, where we were infinitely more obliged to you than you to us. The truth is, my papa has been much disordered, with a kind of rambling rheumatism, to which the physicians, learnedly speaking, give the name of arthritica vega, or the flying gout, and when he ails ever so little, it signifies nothing concealing his infirmities, where they are so well known, and when he cares not who knows them, he is so peevish, and wants so much attendance, that my mamma and her two girls, one of which is as waspish as her papa, you may be sure I don't mean myself, have much ado to make his worship keep the peace, and I, being his favourite, when he is indisposed, having most patience, if I may give myself a good word, he calls upon me continually, to read to him when he is grave, which is not often, and to tell him stories, and sing to him when he is merry, and so I have been employed as a principal person about him, till I have frequently become sad to make him cheerful, and happy when I could do it at any rate. For once, in a pet, he flung a book at my head, because I had not attended him for two hours, and he could not bear to be slighted by little bastards, that was his word, that were fathered upon him for his vexation. Oh, these men! Fathers or husbands much alike, the one tyrannical, the other insolent, so that between one and t'other a poor girl has nothing for it but a few weeks' courtship, and perhaps a first month's bridalry, if that. And then she is as much a slave to her husband, as she was a vassal to her father. I mean, if the father be a Sir Simon Darnford, and the spouse a Mr. B., but I will be a little more grave, for a graver occasion calls for it, yet such as will give you real pleasure. It is the very great change that your example has had upon your housekeeper. You desired her to keep up as much regularity as she could among the servants there, and she is next to exemplary in it, so that she has every one's good word. She speaks of her lady not only with respect, but reverence and calls it a blessed day for all the family, and particularly for herself, that you came into Lincolnshire. She reads prayers, or makes one of the servants read them, every Sunday night, and never misses being at church, morning and afternoon, and is preparing herself, by Mr. Peter's advice and direction, for receiving the sacrament, which she earnestly longs to receive, and says it will be the seal of her reformation. Mr. Peters gives us this account of her, and says she is full of contrition for her past misspent life, and is often asking him if such and such sins can be forgiven, and among them names her vile behaviour to her angel lady, as she calls you. It seems she has written a letter to you, which passed Mr. Peters' revisal, before she had the courage to send it and prides herself that you have favoured her with an answer to it, which, she says, when she is dead, will be found in a cover of black silk next to her heart. For anything from your hand, she is sure, will contribute to make her keep her good purposes, and for that reason she places it there, and when she has had any bad thoughts, or is guilty of any faulty word, or passionate expression, she recollects her lady's letter, which recovers her to a calm and puts her again into a better frame. As she has written to you, tis possible I might have spared you the trouble of reading this account of her, but yet you will not be displeased, that so free a liver and speaker should have some testimonial besides her own assurances, to vouch for the sincerity of her reformation. What a happy lady are you, that persuasion dwells upon your tongue, and reformation follows your example! 
your ladyship will forgive me what may appear like vanity in this communication miss darnford is a charming young lady i always admired her but her letters are the sweetest kindest yet i am too much the subject of her encomiums and so will say no more but add here a copy of the poor woman's letter to me and your ladyship will see what an ample correspondence you have opened to yourself if you go on to countenance it honoured madam i have been long labouring under two difficulties the desire i had to write to you and the fear of being thought presumptuous if i did but i will depend on your goodness so often tried and put pen to paper in that very closet and on that desk which once was so much used by yourself when i was acting a part that now cuts me to the heart to think of but you forgave me madam and showed me you had too much goodness to revoke your forgiveness and could i have silenced the reproaches of my heart i should have had no cause to think i had offended but oh ay madam how has your goodness to me which once filled me with so much gladness now on reflection made me sorrowful and at times miserable to think i should act so barbarously as i did by so much sweetness and so much forgiveness every place that i remember to have used you hardly in how does it now fill me with sadness and makes me often smite my breast and sit down with tears and groans bemoaning my vile actions and my hard heart how many places are there in this melancholy fine house that call one thing or other to my remembrance that give me remorse but the pond and the wood-house whence i dragged you so mercilessly after i had driven you to despair almost what thoughts do they bring to my remembrance then my wicked instigations what an odious wretch was i had his honour been as abandoned as myself what virtue had been destroyed between his orders and my too rigorous execution of them nay stretching them to show my wicked zeal to serve a master whom though i honoured i should not as you more than once hinted to me but with no effect at all so resolutely wicked was my heart have so well obeyed in his unlawful commands this honour has made you amends has done justice to your merits and so atoned for his fault but as for me it is out of my power ever to make reparation all that is left me is to let your ladyship see that your pious example has made such an impression upon me that i am miserable now in the reflection upon my past guilt you have forgiven me and god will i hope for the creature cannot be more merciful than the creator that is all my hope yet sometimes i dread that i am forgiven here at least not punished in order to be punished the more hereafter what then will become of the unhappy wretch that has thus lived in a state of sin and so qualified herself by a course of wickedness as to be thought a proper instrument for the worst of purposes pray your ladyship let not my honoured master see this letter he will think i have the boldness to reflect upon him when god knows my heart i only write to condemn myself and my unwomanly actions as you were pleased often most justly to call them but i might go on thus for ever accusing myself not considering whom i am writing to and whose precious time i am taking up but what i chiefly write for is to beg your ladyship's prayers for me for o oh, madam i fear i shall else be ever miserable we every week hear of the good you do and the charity you extend to the bodies of the miserable extend i beseech you good madam to the unhappy dukes the mercy of your prayers and tell me if you think i have not sinned beyond hope of pardon for there is a woe denounced against the presumptuous sinner your ladyship assured me at your departure on the confession of my remorse for my misdoings and my promise of amendment that you would take it for proof of my being in earnest if i would endeavour to keep up a regularity among the servants here if i would subdue them with kindness as i had owned myself subdued and if i would endeavour to make every one think 
that the best security they could give of doing their duty to their master in his absence was by doing it to god almighty from whose all-seeing eye nothing can be hid this i remember your ladyship told me was the best test of fidelity and duty that any servants could show since it is impossible without religion but that worldly convenience or self-interest must be the main tie and so the worst actions might succeed if servants thought they should find their sordid advantage in sacrificing their duty so well am i convinced of this truth that i hope i have begun the example to good effect and as no one in the family was so wicked as i it was therefore less difficult to reform them and you will have the pleasure to know that you have now servants here whom you need not be ashamed to call yours tis true i found it a little difficult at first to keep them within sight of their duty after your ladyship departed but when they saw i was in earnest and used them courteously as you advised and as your usage of me convinced me was the rightest usage when they were told i had your commands to acquaint you how they conformed to your injunctions the task became easy and i hope we shall all be still more and more worthy of the favour of so good a lady and so bountiful a master i dare not presume upon the honour of a line to your unworthy servant yet it would pride me much if i could have it but i shall ever pray for your ladyship's and his honour's felicity as becoming your undeserving servant k jukes i have already with these transcribed letters of miss darnford and mrs jukes written a great deal but nevertheless as there yet remains one passage in your ladyship's letter relating to mrs jukes that seems to require an answer i will take notice of it if i shall not quite tire your patience that passage is this lady betty rightly observes says your ladyship that he knew what a vile woman she mrs jukes was when he put you into her power and no doubt employed her because he was sure she would answer all his purposes and therefore she should have had very little opinion of the sincerity of his reformation while he was so solicitous in keeping her there she would she says had she been in your case have had one struggle for her dismission let it have been taken as it would and he that was so well pleased with your virtue must have thought this a natural consequence of it if in earnest to become virtuous himself but alas madam he was not so well pleased with my virtue for virtue's sake as lady betty thinks he was he would have been glad even then to have found me less resolved on that score he did not so much as pretend to any disposition to virtue no not he he had entertained as it proved a strong passion for me which had been heightened by my resisting it his pride and his advantages both of person and fortune would not let him brook control and when he could not have me upon his own terms god turned his evil purposes to good ones and he resolved to submit to mine or rather to such as he found i would not yield to him without but lady betty thinks i was to blame to put mrs jukes upon a foot in the present i made on my nuptials with mrs jervis but i rather put mrs jervis on a foot with mrs jukes for the dear gentleman had named the sum for me to give mrs jukes and i would not give mrs jervis less because i loved her better nor more could i give her on that occasion without making such a difference between two persons equal in station on a solemnity too where one was present and assisting the other not as would have shown such a partiality as might have induced their master to conclude i was not so sincere in my forgiveness as he hoped from me and as i really was but a stronger reason still was behind that i could much more agreeably both to mrs jervis and myself show my love and gratitude to the dear good woman and this i have taken care to do in the manner i will submit to your ladyship at the tribunal of whose judgment i am willing all my actions 
respecting your dear brother, shall be tried, and I hope you will not have reason to think me a too profuse or lavish creature. Yet, if you have, pray, my dear lady, don't spare me, for if you shall judge me profuse in one article, I will endeavour to save it in another. But I will make what I have to say on this head the subject of a letter by itself, and am, meantime, your ladyship's most obliged and obedient servant. P. B. End of Letter 16letter seventeen of pamela volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org pamela volume two by samuel richardson letter seventeen my dear lady it is needful in order to let you more intelligibly into the subject where i left off in my last for your ladyship to know that your generous brother has made me his almoner, as I was my late dear lady's, and ordered Mr. Longman to pay me fifty pounds quarterly, for purposes of which he requires no account, though I have one always ready to produce. Now, madam, as I knew Mrs. Jervis was far from being easy in her circumstances, thinking herself obliged to pay old debts for two extravagant children, who are both dead, and maintaining in schooling and clothes three of their children, which always keeps her bare, I said to her one day, as she and I sat together at our needles, for we are always running over old stories when alone, My good Mrs. Jervis, will you allow me to ask you after your own private affairs, and if you are tolerably easy in them? You are very good, madam, said she, to concern yourself about my poor matters, so much as your thoughts are employed, and every moment of your time is taken up, from the hour you rise to the time of your rest. But I can with great pleasure attribute it to your bounty, and that of my honoured master, that I am easier and easier every day. But tell me, my dear Mrs. Jervis, said I, how your matters particularly stand. I love to mingle concerns with my friends and as I hide nothing from you, I hope you'll treat me with equal freedom, for I always loved you, and always will, and nothing but death shall divide our friendship. She had tears of gratitude in her eyes, and taking off her spectacles. I cannot bear, she said, so much goodness. Oh, my lady! Oh, my Pamela, say, replied I, how often must I chide you for calling me anything but your Pamela? when we are alone together. My heart, said she, will burst with your goodness. I cannot bear it. But you must bear it, and bear still greater exercises to your grateful heart. I can tell you that. A pretty thing, truly. Here I, a poor helpless girl, raised from poverty and distress by the generosity of the best of men, only because I was young and slightly, shall put on lady airs to a gentlewoman born, the wisdom of whose years, her faithful service, and good management, makes her a much greater merit in this family, than I can pretend to have. And shall I return in the day of my power, insult and haughtiness, for the kindness and benevolence I received from her in that of my indigence? Indeed, I won't forgive you, my dear Mrs. Jervis, if I think you capable, of looking upon me in any other light than as your daughter, for you have been a mother to me, when the absence of my own could not afford me the comfort and good counsel I received every day from you. Then moving my chair nearer, and taking her hand, and wiping with my handkerchief in my other her reverend cheek, Come, my dear second mother, said I, call me your daughter, your Pamela, I have passed many sweet hours with you under that name, and as I have but too seldom such an opportunity as this, open to me your worthy heart, and let me know if I cannot make my second mother as easy and happy as our dear master has made my first. She hung her head, and I waited till the discharge of her tears gave time for utterance to her words, provoking only her speech by saying, 
you used to have three grandchildren to provide for in clothes and schooling they are all living i hope yes madam they are living and your last bounty twenty guineas was a great sum and all at once made me very easy and very happy how easy and how happy mrs jervis why my dear lady i paid five to one old creditor of my unhappy sons five to a second and two and a half to two others in proportion to their respective demands and with the other five i paid off all arrears of the poor children's schooling and maintenance and all are satisfied and easy and declare they will never do harsh things by me if they are paid no more but tell me mrs jervis the whole you owe in the world and you and i will contrive with justice to our best friend to do all we can to make you quite easy for at your time of life i cannot bear that you shall have anything to disturb you which i can remove and so my dear mrs jervis let me know all i know your debts dear just good woman as you are like david's sins are ever before you so come putting my hand in her pocket let me be a friendly pickpocket let me take out your memorandum book and we will see how all matters stand and what can be done come i see you are too much moved your worthy heart is too much affected pulling out her book which she always had about her i will go to my closet and return presently so i left her to recover her spirits and retired with the good woman's book to my closet your dear brother stepping into the parlour just after i had gone out where's your lady mrs jervis said he and being told came up to me what ails the good woman below my dear said he i hope you and she have had no words no indeed sir answered i if we had i am sure it would have been my fault but i have picked her pocket off her memorandum book in order to look into her private affairs to see if i cannot with justice to our common benefactor make her as easy as you sir have made my other dear parents a blessing said he upon my charmer's benevolent heart i will leave everything to your discretion my dear do all the good you prudently can to your mrs jervis i clasped my bold arms about him the starting tear testifying my gratitude dearest sir said i you affect me as much as i did mrs jervis and if any one but you had a right to ask what ails your pamela as you do what ails mrs jervis i must say i am hourly so much oppressed by your goodness that there is hardly any bearing one's own joy he saluted me and said i was a dear obliging creature but said he i came to tell you that after dinner we'll take a turn if you please to lady arthur's she has a family of london friends for her guests and begs i will prevail upon you to give her your company and attend you myself only to drink tea with her for i have told her we are to have friends to sup with us i will attend you sir replied i most willingly although i doubt i am to be made a show of something like it said he for she has promised them this favour i need not dress otherwise than i am no he was pleased to say i was always what he wished me to be so he left me to my good works those were his kind words and i ran over mrs jervis's accounts and found a balance drawn of all her matters in one leaf and a thankful acknowledgment to god for her master's last bounty which had enabled her to give satisfaction to others and to do herself great pleasure written underneath the balance of all was thirty five pounds eleven shillings and odd pence and i went to my escritoire and took out forty pounds and down i hasted to my good mrs jervis and i said to her here my dear good friend is your pocket-book but are thirty five or thirty six pounds all you owe or are bound for in the world it is madam said she and enough too it is a great sum but tis in four hands and they are all in pretty good circumstances and so convinced of my honesty that they will never trouble me for it for i have reduced the debt every year something since i have been in my master's service nor shall it ever be in anybody's power said i to trouble you 
I'll tell you how we'll order it. So I sat down and made her sit by me. Here, my dear Mrs. Jervis, is forty pounds. It is not so much to me now, as the two guineas were to you, that you would have given me at my going away from this house to my father's, as I thought. I will not give it you neither, at least at present, as you shall hear. Indeed, I won't make you so uneasy as that comes to, but take this, and pay the thirty-five pounds odd money to the utmost farthing, and the remaining four pounds odd will be a little fund in advance towards the children's schooling, and thus you shall repay it, I always designed, as our dear master added five guineas per annum to your salary, in acknowledgment of the pleasure he took in your services, when I was Pamela Andrews, to add five pounds per annum to it from the time I became Mrs. B. But from that time, for so many years to come, you shall receive no more than you did, till the whole forty pounds be repaid. So, my dear Mrs. Jervis, you won't have any obligation to me, you know, but for the advance, and that is a poor matter not to be spoken of, and I will have leave for it, for fear I should die. Had your ladyship seen the dear good woman's behaviour on this occasion, you would never have forgotten it. She could not speak. Tears ran down her cheeks in plentiful currents. Her modest hand put gently from her my offering hand. Her bosom heaved, and she sobbed with the painful tumult that seemed to struggle within her, and which, for some few moments, made her incapable of speaking. At last, I, rising and putting my arm round her neck, wiping her eyes and kissing her cheek, she cried, my excellent lady, tis too much. I cannot bear all this. She then threw herself at my feet, for I was not strong enough to hinder it, and with uplifted hands, May God Almighty, said she, I kneeled by her and clasping her hands in mine, both uplifted together. May God Almighty, said I, drowning her voice with my louder voice, bless us both together for many happy years and bless and reward the dear gentleman, who has thus enabled me to make the widow's heart to sing for joy. And thus, my lady, did I force upon the good woman's acceptance the forty pounds. Permit me, madam, to close this letter here, and to resume the subject in my next, till when I have the honour to be your ladyship's most obliged and faithful servant, P. B. End of letter 17letter 18 of pamela volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org pamela volume 2 by samuel richardson letter 18 my dear lady i now resume my last subject where i left off that your ladyship may have the whole before you at one view I went after dinner with my dear benefactor to Lady Arthur's, and met with fresh calls upon me for humility, having the two natural effects of the praises and professed admiration of that lady's guests, as well as my dear Mr. B.'s, and those of Mr. and Mrs. Arthur, to guard myself against, and your good brother was pleased to entertain me in the chariot, going and coming, with an account of the orders he had given in relation to the London house which is actually taken, and the furniture he should direct for it. So I had no opportunity to tell him what I had done in relation to Mrs. Jervis. But after supper, retiring from company to my closet, when his friends were gone, he came up to me about our usual bedtime. He inquired kindly after my employment, which was trying to read in the French Telemachus. For my lady, I'm learning French, I'll assure you, and who do you think is my master? Why, the best I could have in the world, your dearest brother, who is pleased to say I am no dunce. How inexcusable should I be, if I was with such a master, who teaches me on his knee, and rewards me with a kiss whenever I do well, and says I have already nearly mastered the accent and pronunciation, which he tells me is a great difficulty got over. I requested him to render for me into English, 
two or three places that were beyond my reach and when he had done it he asked me in french what i had done for mrs jervis i said permit me sir for i am not proficient enough to answer you in my new tongue in english to say i have made the good woman quite happy and if i have your approbation i shall be as much so myself in this instance as i am in all others i dare answer for your prudence my dear he was pleased to say but this is your favourite let me know when you have so bountiful a heart to strangers what you do for your favourites i then said permit my bold eye sir to watch yours as i obey you and you know you must not look full upon me then for if you do how shall i look at you again how see as i proceed whether you are displeased for you will not chide me in words so partial have you the goodness to be to all i do he put his arm round me and looked down now and then as i desired for oh madam he is all condescension and goodness to his unworthy yet grateful pamela i told him all i have written to you about the forty pounds and now dear sir said i half hiding my face on his shoulder you have heard what i have done chide or beat your pamela if you please it shall be all kind from you and matter of future direction and caution he raised my head and kissed me two or three times saying thus then i chide i beat my angel and yet i have one fault to find in you and let mrs jervis if not in bed come up to us and hear what it is for i will expose you as you deserve before her my polly being in hearing attending to know if i wanted her assistance to undress i bade her call mrs jervis and though i thought from his kind looks and kind words as well as tender behaviour that i had not much to fear yet i was impatient to know what my fault was for which i was to be exposed the good woman came and as she entered with all that modesty which is so graceful in her he moved his chair further from me and with a set aspect but not unpleasant said step in mrs jervis your lady for so madam he will always call me to mrs jervis and to the servants has incurred my censure and i would not tell her in what till i had you face to face she looked surprised now on me now on her dear master and i not knowing what he would say looked a little attentive i am sorry i am very sorry for it sir said she curtsying low but should be more sorry if i were the unhappy occasion why mrs jervis i can't say but it is on your account that i must blame her this gave us both confusion but especially the good woman for still i hoped much from this kind behaviour to me just before and she said indeed sir i could never deserve he interrupted her my charge against you pamela said he is that of niggardliness and no other for i will put you both out of your pain you ought not to have found out the method of repayment dear creature said he to mrs jervis seldom does anything that can be mended but i think when your good conduct deserved an annual acknowledgment from me in addition to your salary the lady should have showed herself no less pleased with your service than the gentleman had it been for old acquaintance sake for sex sake she should not have given me cause to upbraid her on this head but i will tell you that you must look upon the forty pounds you have as the effect of just distinction on many accounts and your salary from last quarter day shall be advanced as the dear niggard intended it some years hence and let me only add that when my pamela first begins to show a coldness to her mrs jervis i shall then suspect she is beginning to decline in that humble virtue which is now peculiar to herself and makes her the delight of all who converse with her he was thus pleased to say thus with the most graceful generosity and a nobleness of mind truly peculiar to himself was he pleased to act and what could mrs jervis or i say to him why indeed nothing at all we could only look upon one another with our eyes and our hearts full of gratitude 
that would not permit either of us to speak but which expressed itself at last in a manner he was pleased to call more elegant than words with uplifted folded hands and tears of joy oh my dear lady how many opportunities have the beneficent rich to make themselves as well as their fellow creatures happy all that i could think or say or act was but my duty before what a sense of obligation then must i lie under to this most generous of men but here let me put an end to this tedious subject the principal part of which can have no excuse if it may not serve as a proof of my cheerful compliance with your ladyship's commands that i recite everything of concern to me and with the same freedom as i used to do to my dear parents i have done it and at the same time offered what i had to plead in behalf of my conduct to the two housekeepers which you expected from me and i shall therefore close this my humble defence if i may so call it with the assurance that i am my dearest lady your obliged and faithful servant p b end of letter eighteen letter nineteen of pamela volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org pamela volume two by samuel richardson letter nineteen from lady davers to mrs b in answer to the six last letters where she had it i can't tell but i think i've never met with the fellow of her in my life at any age are as i remember my brother's words speaking of his pamela in the early part of your papers in truth thou art a surprising creature and every letter we have from you we have new subjects to admire you for do you think lady betty said i when i had read to the end of the subject about mrs jervis i will not soon set out to hit this charming girl a box of the ear or two for what lady davers said she for what replied i why don't you see how many slaps of the face the bold slut hits me i'll lady airs her i will i'll teach her to reproach me and so many of her betters with her cottage excellences and improvements that shame our education why you dear charming pamela did you only excel me in words i could forgive you for there may be a knack and a volubility as to words that a natural talent may supply but to be thus outdone in thought and in deed who can bear it and in so young an insulter too well pamela look to it when i see you you shall feel the weight of my hand or the pressure of my lip one or t'other depend on it very quickly for here instead of my stooping as i thought i would be to call you sister i shall be forced to think in a little while that you ought not to own me as yours till i am nearer your standard but to come to business i will summarily take notice of the following particulars in all your obliging letters in order to convince you of my friendship by the freedom of my observations on the subjects you touch upon first then i am highly pleased with what you write of the advantages you received from the favour of my dear mother and as you know many things of her by your attendance upon her the last three or four years of her life i must desire you will give me as opportunity shall offer all you can recollect in relation to the honoured lady and of her behaviour and kindness to you and with a retrospect to your own early beginnings the dawnings of this your bright day of excellence and this not only i but the countess and lady betty with whom i am going over your papers again and her sister lady jenny request of you two i am much pleased with your kentish account though we wished you had been more particular in some parts of it for we are greatly taken with your descriptions and your conversation pieces yet i own your honest father's letters and yours a good deal supply that defect three i am highly delighted with your account of my brother's breaking to you the affair of sally godfrey and your conduct upon it tis a sweet story as he brought it in and as you relate it 
the wretch has been very just in his account of it we are in love with your charitable reflections in favour of the poor lady and the more as she certainly deserved them and a better mother too than she had and a faithfuller lover than she met with four you have exactly hit his temper in your declared love of miss goodwill i see child you know your man and never fear but you'll hold him if you can go on thus to act and outdo your sex but i should think you might as well not insist upon having her with you you'd better see her now and then at the dairy house or at school than have her with you but this i leave to your own discretion five you have satisfactorily answered our objections to your behaviour to mrs jukes we had not considered your circumstances quite so thoroughly as we ought to have done you were a charming girl and all your motives are so just that we shall be a little more cautious for the future how we censor you in short i say with the countess this good girl is not without her pride but it is the pride that becomes and can only attend the innocent heart and i'll warrant said her ladyship nobody will become her station so well as one who is capable of so worthy a pride as this but what a curtain lecture hadst thou pamela a noble one dost thou call it why what a wretch hast thou got to expect thou shouldst never expostulate against his lordly will even when in the wrong till thou hast obeyed it and of consequence joined in the evil he imposes much good may have such a husband do you says lady betty everybody will admire you but no one will have reason to envy you upon those principles six i am pleased with your promise of sending what you think i shall like to see out of those papers you choose not to show me collectively this is very obliging you're a good girl and i love you dearly seven we have all smiled at your paradox pamela that his marrying you was an instance of his pride the thought though is pretty enough and ingenious but whether it will hold or not i won't just now examine eight your observation on the forget and forgive we are much pleased with nine you are very good in sending me a copy of miss darnford's letter she is a charming young lady i always had a great opinion of her merit her letter abundantly confirms me in it i hope you'll communicate to me every letter that passes between you and pray send in your next a copy of your answer to her letter i must insist upon it i think Ten. I am glad with all my heart to hear of poor Dukes's reformation. Your example carries all before it, but pray, oblige me with your answer to her letter. Don't think me unreasonable, tis all for your sake. Pray, have you shown Dukes's letter to your good friend? Lady Betty wants to know, if you have, what he could say to it, for she says it cuts him to the quick, and I think so too. If he takes it as he ought, but as you say, he's above loving virtue for virtue's sake. 11. Your manner of acting by Mrs. Jervis, with so handsome a regard to my brother's interest, her behaviour upon it, and your relation of the whole, and of his generous spirit in approving, reproving, and improving, your prudent generosity, make no inconsiderable figure in your papers, and Lady Betty says, hang him, he has some excellent qualities too it is impossible not to think well of him and his good actions go a great way towards atoning for his bad but you pamela have the glory of all twelve i am glad you are learning french thou art a happy girl in thy teacher and he is a happy man in his scholar we are pleased with your pretty account of his method of instructing and rewarding "'Twould be strange if you did not thus learn any language quickly, "'with such encouragements from the man you love, "'were your genius less apt than it is. "'But we wished you had enlarged on that subject, "'for such fondness of men to their wives, "'who have been any time married, is so rare, "'and so unexpected from my brother, "'that we thought you should have written aside upon the subject at least. 
What a bewitching girl art thou! What an exemplar to wives now, as well as thou wast before to maidens! Thou canst tame lions, I dare say, if thou'dst try. Reclaim a rake in the meridian of his libertinism, and make such a one as my brother not only marry thee, but love thee better at several months' end than he did the first day, if possible. Now, my dear Pamela, I think I have taken notice of the most material articles in your letters, and have no more to say to you, but write on and oblige us, and mind to send me the copy of your letter to Miss Darnford, of that you wrote to poor penitent dukes, and every article I have written about, and all that comes into your head, or that passes, and you'll oblige yours, etc. B. Davers End of Letter 19letter twenty of pamela volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org pamela volume two by samuel richardson letter twenty my dear lady i read with pleasure your commands in your last kind and obliging letter and you may be sure of a ready obedience in every one of them that is in my power. That which I can most easily do, I will do first, and that is, to transcribe the answer I sent to Miss Darnford, and that to Mrs. Jukes, the former of which, and a long one it is, is as follows. Dear Miss Darnford, I begin now to be afraid I shall not have the pleasure and benefit I promise myself, of passing a fortnight or three weeks at the hall, in your sweet conversation, and that of your worthy family, as well as those others in your agreeable neighbourhood, whom I must always remember with equal honour and delight. The occasion will be principally that we expect very soon Lord and Lady Davers, who propose to tarry here a fortnight at least, and after that the advanced season will carry us to London, where Mr. B. has taken a house for his winter residence, and in order to attend Parliament, a service, he says, which he has been more deficient in hitherto than he can either answer to his constituents or to his own conscience, for though he is but one, yet if any good motion should be lost by one, every absent member who is independent has to reproach himself with the consequence of the loss of that good which might otherwise redound to the commonwealth. And besides, he says, such excuses as he could make every one might plead, and then public affairs might as well be left to the administration, and no Parliament be chosen. See you, my dear Miss Darnford, from the humble cottager, what a public person your favourite friend is grown. How easy is it for a bold mind to look forward, and perhaps forgetting what she was, now she imagines she has a stake in the country, takes upon herself to be as important, as significant, as if, like my dear Miss Darnford, she had been born to it. Well, but may I not ask whether, if the mountain cannot come to Mahomet, Mahomet will not come to the mountain, since Lady Davers' visit is so uncertain as to its beginning and duration, and so great a favour as I am to look upon it, and really shall, it being her first visit to me. And since we must go and take possession of our London residence, why can't Sir Simon spare to us the dear lady whom he could use hardly, and whose attendance, though he is indeed entitled to all her duty, he did not, just in that instance, quite so much deserve. Well, but after all, Sir Simon, would I say, if I had been in presence at his peevish hour, you are a fine gentleman, are you not, to take such a method to show your good daughter, that because she did not come soon enough to you, she came too soon, and did ever papa, before you put a good book, for such I doubt not it was, because you were in affliction, though so little affected by its precepts, to such a bad use, as parents' examples are so prevalent. Suppose your daughter had taken it and flung it at her sister, Miss Nancy at her waiting-maid, and so it had gone through the family. Would it not have been an excuse for every one to say, 
that the father and the head of the family had set the example. You almost wish, my dear miss, tells me, that I would undertake you. This is very good of you. Sir Simon, I might. Would his patience have suffered me to run on thus, have added, but I hope, since you are so sensible that you want to be undertaken, and since this peevish rashness convinces me that you do, that you will undertake yourself, that you will not, when your indisposition requires the attendance and duty of your dear lady and daughter, make it more uncomfortable to them, by adding a difficulty of being pleased, and an impatience of spirit, to the concern their duty and affection make them have for you, and at least resolve never to take a book into your hand again, if you cannot make a better use of it than you did then. But Sir Simon will say, I have already undertaken him, were he to see this. Yet my Lady Darnford once begged, I would give him a hint or two on this subject, which, she was pleased to say, would be better received from me than from anybody, and if it be a little too severe, it is but a just reprisal, made by one whose ears he knows he has cruelly wounded more than once, twice, or thrice besides, by what he calls his innocent double entendres, and who, if she had not resented it when an opportunity offered, must have been believed by him to be neither more nor less than a hypocrite. There's for you, Sir Simon, and so here ends all my malice, for now I have spoken my mind. Yet I hope your dear papa will not be so angry as to deny me, for this my freedom, the request I make to him, to your mamma, and to your dear self, for your beloved company, for a month or two in Bedfordshire, and at London, and if you might be permitted to winter with us at the latter, how happy should I be. It will be half done the moment you desire it. Sir Simon loves you too well to refuse you, if you are earnest in it. Your honoured mamma is always indulgent to your requests, and Mr. B., as well in kindness to me, as for the great respect he bears you, joins with me to beg this favour of you, and of Sir Simon and my lady. If it can be obtained, what pleasure and improvement may I not propose to myself, with so polite a companion, when we are carried by Mr. B. to the play, the opera, and other of the town diversions? We will work, visit, read, and sing together, and improve one another. You, me, in every word you shall speak, in everything you shall do. I, you, by my questions, and desire of information, which will make you open all your breasts to me, and so unlocking that dear storehouse of virtuous knowledge, improve your own notions, the more for communicating them. Oh, my dear Miss Darnford, I, how happy is it in your power to make me! I am much affected with your account of Mrs. Jukes's reformation. I could have wished, had I not other and stronger inducements, in the pleasure of so agreeable a neighbourhood and so sweet a companion, I could have been down at the hall, in hopes to have confirmed the poor woman in her newly assumed penitence. God give her grace to persevere in it, to be a humble means of saving a soul from perdition. Oh, my dear Miss Darnford, let me enjoy that heart-ravishing hope, to pluck such a brand as this out of the fire, and to assist to quench its flaming susceptibility for mischief and make it useful to edifying purposes. What a pleasure does this afford one! How does it encourage one to proceed, in the way one has been guided to pursue? How does it make me hope that I am raised to my present condition, in order to be a humble instrument in the hand of Providence, to communicate great good to others, and so extend to many those benefits I have received, which, were they to go no further than myself, what a vile, what an ungrateful creature should I be! I see, my dearest Miss Darnford, how useful in every condition of life a virtuous and a serious turn of mind may be. In hopes of seeing you with us, I will not enlarge on several agreeable subjects, which I could touch upon with pleasure, besides what I gave you in my former, of my reception here, and of the kindness of our genteel neighbours. Such, particularly as the arrival here of my dear parents, 
and the kind, generous entertainment they met with from my best friend, his condescension in not only permitting me to attend them to Kent, but accompanying us thither, and settling them in a most happy manner, beyond their wishes and my own, but yet so much in character, as I may say, that every one must approve his judicious benevolence. The favours of my good Lady Davis to me, who pleased with my letters, has vouchsafed to become my correspondent, and a thousand things which I want personally to communicate to my dear Miss Darnford. Be pleased to present my humble respects to Lady Darnford, and to Miss Nancy, to good Madam Jones, and to your kind friends at Stamford, also to Mr. and Mrs. Peters, and their kinswoman, and beg of that good gentleman from me to encourage his new proselyte all he can, and I doubt not she will do credit, poor woman, to the pains he shall take with her, in hopes of your kind compliance with my wishes for your company. I remain, dearest Miss Darnford, your faithful and obliged friend and servant. P.B. This, my good lady, is the long letter I sent to Miss Darnford, who at parting engaged me to keep up a correspondence with her, and put me in hopes of passing a month or two at the hall, if we came down, and if she could persuade Sir Simon and her mamma to spare her to my wishes. Your ladyship will excuse me for so faintly mentioning the honours you confer upon me, but I would not either add or diminish in the communications I make to you. The following is the copy of what I wrote to Mrs. Jukes. You give me Mrs. Jukes very great pleasure, to find that at length God Almighty has touched your heart and let you see, while health and strength lasted, the error of your ways. Many an unhappy one has not been so graciously touched, till they have smarted under some heavy afflictions, or been confined to the bed of sickness, when perhaps they have made vows and resolutions that have held them no longer to the discipline lasted. But you give me much better hopes of the sincerity of your conversion, as you are so well convinced, before some sore evil has overtaken you, and it ought to be an earnest to you of the divine favour, and should keep you from despondency. As to me, it became me to forgive you, as I most cordially did, since your usage of me, as it proved, was but a necessary means in the hand of Providence, to exalt me to that state of happiness, in which I have every day more and more cause given me to rejoice by the kindest and most generous of gentlemen. As I have often prayed for you, even when you use me the most unkindly, I now praise God for having heard my prayers, and with high delight look upon you as a reclaimed soul given to my supplication. May the divine goodness enable you to persevere in the course you have begun, and when you can taste the all-surpassing pleasure that fills the worthy breast, on being placed in a station where your example may be of advantage to the souls of others, as well as to your own, a pleasure that every good mind glories in, and none else can truly relish, then may you be assured that nothing but your perseverance, and the consequential improvement resulting from it, is wanted to convince you that you are in a right way, and that the woe that is pronounced against the presumptuous sinner belongs not to you. Let me therefore, dear Mrs. Jukes, for now indeed you are dear to me, caution you against two things. The one, that you return not to your former ways, and willfully err after this repentance, for the divine goodness will then look upon itself as mocked by you, and will withdraw itself from you, and more dreadful will your state then be, than if you had never repented. The other, that you don't despair of the divine mercy, which has so evidently manifested itself in your favour, and has awakened you out of your deplorable lethargy, without those sharp medicines and operations, which others, and perhaps not more faulty persons, have suffered, but go on cheerfully in the same happy path. Depend upon it, you are now in the right way, and turn not either to the right hand or to the left, for the reward is before you, in reputation and a good fame in this life, and everlasting felicity beyond it. Your letter is that of a sensible woman, 
as I always thought you, and of a truly contrite one, as I hope you will prove yourself to be, and I the rather hope it, as I shall be always desirous, then of taking every opportunity that offers of doing you real service, as well as with regard to your present as future life. For I am, good Mrs. Jukes, as I now hope, I may call you, your loving friend to serve you, P. B. Whatever good books the worthy Mr. Peters will be so kind as to recommend to you, and to those under your direction, send for them either to Lincoln, Stamford, or Grantham, and place them to my account, and may they be the effectual means of confirming you and them in the good way you are in. I have done as much for all here, and I hope to no bad effect, for I shall now tell them, by Mrs. Jervis, if there be occasion, that I hope they will not let me be outdone in Bedfordshire, by Mrs. Jukes in Lincolnshire, but that the servants of both houses may do credit to the best of masters. Adieu, good woman, as once more I take pleasure to style you. Thus, my good lady, have I obeyed you. In transcribing these two letters, I will now proceed to your ladyship's twelve articles. As to the one, I will oblige your ladyship, as I have opportunity, in my future letters, with such accounts of my dear lady's favour and goodness to me, as I think will be acceptable to you, and to the noble ladies you mention. 2. I am extremely delighted that your ladyship thinks so well of my dear honest parents. They are good people, and ever had minds that set them above low and sordid actions, and God and your good brother has rewarded them most amply in this world, which is more than they ever expected, after a series of unprosperousness in all they undertook. Your ladyship is pleased to say that people in upper life love to see how plain nature operates in honest minds, who have hardly anything else for their guide, and if I might not be thought to descend too low for your ladyship's attention, for, as to myself, I shall, I hope, always look back with pleasure to what I was, in order to increase my thankfulness for what I am. I would give you a scene of resignation and contented poverty, of which otherwise you could hardly have a notion. I will give it, because it will be a scene of nature, however low, which your ladyship loves, and it shall not tire you by its length. It was upon occasion of a great loss and disappointment, which happened to my dear parents, for though they were never high in life, yet they were not always so low as my honoured lady found them when she took me. My poor father came home, and as the loss was of such a nature, as that he could not keep it from my mother, he took her hand and said, after he had acquainted her with it, Come, my dear, let us take comfort that we did for the best. We left the issue to Providence, as we ought, and that has turned it as it pleased and we must be content, though not favoured, as we wished. All the business is, our lot is not cast for this life. Let us resign ourselves to the divine will, and continue to do our duty, and this short life will soon be past. Our troubles will be quickly overblown, and we shall be happy in a better, I make no doubt. Then my dear mother threw her arms about his neck, and said with tears, God's will be done, my dear love. All cannot be rich and happy. I am contented, and had rather say I have a poor honest husband than a guilty rich one. What signifies repining? Let the world go as it will. We shall have our length and our breadth at last. And Providence, I doubt not, will be a better friend to our good girl here, because she is good than we could be if this had not happened pointing to me who, then about eleven years old, for it was before my lady took me, sat weeping in the chimney corner over a few dying embers of a fire at their moving expressions. I arose and kissing both their hands and blessing them said, and this length and breadth, my dear parents, will be one day all that the rich and the great can possess, and it may be their ungracious airs will trample upon their ashes and rejoice they are gone, while such a poor girl as I am honouring the memories of mine, who in their good names and good lessons 
will have left me the best of portions and then they both hugged me to their fond bosoms by turns and all three were filled with comfort in one another for a farther proof that the honest poverty is not such a deplorable thing as some people imagine let me ask what pleasure can those over-happy persons know who from the luxury of their tastes and their affluent circumstances always eat before they are hungry and drink before they are thirsty this may be illustrated by the instance of a certain eastern monarch who as i have read marching at the head of a vast enemy through a wide extended desert which afforded neither river nor spring for the first time found himself in common with his soldiers overtaken by a craving thirst which made him pant after a cup of water and when after diligent search one of his soldiers found a little dirty puddle and carried him some of the filthy water in his nasty helmet the monarch greedily swallowing it cried out that in all his life he never tasted so sweet a draught but when i talk or write of my worthy parents how i run on excuse me my good lady and don't think me in this respect too much like the cat in the fable turned into a fine lady for though i would never forget what i was yet i would be thought to know how gratefully to enjoy my present happiness as well with regard to my obligations to god as to your dear brother but let me proceed to your ladyship's third particular three and you cannot imagine madam how much you have set my heart at rest when you say that my dear mr b gave me a just narrative of this affair with miss godfrey for when your ladyship desired to know how he had recounted that story lest you should make a misunderstanding between us unawares i knew not what to think i was afraid some blood had been shed on the occasion by him for the lady was ruined and as to her nothing could have happened worse the regard i have for mr b s future happiness which in my constant supplication for him in private cost me many a tear gave me great apprehensions and not a little uneasiness but as your ladyship tells me that he gave me a just account i am happy again i now come to your ladyship's fourth particular and highly delighted i am for having obtained your approbation of my conduct to the child as well as of my behaviour towards the dear gentleman on the unhappy lady's score your ladyship's wise intimations about having the child with me make due impressions upon me and i see in them with grateful pleasure your unmerited regard for me yet i don't know how it is but i have conceived a strange passion for this dear baby i cannot but look upon her poor mamma as my sister in point of trial and shall not the prosperous sister pity and love the poor dear sister that in so slippery a path have fallen while she had the happiness to keep her feet the rest of your ladyship's articles give me the great pleasure and satisfaction and if i can but continue myself in the favour of your dear brother and improve in that of his noble sister how happy shall i be i will do all i can to deserve both and i hope you will take as an instance of it my cheerful obedience to your commands in writing to so fine a judge such crude and indigested stuff as otherwise i ought to be ashamed to lay before you i am impatient for the honour of your presence here and yet i perplex myself with the fear of appearing so unworthy in your eye when near you as to suffer in your opinion but i promise myself that however this may be the case on your first visit i shall be so much improved by the benefits i shall reap from your lessons and good example that whenever i shall be favoured with a second you shall have fewer faults to find with me till as i shall be more and more favoured i shall in time be just what your ladyship will wish me to be and of consequence more worthy than i am of the honour of styling myself your ladyship's most humble and obedient servant p b end of letter twenty
Letter twenty one of Pamela, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela, volume two by Samuel Richardson. Letter twenty one from Miss Darnford in answer to Mrs. B's, page sixty. My dear Mrs. B, you are highly obliging in expressing so warmly your wishes to have me with you. I know not anybody in this world, out of our own family, in whose company I should be happier. But my papa won't part with me, I think, though I have secured my mamma in my interest, and I know Nancy would be glad of my absence, because the dear, perversely envious, thinks me more valued than she is. And yet, foolish girl, she don't consider that if her envy be well grounded, I should return with more than double advantages to what I now have, improved by your charming conversation. My papa affects to be in a fearful pet at your lecturing of him so justly, for my mamma would show him the letter, and he says he will positively demand satisfaction of Mr. B for your treating him so freely, and yet he shall hardly think him, he says, on a rank with him, unless Mr. B will, on occasion of the new commission, take out his steadiness. And then, if he will bring you down to Lincolnshire, and join with him to commit you prisoner for a month at the hall, all shall be well. It is very obliging in Mr. B to join in your kind invitation, but yet I am loath to say it to you, the character of your worthy gentleman, I doubt, stands a little in the way with my papa. My mamma pleaded his being married. At Stein's, madam, said he, what of all that? But, sir, said I, I hope, if I may not go to Bedfordshire, you'll permit me to go to London when Mrs. B. goes? No, said he, positively no. Well, sir, I have done. I could hope, however, you would enable me to give a better reason to good Mrs. B. why I am not permitted to accept of the kind invitation than that which I understand you have been pleased to assign. He stuck his hands in his sides, with his usual humorous positiveness. Why, then tell her she is a very saucy lady for her last letter to you, and her lord and master is not to be trusted, and it is my absolute will and pleasure that you ask me no more questions about it. I will very faithfully make this report, sir do so. And so I have. And your poor Polly Darnford is disappointed of one of the greatest pleasures she could have had. I can't help it. If you truly pity me, you can make me easier under the disappointment than otherwise possible by favouring me with an epistolary conversation, since I am denied a personal one. And my mamma joins in the request. Particularly let us know how Lady Davis' first visit passes which Mrs. Peters and Mrs. Jones, who know my lady so well, likewise long to hear, and this will make us the best amends in your power for the loss of your good neighbourhood, which we had all promised to ourselves. This denial of my papa comes out, since I wrote the above, to be principally owing to a proposal made him of an humble servant to one of his daughters. He won't see which, he tells us, in his usual humorous way, lest we should fall out about it. I suppose, I tell him, the young gentleman is to pick and choose which of the two he likes best. But be he a duke, tis all one to Polly, if he is not something above our common Lincolnshire class of fox-hunters. I have shown Mr. and Mrs. Peters your letter. They admire you beyond expression, and Mr. Peters says he does not know that ever he did anything in his life that gave him so much inward reproach as his denying you the protection of his family which Mr. Williams sought to move him to afford you, when you were confined at the hall, before Mr. B. came down to you, with his heart bent on mischief. And all he comforts himself with is, that very denial, as well as the other hardships you have met with, were necessary to bring about the work of providence, which was to reward your unexampled virtue. Yet, he says, he doubts he shall not be thought excusable by you, who are so exact in your own duty, since he had the unhappiness to lose such an opportunity to have done honour to his function, had he had the fortitude to have done his. And he has begged of me to hint his concern to you on this head, 
and to express his hopes that neither religion nor his cloth may suffer in your opinion for the fault of one of its professors who never was wanting in his duty so much before he had it often upon his mind he says to write to you on this very subject but he had not the courage and besides did not know how mr b might take it if he should see that letter as the case had such delicate circumstances in it that in blaming himself as he should very freely have done he must by implication have cast still greater blame upon him mr peters is certainly a very good man and my favourite for that reason and i hope you who could so easily forgive the late wicked but now penitent jukes will overlook with kindness a fault in a good man which proceeded more from pusillanimity and constitution than from want of principle for once talking of it to my mamma before me he accused himself on the score to her with tears in his eyes she good lady would have given you this protection at mr williams's desire but wanted the power to do it so you see my dear mrs b how your virtue has shamed every one into such a sense of what they ought to have done that good bad and indifferent are seeking to make excuses for past behaviour and to promise future amendment like penitent subjects returning to their duty to their conquering sovereign after some unworthy defection happy happy lady may you ever be so may you always convert your enemies invigorate the lukewarm and every day multiply your friends wishes your most affectionate polly darnford p s how i rejoice in the joy of your honest parents god bless em i am glad lady davis is so wise every one i have named desire their best respects write oftener and omit not the minutest thing for every line of yours carries instruction with it End of letter twenty one A letter twenty two of Pamela, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela, volume two by Samuel Richardson. Letter twenty two. From Sir Simon Darnford to Mr. B. Sir, little did I think I should ever have occasion to make a formal complaint against a person very dear to you, and who I believe deserves to be so. But don't let her be so proud and so vain of obliging and pleasing you, as to make her not care how she affronts everybody else. The person is no other than the wife of your bosom who has taken such liberties with me as ought not to be taken, and sought to turn my own child against me and make a dutiful girl a rebel. If people will set up for virtue and all that, let them be uniformly virtuous, or I would not give a farthing for their pretences. Here I have been plagued with gout, rheumatisms, and nameless disorders ever since you left us, which have made me call for a little more attendance than ordinary, and I had reason to think myself slighted, where an indulgent father can least bear to be so that is where he most loves and that by young upstarts who are growing up to the enjoyment of those pleasures which have run away from me fleeting rascals as they are before i was willing to part with them and i run and run and where's polly for i honour the slack with too much of my notice where's polly was all my cry to every one who came up to ask what I rung for, and at last in burst the pert baggage, with an air of assurance as if she thought all must be well the moment she appeared with, Do you want me, papa? Do I want you confidence? Yes, I do. Where have you been these two hours that you never came near me, when you knew it was my time to my foot rubbed, which gives me mortal pain? For you must understand, Mr. B., that nobody's hands so soft as polly's she gave me a saucy answer as i was disposed to think it because i had just then a twinge that i could scarce bear 
for pain is a plaguy thing to a man of my lively spirits she gave me i say a careless answer and turning upon her heel and not coming to me at my first word i flung a book which i had in my hand at her head on this fine lady of yours this paragon of meekness and humility in so many words bids me or which is worse tells my own daughter to bid me never to take a book into my hands again if i won't make a better use of it and yet what better use can an appended father make of the best books than to correct a rebellious child with them and oblige a saucy daughter to jump into a duty all at once mrs b reflects upon me for making her blush formally and saying things before my daughters that truly i ought to be ashamed of then avows malice and revenge why neighbour are these things to be borne do you allow your lady to set up for a general corrector of everybody's morals but your own do you allow her to condemn the only instances of wit that remain to this generation the dear polite double entendre which keeps alive the attention and quickens the apprehension of the best companies in the world and is the salt the sauce which gives a poignancy to all our genteel entertainments oh very fine truly that more than half the world shall be shut out of society shall be precluded their share of conversation amongst the gay and polite of both sexes were your lady to have her will let her first find people who can support a conversation with wit and good sense like her own and then something may be said but till then i positively say and will swear upon occasion that double entendre shall not be banished from our tables and where this won't raise a blush or create a laugh we will if we please for all mrs b and her new-fangled notions force the one and the other by still plainer hints and let her help herself as she can thus sir you find my complaints are of a high nature regarding the quiet of a family the duty of a child to a parent and the freedom and politeness of conversation in all which your lady has greatly offended and i insist upon satisfaction from you or such a correction of the fair transgressor as is in your power to inflict and which may prevent worse consequences from your offended friend and servant simon Darnford. End of letter twenty two. A letter twenty three of Pamela, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. Pamela, Volume Two, by Samuel Richardson. Letter Twenty Three, from Mister B, in answer to the preceding one. Dear Sir Simon, you cannot but believe that I was much surprised at your letter, complaining of the behaviour of my wife i could no more have expected such a complaint from such a gentleman than i could that she would have deserved it and i am very sorry on both accounts i have talked to her in such a manner that i dare say she will never give you like cause to appeal to me it happened that the criminal herself received it from her servant and brought it to me in my closet and making her honours for i can't but say she is very obliging to me though she takes such saucy freedoms with my friends away she tripped and i inquiring for her when with surprise as you may believe i had read your charge found she was gone to visit a poor sick neighbour of which indeed i knew before because she took the chariot but i had forgot it in my wrath at last in she came with that sweet composure in her face which results from a consciousness of doing generally just and generous things i resumed therefore that sternness and displeasure which her entrance had almost dissipated i took her hand 
her charming eye you know what an eye she has sir simon quivered at my overclouded aspect and her lips half drawn to a smile trembling with apprehension of a countenance so changed from what she left it and then all stiff and stately as i could look did i accost her come along with me pamela to my closet i want to talk with you what have i done let me know good sir looking round with her half affrighted eyes this way and that on the books and pictures and on me by turns you shall know soon said i the crime you have been guilty of crime sir pray let me this closet i hoped would not be a second time witness to the flutter you put me in there hangs a tale sir simon which i am not very fond of relating since it gave beginning to the triumphs of this little sorceress i still held one hand and she stood before me as criminals ought to do before their judge but said i see sir sure i do or what will else become of me less severity in your eyes than you affect to put on in your countenance dear sir let me but know my fault i will repent acknowledge and amend you must have great presence of mind pamela such is the nature of your fault if you can look me in the face when i tell it to you then let me said the irresistible charmer hiding her face in my bosom and putting her other arm above my neck let me thus my dear mr b hide this guilty face while i hear my fault told and i will not seek to extenuate it by my tears and my penitence i could hardly hold out what infatuating creatures are these women when they thus soothe and calm the tumults of an angry heart when instead of scornful looks darted in return for angry ones words of defiance for words of peevishness persisting to defend one error by another and returning vehement wrath for slight indignation and all the hostile provocations of the marriage warfare they can thus hide their dear faces in our bosoms and wish but to know their faults to amend them i could hardly i say resist the sweet girl's behaviour nay i believe i did and in defiance to my resolved displeasure press her forehead with my lips as the rest of her face was hid on my breast but considering it was the cause of my friend i was to assert my injured friend wounded and insulted in so various a manner by the fair offender thus haughtily spoke i to the trembling mischief in a pomp of style theatrically tragic i will not too inadvertent and undistinguishing pamela keep you long in suspense for the sake of a circumstance that on this occasion ought to give you as much joy as it has till now given me since it becomes an advocate in your favour when otherwise you might expect very severe treatment know then that the letter you gave me before you went out is a letter from a friend a neighbour a worthy neighbour complaining of your behaviour to him no other than sir simon donford for i would not amuse her too much a gentleman i must always respect and whom as my friend i expect you should since by the value a wife expresses for one esteemed by her husband whether she thinks so well of him herself or not a man ought always to judge of the sincerity of her regards to himself she raised her head at once on this thank heaven said she it is no worse i was at my wit's end almost in apprehension but i know how this must be dear sir how could you frighten me so i know how all this is i can now look you in the face and hear all that sir simon can charge me with for i am sure i have not so affronted him as to make him angry indeed and truly 
ran she on, secure of pardon, as she seemed to think. I should respect Sir Simon, not only as your friend, but on his own account, if he was not so sad a rake at a time of life. Then I interrupted her, you must needs think. Sir Simon, for how could I bear to hear my worthy friend so freely treated? How now, Pamela, said I, and is it thus, by repeating your fault, that you atone for it? Do you think I can bear to hear my friend so freely treated? Indeed, said she, I do respect Sir Simon very much as your friend, permit me to repeat, but cannot for his willful failings. Would it not be in some measure to approve of faulty conversation, if one can hear it, and not discourage it, when the occasion comes in so pat. And, indeed, I was glad of an opportunity, continued she, to give him a little rub. I must needs own it. But if it displeases you, or has made him angry in earnest, I am sorry for it, and will be less bold for the future. Read, then, said I, the heavy charge, and I'll return instantly to hear your answer to it. So I went from her for a few minutes, but, would you believe it, Sir Simon, she seemed on my return very little concerned at your just complaints. What self-justifying minds have the meekest of these women, instead of finding her in repentant tears, as one would expect? She took your angry letter for a jocular one, and I had great difficulty to convince her of the heinousness of her fault, or the reality of your resentment, upon which, being determined to have justice done to my friend, and a due sense of her own great error impressed upon her, I began thus. Pamela, take heed that you do not suffer the purity of your own mind in breach of your charity, to make you too rigorous a censurer of other people's actions. Don't be so puffed up with your own perfections, as to imagine that because other persons allow themselves liberties you cannot take, therefore they must be wicked. Sir Simon is a gentleman who indulges himself in a pleasant vein, and I believe, as well as you, has been a great rake and libertine. You'll excuse me, Sir Simon, because I am taking your part. But what then? You see it is all over with him now. He says that he must, and therefore he will be virtuous and is a man for ever to hear the faults of his youth when so willing to forget them a ah, but sir sir said the bold slut can you say he is willing to forget them does he not repine in this very letter that he must forsake them and does he not plainly cherish the inclination when he owns she hesitated owns what you know what i mean sir and i need not speak it and can there well be a more censurable character then before his maiden daughters his virtuous lady before anybody what a sad thing is this at a time of life which should afford a better example but dear sir continued the bold prattler taking advantage of a silence more owing to displeasure than approbation let me for i would not be too censorious no not she in the very act of censoriousness to say this let me offer but one thing don't you think sir simon himself would be loath to be thought a reformed gentleman don't you see his delight when speaking of his former pranks as if sorry he could not play them over again see but how he simpers and enjoys as one may say the relations of his own rakish actions when he tells a bad story but said i were this the case for i profess sir simon i was at a grievous loss to defend you for you to write all these free things against a father to his daughter is that right pamela oh sir the good gentleman himself has taken care that such a character as i presumed to draw to miss of her papa was no strange one to her you have seen yourself, Mr. B., whenever his arch leers and his humorous attitude on those occasions have taught us to expect some shocking story. 
how his ladies and daughters used to him as they are, have suffered in their apprehensions of what he would say before he spoke it. How particularly dear Miss Darnford has looked at me with concern, desirous, as it were, if possible, to save her papa from the censure which his faulty expressions must naturally bring upon him. And, dear sir, is it not a sad thing for a young lady, who loves and honours her papa, to observe that he is discrediting himself, and wants the example he ought to give? And pardon me, sir, for smiling on so serious an occasion, but is it not a fine sight to see a gentleman, as we have often seen Sir Simon, when he has thought proper to read a passage in some bad book, pulling off his spectacles to talk filthily upon it? methinks i see him now added the bold slut splitting his arch face with a broad laugh showing a mouth with hardly a tooth in it and making obscene remarks upon what he has read and then the dear saucy face laughed out to bear me company for i could not for the soul of me avoid laughing heartily at the figure she brought to my mind which I have seen my old friend more than once make, with his dismounted spectacles, arch mouth, and gums of shining jet, succeeded in those of polished ivory, of which he often boasts as one ornament of his youthful days. And either rather in my heart Sir Simon gave you up, because, when I was a sad fellow, it was always my maxim to endeavour to touch a lady's heart without wounding her ears, and, indeed, I found my account sometimes in observing it, but resuming my gravity, Hussy, said I, do you think I will have my old friend thus made the object of your ridicule? Suppose a challenge should have ensued between us on your account. What might have been the issue of it, to see an old gentleman stumping, as he says, on crutches, to fight a duel in defence of his wounded honour? Very bad, sir, to be sure, I see that, and am sorry for it. For had you carried off Sir Simon's crutch as a trophy, he must have lain sighing and groaning like a wounded soldier in the field of battle, till another had been brought him to have stumped home with. But, dear Sir Simon, I have brought this matter to an issue that will, I hope, make all easy. Miss Polly and my Pamela shall both be punished as they deserve, if it be not your own fault. I am told that the sins of your youth don't sit so heavily upon your limbs as in your imagination, and I believe change of air and the gratification of your revenge, a fine help to such lively spirits as yours, will set you up. You shall then take coach, and bring your pretty criminal to mine, and when we have them together, they shall humble themselves before us, and you can absolve or punish them as you shall see proper." for I cannot bear to have my worthy friend insulted in so heinous a manner by a couple of saucy girls, who, if not taken down in time, may proceed from fault to fault till there will be no living with them. If, to be still more serious, your lady and you will lend Miss Darnford to my Pamela's wishes, whose heart is set upon the hope of her wintering with us in town, you will lay an obligation upon us both, which will be acknowledged with great gratitude by dear sir your affectionate and humble servant end of letter twenty three letter twenty four of pamela volume two this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela, Volume 2 by Samuel Richardson Letter 24 From Sir Simon Darnford In Reply Hark ye, Mr. B., a word in your ear to be plain. I like neither you nor your wife well enough to trust my Polly with you. But here is war declared against my poor gums, it seems. Well, I will never open my mouth before your lady as long as I live, if I can help it. 
i have for these ten years avoided to put on my cravat and for what reason do you think why because i could not bear to see what ruins a few years have made in a visage that used to inspire love and terror as it pleased and here your botchily caller of a wife with all the insolence of youth and beauty on her side follows me with a glass and would make me look in it whether i will or not i am a plaguy good-humoured old fellow if i am an old fellow i should not bear the insults contained in your letter between you and your lady you make a wretched figure of me that's certain and yet tis taking my part but what must i do i'd be glad that any rake to stand in your lady's graces that i would nor would i be the last rake libertine unreformed by her example which i suppose will make virtue the fashion if she goes on as she does but here i have been used to cut a joke and toss the squib about and as far as i know it has helped to keep me alive in the midst of pains and aches and with two women grown girls and the rest of the mortifications that will attend on advanced years for i won't hang me if i will give it up as absolute old age but now it seems i must leave all this off or i must be mortified with a looking-glass held before me and every wrinkle must be made as conspicuous as a furrow and what pray is to succeed to this reformation i can neither fast nor pray i doubt and besides if my stomach and my jest depart from me farewell sir simon darnford but can that i pass as one necessary character do you think as a foil as by the by some of your own actions have been to your lady's virtue to set off some more edifying example where variety of characters make up a feast and conversation well i believe i might have trusted you with my daughter under your lady's eye rake as you have been yourself and fame says wrong if you have not been for your time a bolder sinner than ever i was with your maxim of touching ladies hearts without wounding their ears which made surer work with them that was all though tis to be hoped you are now reformed and if you are the whole country round you east west north and south of great obligations to your fair reclaimer but here is a fine prim young fellow coming out of norfolk with one estate in one county another in another and jointures and settlements in his hand and more wit in his head as well as more money in his pocket than he can tell what to do with to visit our polly though i tell her i much question the form of quality his wit if he is for marrying here then is the reason i cannot comply with your kind mrs b s request but if this matter should go off if he should not like her or she him or if i should not like his terms or he mine or still another or if he should like nancy better why then perhaps if polly be a good girl i may trust to her virtue and to your honour and let her go for a month or two now when i have said this and when i say further that i can forgive your severe lady and yourself too who however are less to be excused in the airs you assume which looks like one chimney-sweeper calling another a sooty rascal i gave a proof of my charity which i hope with mrs b will cover a multitude of faults and the rather since though i cannot be a follower of her virtue in the strictest sense i can be an admirer of it and that is some little merit and indeed all that can be at present pleaded by yourself i doubt any more than your humble servant simon darnford end of letter twenty four letter twenty five of pamela volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Pamela, Volume 2, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 25. My honoured and dear parents, I hope you will excuse my long silence, which has been owing to several causes, and having nothing new to entertain me with. And yet this last is but a poor excuse to you who think every trifling subject agreeable from your daughter i daily expect here my lord and lady davis 
this gives me no small pleasure and yet it is mingled with some uneasiness at times lest i should not when viewed so intimately near behave myself answerably to her ladyship's expectations but i resolve not to endeavour to move out of the sphere of my own capacity in order to emulate her ladyship she must have advantages by conversation as well as education which it would be arrogance in me to assume or to think of imitating all that i will attempt to do therefore shall be to show such a respectful obligingness to my lady as shall be consistent with the condition to which i am raised so that she may not have reason to reproach me of pride in my exultation nor her dear brother to rebuke me for meanness in condescending and as to my family arrangement i am the less afraid of inspection because by the natural bias of my own mind i bless god i am above dark reserves and have not one selfish or sordid view to make me wish to avoid the most scrutinizing eye i have begun a correspondence with miss darnford a young lady of uncommon merit but yet you know her character from my former writings she is very solicitous to hear of all that concerns me and particularly how lady davis and i agree together i loved her from the moment i saw her first for she has the least pride and the most benevolence and solid thought i ever knew in a young lady and does not envy any one i shall write to her often and as i shall have so many avocations besides to fill up my time i know you will excuse me if i procure from this lady the return of my letters to her for your perusal and for the entertainment of your leisure hours this will give you from time to time the accounts you desire of all that happens here but as to what relates to our own particulars i beg you will never spare writing as i shall not answering for it is one of my greatest delights that i have such worthy parents as i hope in god i long shall to bless me and to correspond with me the papers i send herewith will afford you some diversion particularly those relating to sir simon darnford and i must desire that when you have perused them as well as what i shall send for the future you will return them to me mr longman greatly pleased me on his last return in his account of your health and the satisfaction you take in your happy lot and i must recite to you a brief conversation on this occasion which i dare say will please you as much as it did me after having adjusted some affairs with his dear principal which took up to two hours my best beloved sent for me my dear said he seating me by him and making the good old gentleman sit down for he will always rise at my approach mr longman and i have settled in two hours some accounts which would have taken up to many months with some persons for never was there an exacter or more methodical accomptant he gives me greatly to my satisfaction because i know it will delight you an account of the kentish concern and of the pleasure your father and mother take in it now my charmer said he i see your eyes begin to glisten oh how this subject raises your whole soul to the windows of it never was so dutiful a daughter mr longman and never did parents better deserve a daughter's duty i endeavoured before mr longman to rein in my gratitude that my throbbing heart confessed through my handkerchief as i perceived but the good old gentleman could not hinder his from showing itself at his worthy eyes to see how much i was favoured oppressed i should say with the tenderest goodness to me and kind expressions excuse me said he wiping his cheeks my delight to see such merit so justly rewarded will not be contained i think and so he arose and walked to the window well good mr longman said i as he returned towards us you give me the pleasure to know that my father and mother are well and happy then they must be in a goodness and bounty that i and many more rejoice in well and happy madam ay that they are indeed a worthier couple never lived most nobly do they go on in the farm your honour is one of the happiest gentlemen in the world all the good you do returns upon you in thrice it may well be said that you cast your bread upon the waters for it presently comes to you again richer and heavier than when you threw it in 
all the kentish tenants madam are hugely delighted with their good steward everything prospers under his management the gentry love both him and my dame and the poor people adore them thus ran mr longman on to my inexpressible delight you may believe and when he withdrew tis an honest soul said my dear mr b i love him for his respectful love to my angel and his value for the worthy pair very glad i am that everything answers their wishes may they long live and be happy the dear man makes me spring to his arms whenever he touches this string for he speaks always thus kindly of you and is glad to hear he says that you don't live only to yourselves and now and then adds that he is as much satisfied with your prudence as he is with mine that parents and daughters do credit to one another and that the praises he hears of you from every mouth make him take a great pleasure in you as if you were his own relations how delighting how transporting rather my dear parents must this goodness be to your happy daughter and how could i forbear repeating these kind things to you that you may see how well everything is taken that you do when the expected visit from lord and lady davis is over the approaching winter will call us to london and as i shall then be nearer to you we may oftener hear from one another which will be a great heightening to my pleasures but i hear such an account of the immoralities which persons may observe there along with the public diversions that it takes off a little from the satisfaction i should otherwise have in the thought of going thither for they say quarrels and duels and gallantries as they are called so often happen in london that those enormities are heard of without the least wonder or surprise this makes me very thoughtful at times but god i hope will preserve our dearest benefactor and continue to me his affection and then i shall be always happy especially while your health and felicity confirm and crown the delights of your ever dutiful daughter p b end of letter 25。letter 26 of pamela volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Pamela, Volume 2, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 26. My dearest child, it may not be improper to mention ourselves what the nature of the kindness is which we confer on our poor neighbours and the labouring people, lest it should be surmised by anybody that we are lavishing away wealth that is not our own not that we fear either your honoured husband or you will suspect so or that the worthy mr longman would insinuate as much for he saw what we did and was highly pleased with it and said he would make such a report of it as you write he did what we do is in small things though the good we hope from them is not small perhaps and if a very distressful case should happen among our poor neighbours requiring anything considerable and the objects be deserving we would acquaint you with it and leave it to you to do as god should direct you my dear child you are very happy and if it can be may you be happier still yet i verily think you cannot be more happy than your father and mother except in this one thing that all our happiness under god proceeds from you and as other parents bless their children with plenty and benefits you have blessed your parents or your honoured husband rather for your sake with all the good things this world can afford your papers are the joy of our leisure hours and you are kind beyond all expression in taking care to oblige us with them we know how your time is taken up and ought to be very well contented if but now and then you let us hear of your health and welfare but it is not enough with such a good daughter that you have made our lives comfortable but you will make them joyful too by communicating to us all that befalls you and then you write so piously and with such a sense of god's goodness to you and intermix such good reflections in your writings that whether it be our partial love or not i cannot tell but truly we think nobody comes up to you and you make our hearts and eyes so often overflow 
as we read that we join hand in hand and say to each other in the same breath blessed be god and blessed be you my love for such a daughter says the one for such a daughter says the other and she has your own sweet temper cry i and she has your own honest heart cries she and so we go on blessing god and you and blessing your spouse and ourselves is any happiness like ours my dear daughter we are really so enraptured with your writings that when our spirits flag through the infirmity of years which hath begun to take hold of us we have recourse to some of your papers come my dear cry i what say you to a banquet now she knows what i mean with all my heart says she so i read although it be on a sunday so good are your letters and you must know i have copies of many and after a little while we are as much alive and brisk as if we had no nagging at all and return to the duties of the day with double delight consider then my dear child what joy your writings give us and yet we are afraid of oppressing you who have so much to do of other kinds and we are heartily glad you have found out a way to save trouble to yourself and rejoice us and oblige so worthy a young lady as miss stanford all at one time i never shall forget her dear goodness and notice of me at the hall kindly pressing my rough hands with her fine hands and looking in my face with so much kindness in her eyes what good people as well as bad there are in high stations thank god there are else our poor child would have had a sad time of it too often when she was obliged to step out of herself as once i heard you phrase it into company you could not live with well but what shall i say more and yet how shall i end only with my prayers that god will continue to you the blessing and comforts you are in possession of and pray now be not over thoughtful about london for why should you let the dread of future evils lessen your present joys there is no absolute perfection in this life that's true but one would make oneself as easy as one could tis time enough to be troubled when troubles come sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof rejoice then as you have often said you would in your present blessings and leave the event of things to the supreme disposer of all events and what have you to do but to rejoice you who cannot see a sun rise but it is to bless you and to raise up from their beds numbers to join in the blessing you who can bless your high-born friends and your low-born parents and obscure relations the rich by your example and the poor by your bounty and bless besides so good and so brave a husband oh my dear child what let me repeat it have you to do but rejoice for many daughters have done wisely but you have excelled them all i will only add that everything the squire ordered is just upon the point of being finished and when the good time comes that we shall be again favoured with his presence and yours what a still greater joy will this afford to the already overflowing hearts of your ever-loving father and mother john and elizabeth andrews end of letter twenty six letter twenty seven of pamela volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson pamela volume two by samuel richardson letter twenty seven my dearest miss darnford the interest i take in everything that concerns you makes me very importunate to know how you approve the gentleman whom some of your best friends and well-wishers have recommended to your favour i hope he will deserve your good opinion and then he must excel most of the unmarried gentlemen in england your papa in his humorous manner mentions his large possessions and riches but were he as rich as croesus he should not have my consent if he has no greater merit though that is what the generality of parents look out for first and indeed an easy fortune is so far from being to be disregarded that 
when attended with equal merit i think it ought to have a preference given to it supposing affections disengaged for it is certain that a man or woman may stand as good a chance for happiness in marriage with a person of fortune as with one who has not that advantage and notwithstanding i had neither riches nor descent to boast of i must be of opinion with those who say that they never knew anybody despise either that had them but to permit riches to be the principal inducement to the neglect of superior merit that is the fault which many a one smarts for whether the choice be their own or imposed upon them by those who have a title to their obedience here is a saucy body might some who have not miss darnford's kind consideration for her friend be apt to say who being thus meanly descended nevertheless presumes to give her opinion in these high cases unasked but i have this to say that i think myself so entirely divested of partiality to my own case that as far as my judgment shall permit i will never have that in view when i am presuming to hint my opinion of general rules for most surely the honours i have received and the debasement to which my best friend has subjected himself have for their principal excuse that the gentleman was entirely independent had no questions to ask and had a fortune sufficient to make himself as well as the person he chose happy though she brought him nothing at all and that he had moreover such a character for good sense and knowledge of the world that nobody could impute to him any other inducement but that of a noble resolution to reward a virtue he had so frequently and i will say so wickedly tried but could not subdue my dear miss let me as a subject very pleasing to me touch upon your kind mention of the worthy mr peters's sentiment to that part of his conduct to me which oppressed by the terrors and apprehensions to which i was subjected once i censured and the readier as i had so great an honour for his cloth that i thought to be a clergyman and all that was compassionate good and virtuous was the same thing but when i came to know mr peters i had a high opinion of his worthiness and as no one can be perfect in this life thus i thought to myself how hard was then my lot to be the cause of stumbling to so worthy a heart to be sure a gentleman one who knows and practices so well his duty in every other instance and preaches it so efficaciously to others must have been one day sensible that it would not have misbecome his function and character to have afforded that protection to oppressed innocence which was requested of him and how would it have grieved his considerate mind had my ruin been completed that he did not but as he had once a namesake as one may say that failed in a much greater instance let not my want of charity exceed his fault but let me look upon it as an infirmity to which the most perfect are liable i was a stranger to him a servant girl carried off by her master a young gentleman of violent and lawless passions who in this very instance showed how much in earnest he was set upon effecting all his vile purposes and whose heart although god might touch it was not probable any lesser influence could then he was not sure that though he might assist my escape i might not afterwards fall again into the hands of so determined a violator and that difficulty would not with such a one enhance his resolution to overcome all obstacles moreover he might think that the person who was moving him to this unworthy measure possibly sought to gratify a view of his own and that while endeavouring to save to outward appearance a virtue in danger he was in reality only helping another to a wife at the hazard of exposing himself to the vindictiveness of a violent temper and a rich neighbour who had power as well as will to resent for such was his apprehension entirely groundless as it was though not improbable as it might seem to him for all these considerations i must pity rather than too rigorously censure the worthy gentleman and i will always respect him and thank him a thousand times my dear in my name for his goodness in condescending to acknowledge by your hand 
his infirmity as such for this gives an excellent proof of the natural worthiness of his heart and that it is beneath him to seek to extenuate a fault when he thinks he has committed one indeed my dear friend i have so much honour for the clergy of all degrees that i never forget in my prayers one article that god will make them shining lights to the world since so much depends on their ministry and examples as well with respect to our public as private duties nor shall the faults of a few make impression upon me to the disadvantage of the order for i am afraid a very censorious temper in this respect is too generally the indication of an uncharitable and perhaps a profligate heart levelling characters in order to cover some inward pride or secret enormities which they are ashamed to avow and will not be instructed to amend forgive my dear this tedious scribble i cannot for my life write short letters to those i love and let me hope that you will favour me with an account of your new affair and how you proceed in it and with such of your conversations as may give me some notion of a polite courtship for alas your poor friend knows nothing of this all her courtship was sometimes a hasty snatch of the hand a black and blue gripe of the arm and whither now come to me when i bid you and saucy face and creature and such like on his part with fear and trembling on mine and i will i will good sir have mercy at other times a scream and nobody to hear or mind me and with uplift hands bent knees and tearful eyes for god's sake pity your poor servant this my dear miss darnford was the hard treatment that attended my courtship pray then let me know how gentlemen court their equals in degree how they look when they address you with their knees bent sighing supplicating and all that as sir simon says with the words slave servant admirer continually at their tongue's end but after all it will be found i believe that be the language and behaviour ever so obsequious it is all designed to end alike the english the plain english of the politest address is i am now dear madam your humble servant pray be so good as to let me be your master yes and thank you too says the lady's heart though not her lips if she likes him and so they go to church together and in conclusion it will be happy if these obsequious courtships end no worse than my frightful one but i am convinced that with a man of sense a woman of tolerable prudence must be happy that whenever you marry it may be to such a man who then must value you as you deserve and make you happy as i now am notwithstanding all that's past wishes and praise your obliged friend and servant p b n b although miss darnford could not receive the above letter so soon as to answer it before others were sent to her by her fair correspondent yet we think it not amiss to dispense with the order of time that the reader may have the letter and answer at one view and shall on other occasions take the like liberty end of letter twenty seven Letter twenty eight of Pamela, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pamela, volume two, by Samuel Richardson. Letter twenty eight. In answer to the preceding, My dear Mrs. B., you charm us all with your letters. Mr. Peter says he will never go to bed nor rise but he will pray for you and desires i will return his thankful acknowledgment for your favourable opinion of him and kind allowances if there be an angel on earth he says you are one my papa although he has seen your stinging reflection upon his refusal to protect you is delighted with you too and says when you come down to lincolnshire again he will be undertaken by you in good earnest for he thinks it was wrong in him to deny you his protection we all smiled at the description of your own uncommon courtship and as they say the days of courtship are the happiest part of life if we had not known that your days of marriage are happier by far than any other body's courtship 
we must needs have pitied but as the one were days of trial and temptation the others are days of reward and happiness may the last always continue to be so and you'll have no occasion to think anybody happier than mrs b i thank you heartily for your good wishes as to the man of sense mr murray has been here and continues his visits he is a lively gentleman well enough in his person has a tolerable character yet loves company and will take his bottle freely my papa likes him never the worse for that he talks a good deal dresses gay and even richly and seems to like his own person very well no great pleasure it is for a lady to look forward to yet he falls far short of that genteel ease and graceful behaviour which distinguish your mr b from anybody i know i wish mr murray would apply to my sister she is an ill-natured girl but would make a good wife i hope and fancy she'd like him well enough i can't say i do he laughs too much has something boisterous in his conversation his complacence is not pretty he is however well worse in country sports and my papa loves him for that too and says he is a most accomplished gentleman yes sir cry i as gentlemen go you must be saucy says sir simon because the man offers himself to your acceptance a few years hence perhaps if you remain single you'll alter your note polly and be willing to champ at a much less worthy tender i could not help answering that although i paid due honour to all my papa was pleased to say i could not but hope he would be mistaken in this but i have broke my mind to my dear mamma who tells me she will do me all the pleasure she can but would be loath the youngest daughter should go first as she calls it but if i could come and live with you a little now and then i did not care who married unless such a one offered as i never expect i have great hopes the gentleman will be easily persuaded to quit me for nancy for i see he has not delicacy enough to love with any great distinction he says as my mamma tells me by the by that i am the handsomest and best humoured and he has found out as he thinks that i have some wit and have ease and freedom and he takes innocence to them in my address and conversation tis well for me he is of this opinion for if he thinks justly which i must question anybody may think so still much more for i have been far from taking pains to engage his good word having been under more reserve to him than ever i was before to anybody indeed i can't help it for the gentleman is forward without delicacy and pardon me sir simon my papa has not one bit of it neither but is for pushing matters on with his rough raillery that puts me out of countenance and has already adjusted the sordid part of the preliminaries as he tells me yet i hope nancy's three thousand pound fortune more than i am likely to have will give her the wished-for preference with mr murray and then as to a brother-in-law in prospect i can put off all restraint and return to my usual freedom this is all that occurs worthy of notice from us but from you we expect an account of lady davis's visit and of the conversations that offer among you and you have so delightful a way of making everything momentous either by your subject or reflections or both that we long for every post-day in hopes of the pleasure of a letter and yours i will always carefully preserve as so many testimonies of the honour i receive in this correspondence which will be always esteemed as it deserves by my dear mrs b your obliged and faithful polly darnford mr peters mr jones my papa mamma and sister present the respects mr peters i mentioned before he continues to give a very good account of poor jukes and is much pleased with her End of letter twenty eight letter twenty nine of pamela volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org pamela volume two by samuel richardson letter twenty nine my dear miss darnford at your desire and to oblige your honoured mamma and your good neighbours i will now acquaint you with the arrival of lady davers and will occasionally write what passes among us i will not say worthy of notice 
for were i only to do so i should be more brief perhaps by much than you seem to expect but as my time is pretty much taken up and i find i shall be obliged to write a bit now and a bit then you must excuse me if i dispense with some forms which i ought to observe when i write to one i so dearly love and so i will give it journal-wise as it were and have no regard when it would fetter or break it upon my freedom of narration to inscription or subscription but send it as i have opportunity and if you please to favour me so far as to lend it me after you have read the stuff for the perusal of my father and mother to whom my duty and promise require me to give an account of my proceedings it will save me transcription for which i shall have no time and then you will excuse blots and blurs and i will trouble myself no farther for apologies on that score but this once for all if you think it worth while when they have read it you shall have it again wednesday morning six o'clock for my dear friend permits me to rise an hour sooner than usual that i may have time to scribble for he is always pleased to see me so employed or in reading often saying when i am at my needle as his sister once wrote your maids can do this pamela but they cannot write as you can and yet as he says when i choose to follow my needle as a diversion from too intense study but alas i know not what study is as may be easily guessed by my hasty writing putting down everything as it comes i shall then do as i please but i promised at setting out what a good wife i'd endeavour to make and every honest body should try to be as good as her word you know and such particulars as i then mentioned i think i ought to dispense with as little as possible especially as i promised no more than what was my duty to perform if i had not promised but what a preamble is here judge by it what impertinences you may expect as i proceed yesterday evening arrived here my lord and lady davers their nephew and the countess of c mother of lady betty whom we did not expect but took it for the greater favour it seems her ladyship longed as she said to see me and this was her principal inducement the two ladies and their two women were in lord davers coach and six and my lord and his nephew rode on horseback attended with a train of servants we had expected them to dinner but they could not reach time enough for the countess being a little incommoded with her journey the coach travelled slowly my lady would not suffer her lord nor his nephew to come hither before her though on horseback because she would be present she said when his lordship first saw me he having quite forgot her mother's pamela that was her word it rained when they came in so the coach drove directly to the door and mr b received them there but i was in a little sort of flutter which mr b observing made me sit down in the parlour to compose myself where's pamela said my lady as soon as she alighted i stepped out lest she should take it amiss and she took my hand and kissed me here my lady countess said she presenting me to her here's the girl see if i said too much in praise of her person the countess saluted me with a visible pleasure in her eye and said indeed lady davers you have not twould have been strange excuse me mrs b for i know your story if such a fine flower had not been transplanted from the field to the garden i made no return but by a low curtsey to her ladyship's compliment then lady davers taking my hand again presented me to her lord see here my lord my mother's pamela and see here my lord said her generous brother taking my other hand most kindly see here your brother's pamela too my lord saluted me i do said he to his lady and to his brother and i see the first person in her that has exceeded my expectation when every mouth had prepared me to expect a wonder mr h whom every one calls lord jacky after his aunt's example when she is in good humour with him and who is a very young gentleman though about as old as my best friend came to me next and said lovelier and lovelier by my life i never saw your peer madam will you excuse me my dear all this seeming vanity for the sake of repeating exactly what passed well but said my lady taking my hand 
in her free quality way which quite dashed me and holding it at a distance and turning me half round her eye fixed to my waist let me observe you a little my sweet-faced girl i hope i am right i hope you will do credit to my brother as he has done you credit why do you let her lace so tight mr b i was unable to look up as you may believe miss my face all over scarlet was hid in my bosom and i looked so silly ay said my naughty lady you may well look down my good girl for works of this nature will not be long hidden and oh my lady to the countess see how like a pretty thief she looks dear my lady said i for she still kept looking at me and her good brother seeing my confusion in pity to me pressed my blushing face a moment to his generous breast and said lady davers you should not be thus hard upon my dear girl the moment you see her and before so many witnesses but look up my best love take your revenge of my sister and tell her you wish her in the same way it is so then said my lady i am glad of it with all my heart i will now love you better and better but i almost doubted it seeing her still so slender but if my good child you lace too tight i'll never forgive you and so she gave me a kiss of congratulation as she said do you think i did not look very silly my lord smiling and gazing at me from head to foot lord jacky grinning and laughing like an oaf as i then in my spite thought indeed the countess said encouragingly to me but severely in persons of birth lady davers you are as much too teasing as mrs b is too bashful but you are a happy man mr b that your lady's bashfulness is the principal mark by which we can judge she is not of quality lord jacky in the language of some character in a play cried out a palpable hit by jupiter and laughed egregiously running about from one to another repeating the same words we talked only upon common topics till supper-time and i was all ear as i thought it became me to be for the countess had by her first compliment and by an aspect as noble as intelligent overawed me as i may say into a respectful silence to which lady davers free though pleasant raillery which she could not help carrying on now and then contributed besides lady davers's letters had given me still greater reason to revere her wit and judgment than i had before when i reflected on her passionate temper and such parts of the conversation i had had with her ladyship in your neighbourhood which however to be admired fell short of her letters when we were to sit down at table i looked i suppose a little diffidently for i really then thought of my lady's anger at the hall when she would not have permitted me to sit at a table with her and mr b saying take your place my dear you keep our friends standing i sat down in my usual seat and my lady said none of your reproaching eye pamela i know what you hint at by it and every letter i have received from you has made me censure myself for my lady airs as you call them you sauce-box you i told you i'd lady airs you when i saw you and you shall have it all in good time i am sure said i i shall have nothing from your ladyship but what will be very agreeable but indeed i never meant anything particular by that or any other word that i wrote nor could i think of anything that was highly respectful to your ladyship lord davers was pleased to say that it was impossible i should either write or speak anything that could be taken amiss lady davers after supper and the servants were withdrawn began a discourse on titles and said brother i think you should hold yourself obliged to my lord davers for he has spoken to lord s who made him a visit a few days ago to procure you a baronet's patent your estate and the figure you make in the world are so considerable and your family besides is so ancient that methinks you should wish for some distinction of that sort yes brother said my lord i did mention it to lord s and told him with all that it was without your knowledge or desire that i spoke about it and i was not very sure you would accept of it but tis a thing your sister has wished for a good while 
what answer did my lord s make to it said mr b he said we meaning the ministers i suppose should be glad to oblige a man of mr b's figure in the world but you mention it so slightly that you can hardly expect courtiers will tender it to any gentleman that is so indifferent about it for lord davers we seldom grant honours without a view i tell you that added he smiling my lord s might mention this as a jest returned mr b but he spoke the truth but your lordship said well that i was indifferent about it tis true tis an hereditary title but the rich citizens who used to be satisfied with the title of knight till they made it so common that it is brought into as great contempt almost as that of the french knights of st michael and nobody cares to accept of it now are ambitious of this and as i apprehend it is hastening apace into like disrepute besides tis a novel honour and what the ancestors of our family who lived at its institution would never accept of but were it a peerage which has some essential privileges and splendours annexed to it to make it desirable to some men i would not enter into conditions for it titles at best added he are but shadows and he that has the substance should be above valuing them for who that has the whole bird would pride himself upon a single feather but said my lady although i acknowledge that the institution is of late date yet as abroad as well as at home it is regarded as a title of dignity and the best families among the gentry are supposed to be distinguished by it i should wish you to accept of it and as to citizens who have it they are not many and some of this class of people or their immediate descendants have brought themselves into the peerage itself of the one kingdom or the other as to what it looked upon abroad said mr b this is of no weight at all for when an englishman travels be he of what degree he will if he has an equipage and squanders his money away he is a lord of course with foreigners and therefore sir such a one is rather a diminution to him as it gives him a lower title than his vanity would perhaps make him aspire to be thought in the possession of then as to citizens in a trading nation like this i am not displeased in the main with seeing the overgrown ones creeping into nominal honours and we have so many of our first titled families who have allied themselves to trade whose inducements were money only that it ceases to be either a wonder as to the fact or a disgrace as to the honour well brother said my lady i will tell you father the thing may be had for asking for if you will but go to court and desire to kiss the king's hand that will be all the trouble you'll have and pray now oblige me in it if a title would make me either a better or a wiser man replied mr b i would embrace it with pleasure besides i am not so satisfied with some of the measures now pursuing as to owe any obligation to the ministers accepting of a small title from them is but like putting on their badge or listing under their banners like a certain lord we all know who accepted of one degree more of title to show he was theirs and would not have a higher lest it should be thought a satisfaction tantamount to half the pension he demanded and could i be easy to have it supposed that i was an ungrateful man for voting as i pleased because they gave me the title of a baronet the countess said the world always thought mr b to be a man of steady principles and not attached to any party but in her opinion it was far from being inconsistent with any gentleman's honour and independency to accept of a title from a prince he acknowledged as his sovereign it is very true madam that i am attached to no party nor ever will i will be a country gentleman in the true sense of the word and will accept of no favour that shall make any one think i would not be of the opposition when i think it a necessary one as on the other hand i should scorn to make myself around to any man's ladder of preferment or a cabala for the sake of my own you say well brother returned lady davers but you may undoubtedly keep your own principles and independency and yet pay your duty to the king 
and accept of this title for your family and fortune will be a greater ornament to the title than the title to you then what occasion have i for it if that be the case madam why i can't say but i should be glad you had it for your family's sake as it is an hereditary honour then it would mend the style of your spouse here for the good girl is at such a loss for an epithet when she writes that i see the constraint she lies under it is my dear gentleman my best friend my benefactor my dear mr b whereas sir william would turn off her periods more roundly and no other softer epithets would be wanting to me replied he who always desire to be distinguished as my pamela's best friend and think it an honour to be called her dear mr b and her dear man this reason weighs very little unless there were no other sir william in the kingdom than her sir william for i am very emulous of her favour i can tell you and think it no small distinction i blushed at this too great honour before such company and was afraid my lady would be a little piqued at it but after a pause she said well then brother will you let pamela decide upon this point rightly put said the countess pray let mrs b choose for you sir my lady has hit the thing very good by my soul says lord jacky let my young aunt that was his word choose for you sir well then pamela said mr b give us your opinion as to this point but first said lady davers say you will be determined by it or else she will be laid under a difficulty well then replied he be it so i will be determined by your opinion my dear give it me freely lord jacky rubbed his hands together charming charming as i hope to live by jove this is just as i wished well now pamela said my lady speak your true heart without disguise i charge you do why then gentlemen and ladies said i if i must be so bold as to speak on a subject upon which on several accounts it would become me to be silent i should be against the title but perhaps my reason is of too private a nature to weigh anything and if so it would not become me to have any choice at all they all called upon me for my reason and i said looking down a little abashed it is this here my dear mr b has disparaged himself by distinguishing as he has done such a low creature as i and the world will be apt to say he is seeking to repair one way the honour he has lost another and then perhaps it will be attributed to my pride and ambition here they will perhaps say the proud cottager will needs be a lady in hopes to conceal her descent whereas had i such a vain thought it would be but making it the more remembered against both mr b and myself and indeed as to my own part i take too much pride in having been lifted up into this distinction for the causes to which i owe it your brother's bounty and generosity than to be ashamed of what i was only now and then i am concerned for his own sake lest he should be too much censured but this would not be prevented but rather be promoted by the title so i am humbly of opinion against the title mr b had hardly patience to hear me out but came to me and folding his arms about me said just as i wished have you answered my beloved pamela i was never yet deceived in you no not once madam said he to the countess lord davers lady davers do we want any titles think you to make us happy but what we can confer upon ourselves and he pressed my hand to his lips as he always honours me most in company and went to his place highly pleased while his fine manner drew tears from my eyes and made his noble sisters and the countesses glisten too well for my part said lady davers thou art a strange girl where as my brother once said gottest thou all this then pleasantly humorous as if she was angry she changed her tone what signify thy meek words and humble speeches when by thy actions as well as sentiments thou reflectest upon us all pamela said she have less merit or take care to conceal it better i shall otherwise have no more patience with thee 
than thy monarch has just now shown the countess was pleased to say you're a happy couple indeed such sort of entertainment as this you are to expect from your correspondent i cannot do better than i can and it may appear such a mixture of self-praise vanity and impertinence that i expect you will tell me freely as soon as this comes to your hand whether it is tolerable to you yet i must write on for my dear father and mother's sake who require it of me and are prepared to approve of everything that comes from me for no other reason but that and i think you ought to leave me to write to them only as i cannot hope it will be entertaining to anybody else without expecting as much partiality and favour from others as i have from my dear parents meantime i conclude here my first conversation piece and am and will be always yours etc p b end of letter twenty nine Letter thirty, part one of Pamela, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Pamela, volume two, by Samuel Richardson. Letter thirty, part one. Thursday morning, six o'clock. Our breakfast conversation yesterday at which only mrs warden my lady's woman and my polly attended was so whimsically particular though i doubt some of it at least will appear too trifling that i must acquaint my dear miss darnford with it who is desirous of knowing all that relates to lady davers conduct towards me you must know then i have the honour to stand very high in the graces of lord davers who on every occasion is pleased to call me his good sister his dear sister and sometimes his charming sister and he says he will not be out of my company for an hour together while he stays here if he can help it my lady seems to relish this very well in the main though she cannot quite so readily yet frame her mouth to the sound of the word sister as my lord does of which this that follows is one instance his lordship had called me by that tender name twice before and saying i will drink another dish i think my good sister my lady said your lordship has got a word by the end that you seem mighty fond of i have taken notice that you have called pamela sister 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 no less than three times in a quarter of an hour my lord looked a little serious i shall one day said he be allowed to choose my own words and phrases i hope your sister mr b added he often questions whether i am at age or not though the house of peers made no scruple of admitting me among them some years ago mr b said severely but with a smiling air tis well she has such a gentleman as your lordship for a husband whose affectionate indulgence to her makes you overlook all her saucy sallies i am sure when you took her out of our family into your own we all thought ourselves i in particular bound to pray for you i thought this a great trial of my lady's patience but it was from mr b and she said with a half pleasant half serious air how now confidence none but my brother could have said this whose violent spirit was always much more intolerable than mine but i can tell you mr b i was always thought very good-humoured and obliging to everybody till your impudence came from college and from your travels and then i own your provoking ways made me now and then a little out of the way well well sister we'll have no more of this subject only let us see that my lord davers wants not his proper authority with you although you used to keep me in awe formerly keep you in awe that nobody could ever do yet boy or man but my lord i beg your pardon for this brother will make mischief betwixt us if he can i only took notice of the word sister so often used which looked more like affectation than affection perhaps lady davers said my lord gravely i have two reasons for using the word so frequently i'd be glad to hear them said the dear taunting lady for i don't doubt they're mighty good ones what are they my lord one is because i love and am fond of my new relation the other that you are so sparing of the word that i call her so for us both your lordship says well replied mr b smiling and lady davers can give two reasons why she does not well said my lady 
now we are in for it let us hear your two reasons likewise i doubt not they're wise ones too if they are yours lady davers they must be so one is that every condescension to speak in a proud lady's dialect comes with as much difficulty from her as a favour from the house of austria to the petty princes of germany the second because those of your sex excuse me madam to the countess who have once made scruples think it inconsistent with themselves to be over hasty to alter their own conduct choosing rather to persist in an error than own it to be one this proceeded from his impatience to see me in the least slighted by my lady and i said to lord davers to soften matters never my lord were brother and sister so loving in earnest and yet so satirical upon each other in jest as my good lady and mr b but your lordship knows their way my lady frowned at her brother but turned it off with an air i love the mistress of this house said she very well and am quite reconciled to her but methinks there is such a hissing sound in the word sister that i cannot abide it tis a true english word but a word i have not been used to having never had a sister before as you know speaking the first syllable of the word with an emphatical hiss mr b said observe you not lady davers that you used a word to avoid that which had twice the hissing in it that sister has and that was mistress with two other hissing sounds to accompany it of this house but to what childish follies does not pride make one stoop excuse madam to the countess such poor low conversation as we are dwindled into oh sir said her ladyship the conversation is very agreeable and i think lady davers you're fairly caught well said my lady then help me good sister there's for you to a little sugar will that please you sir i am always pleased replied her brother smiling when lady davers acts up to her own character and the good sense she is mistress of ay ay my good brother like other wise men takes it for granted that it is a mark of good sense to approve of whatever he does and so for this one time i am a very sensible body with him and i'll leave off while i have his good word only one thing i must say to you my dear turning to me that though i call you pamela as i please be assured i love you as well as if i called you sister as lord davis does at every word your ladyship gives me great pleasure said i in this kind assurance and i don't doubt that i shall have the honour of being called by that tender name if i can be so happy as to deserve it and i'll lose no opportunity that shall be afforded me to show how sincerely i will endeavour to do so she was pleased to rise from her seat give me a kiss my dear girl you deserve everything and permit me to say pamela sometimes as the word occurs for i am not used to speak in print and i will call you sister when i think of it and love you as well as ever sister loved another these proud and passionate folks said mr b how good they can be when they reflect a little on what becomes their characters so then rejoined my lady i am to have no merit of my own i see do what i will this is not quite so generous in my brother as one might expect why you saucy sister excuse me lord davers what merit would you assume can people merit by doing their duty and is it so great a praise that you think fit to own for a sister so deserving a girl as this whom i take pride in calling my wife thou art what thou always wert returned my lady and were i in this my imputed pride to want an excuse i know not the creature living that ought so soon to make one for me as you i do excuse you said he for that very reason if you please but it little becomes either your pride or mine to do anything that wants excuse mighty moral mighty grave truly pamela friend sister there's for you thou art a happy girl to have made such a reformation in thy honest man's way of thinking as well as acting but now we are upon this topic and only friends about us i am resolved to be even with thee brother jacky if you are not for another dish i wish you'd withdraw polly barlow we don't want you beck you may stay mr h obeyed and polly went out 
for you must know miss that my lady davers will have none of the men fellows as she calls them to attend upon us at tea and i cannot say but i think her entirely in the right for several reasons that might be given when they were withdrawn my lady repeated now we are upon this topic of reclaiming and reformation tell me thou bold wretch for you know i have seen all your rogueries in pamela's papers tell me if ever rake but thyself made such an attempt as thou didst on this dear good girl in presence of a virtuous woman as mrs jervis was always noted to be as to the other vile creature dukes tis less wonder although in that thou hadst the impudence of him who set thee to work but to make thy attempt before mrs jervis and in spite of her struggles and reproaches was the very stretch of shameless wickedness mr b seemed a little disconcerted and said surely lady davers this is going too far look at pamela's blushing face and downcast eye and wonder at yourself for this question as much as you do at me for the action you speak of the countess said to me my dear mrs b i wonder not at this sweet confusion on so affecting a question but indeed since it is come in so naturally i must say mr b that we have all and my daughters too wondered at this more than at any part of your attempts because sir we thought you one of the most civilized men in england and that you could not but wish to have saved appearances at least though this is to you my pamela the renewal of griefs yet hold up your dear face you may the triumph was yours the shame and the blushes ought to be mine and i will humour my saucy sister in all she would have me say nay said lady davers you know the question i cannot put it stronger that's very true replied he but would you expect i should give you a reason for an attempt that appears to you so very shocking nay sir said the countess don't say appears to lady davers for excuse me it will appear so to every one who hears of it i think my brother is too hardly used said lord davis he has made all the amends he could make and you my sister who were the person offended forgive him now i hope don't you i could not answer for i was quite confounded and made a motion to withdraw but mr b said don't go my dear though i ought to be ashamed of an action set before me in so full a glare in presence of lord davis and the countess yet i will not have you stir because i forget how you represented it and you must tell me indeed sir i cannot said i pray my dear ladies pray my good lord and dear sir don't thus renew my griefs as you were pleased justly to phrase it i have the representation of that scene in my pocket said my lady for i was resolved as i told lady betty to shame the wicked wretch with it the first opportunity and i'll read it to you or rather you shall read it yourself bold face if you can so she pulled those leaves out of her pocket wrapped up carefully in a paper here i believe he who could act thus must read it and to spare pamela's confusion read it to yourself for we all know how it was i think said he taking the papers i can say something to abate the heinousness of this heavy charge or else i should not stand thus at the insolent bar of my sister answering her interrogatories i send you my dear miss darnford a transcript of the charge to be sure you'll say he was a very wicked man mr b read it to himself and said this is a dark affair as here stated and i can't say but pamela and mrs jervis too had great reason to apprehend the worst but surely readers of it who were less parties in the supposed attempt and not determined at all events to condemn me might have made a more favourable construction for me than you lady davis have done in the strong light in which you have set this heinous matter before us however since my lady bowing to the countess and lord davis seem to expect me particularly to answer this black charge i will at a proper time if agreeable give you a brief history of my passion for this dear girl how it commenced and increased and my own struggles with it and this will introduce with some little advantage to myself perhaps what i have to say as to this supposed attempt and at the same time enable you the better to account for some facts which you have read in my pretty accuser's papers this pleased every one and they begged him to begin then 
but he said it was time we should think of dressing the morning being far advanced and if no company came in he would in the afternoon give them the particulars they desired to hear the three gentlemen rode out and returned to dress before dinner my lady and the countess also took an airing in the chariot just as they returned compliments came from several of the neighbouring ladies to our noble guests on their arrival in these parts and to as many as sent lady davers desired their companies for to-morrow afternoon to tea but mr b having fallen in with some of the gentlemen likewise he told me we should have most of our visiting neighbours at dinner and desired mrs jervis might prepare accordingly for them after dinner mr h took a ride out attended by mr colbrand of whom he is very fond ever since he frightened lady davers footmen at the hall threatening to chine them if they offered to stop his lady for he says he loves a man of courage very probably knowing his own defects that way for my lady often calls him a chicken-hearted fellow and then lord and lady davers and the countess revived the subject of the morning and mr b was pleased to begin in the manner i shall mention by and by for here i am obliged to break off end of letter thirty part one letter thirty part two of pamela volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michelle eaton pamela volume two by samuel richardson letter thirty part two now my dear miss darnford i will proceed i began said mr b very early to take notice of this lovely girl even when she was hardly thirteen years old for her charms increased every day not only in my eye but in the eyes of all who beheld her my mother as you lady davers know took the greatest delight in her always calling her her pamela her good child and her waiting-maid and her cabinet of rarities were her boasts and equally shown to every visitor for besides the beauty of her figure and the genteel air of her person the dear girl had a surprising memory a solidity of judgment above her years and a docility so unequalled that she took all parts of learning which her lady as fond of instructing her as she of improving by instruction crowded upon her insomuch that she had masters to teach her to dance sing and play on the spinet whom she every day surprised by the readiness wherewith she took everything i remember once my mother praising her girl before me and my aunt b who is since dead i could not but notice her fondness for her and said what do you design madam to do with or for this pamela of yours the accomplishments you give her will do her more hurt than good for they will set her so much above her degree that what you intend as a kindness may prove her ruin my aunt joined with me and spoke in a still strong manner against giving her such an education and added as i well remember surely sister you do wrong one would think if one knew not my nephew's discreet pride that you design her for something more than your own waiting maid ah sister said the old lady there is no fear of what you hint at his family pride and stately temper will secure my son he has too much of his father in him and as for pamela you know not the girl she has always in her thoughts and in her mouth too her parents mean condition and i shall do nothing for them at least at present though they are honest folks and deserve well because i will keep the girl humble but what can i do with the little baggage continued my mother she conquers everything so fast and has such a thirst after knowledge and the more she knows i verily think the humbler she is that i cannot help letting go as my son when a little boy used to do his kite as fast as she pulls and to what height she'll soar i can't tell i intended proceeded the good lady at first only to make her mistress of some fine needlework to qualify her as she has a delicacy in her person that makes it a pity ever to put her to hard work for a genteel place but she masters that so fast that now as my daughter is married and gone from me i am desirous to qualify her to divert and entertain me in my thoughtful hours 
and were you sister to know what she is capable of and how diverting her innocent prattle is to me and her natural simplicity which i encourage her to preserve amidst all she learns you would not nor my son neither wonder at the pleasure i take in her shall i call her in i don't want said i to have the girl called in if you madam are diverted with her that's enough to be sure pamela is a better companion for a lady than a monkey or a harlequin but i fear you'll set her above herself and make her vain and pert and that at last in order to support her pride she may fall into temptations which may be fatal to herself and others too i'm glad to hear this from my son replied the good lady but the moment i see my favour puffs her up i shall take other measures well thought i to myself i only want to conceal my views from your penetrating eye my good mother and i shall one day take as much delight in your girl and her accomplishments as you now do so go on and improve her as fast as you will i'll only now and then talk against her to blind you and doubt not that all you do will qualify her the better for my purpose only thought i fly swiftly on two or three more tardy years and i'll knit this bud by the time it begins to open and place it in my bosom for a year or two at least for so long if the girl behaves worthy of her education i doubt not she'll be new to me excuse me ladies excuse me lord davers if i am not ingenuous i had better be silent i will not interrupt this affecting narration by mentioning my own alternate blushes confusions and exclamations as the naughty man went on nor the censures and many out upon you's of the attentive ladies and fie brothers of lord davers nor yet with apologies for the praises on myself so frequently intermingled contenting myself to give you as near as i can recollect the very sentences of the dear relator and as to our occasional exclaimings and observations you may suppose what they were so continued mr b i went on dropping hints against her now and then and whenever i met her in the passages about the house or in the garden avoiding to look at or to speak to her as she passed me curtsying and putting on a thousand bewitching airs of obligingness and reverence while i who thought the best way to demolish the influence of such an education would be not to alarm her fears on one hand or to familiarise myself to her on the other till i came to strike the blow looked haughty and reserved and passed by her with a stiff nod at most or if i spoke how does your lady this morning girl i hope she rested well last night then covered with blushes and curtsying at every word as if she thought herself unworthy of answering my questions she'd trip away in a kind of confusion as soon as she had spoken and once i heard her say to mrs jervis dear sirs my young master spoke to me and called me by my name saying how slept your lady last night pamela was not that very good mrs jervis ay thought i i am in the right way i find this will do in proper time go on my dear mother improving as fast as you will i'll engage to pull down in three hours what you'll be building up in as many years in spite of all the lessons you can teach her tis enough for me that i am establishing in you ladies and in you my lord a higher esteem for my pamela i am but too sensible i shall lose a good deal of my own reputation in the relation i am now giving you i dressed grew more confident and as insolent with all as if though i had not lady davers wit and virtue i had all her spirit excuse me lady davers and having a pretty bold heart which rather put me upon courting than avoiding a danger or difficulty i had but too much my way with everybody and many a menaced complaint have i looked down with a haughty air and a promptitude like that of colbrand's to your footmen at the hall to clap my hand to my side which was of the greater service to my bold enterprise as two or three gentlemen had found i knew how to be in earnest ha said my lady thou wast ever an impudent fellow and many a vile roguery have i kept from my poor mother yet to my knowledge she thought you no saint ay poor lady continued he she used now and then to catechise me and was sure i was not so good as i ought to be for son she would cry these late hours these all-night works and to come home so sober cannot be right i'm not sure if i were to know all 
and yet I am afraid of inquiring after your ways, whether I should not have reason to wish you were brought home in wine, rather than to come in so sober and so late as you do. Once, I remember, in the summer-time, I came home about six in the morning, and met the good lady unexpectedly by the garden back door, of which I had a key, to let myself in at all hours. I started and would have avoided her, but she called me to her, and then I approached her with an air. "'What brings you, madam, into the garden at so early an hour?' "'Turning my face from her, for I had a few scratches on my forehead, "'with a thorn or so which I feared she would be more inquisitive about "'than I cared she should be. "'And what makes you?' said she. "'So early here, Billy. "'What a rakish figure dost thou make. "'One time or other these courses will yield you but little comfort on reflection. "'Would to God thou wast but happily married. "'So, madam, the old wish, I am not so bad as you think me.' I hope I have not merited so great a punishment. These hints I give, not as matter of glory, but shame, that I ought to tell you all the truth, or nothing. Meantime, thought I, for I used to have some compunction for my vile practices, when cool reflection, brought on by satiety, had taken hold of me. I wish this sweet girl was grown to years of susceptibility, that I might reform this wicked course of life, and not prowl about, disturbing honest folk's peace and endangering myself. And as I had, by a certain very daring and wicked attempt, in which, however, I did not succeed, set a hornet's nest about my ears, which I began to apprehend would sting me to death, having once escaped an ambush by dint of mere good luck, I thought it better to remove the seat of my warfare into another kingdom, and to be a little more discreet for the future in my amours. So I went to France a second time, and passed a year there in the best of company, and with some improvement both to my morals and understanding, and had a very few sallies, considering my love of intrigue, and the ample means I had to prosecute successfully all the desires of my heart. When I returned, several matches were proposed to me, and my good mother often requested me to make her so happy, as she called it, as to see me married before she died. But I could not endure the thoughts of the state, for I never saw a lady whose temper and education I liked, or with whom I thought I could live tolerably. She used in vain, therefore, to plead family reasons to me. Like most young fellows, I was too much a self-lover to pay so great a regard to posterity, and, to say truth, had little solicitude at that time, whether my name were continued or not in my own descendants. However, I looked upon my mother's Pamela with no small pleasure, and I found her so much improved, as well in person as behaviour, that I had the less inducement either to renew my intriguing life, or to think of a married state. Yet, as my mother had all her eyes about her, as the phrase is, I affected great shyness, both before her and to the girl, for I doubted not my very looks would be watched by them both and what the one discovered would not be a secret to the other, and laying myself open too early to a suspicion, I thought would but ice the girl over, and make her lady more watchful. So I used to go into my mother's apartment, and come out of it, without taking the least notice of her, but put on stiff airs, and as she always withdrew when I came in, I never made any pretence to keep her there. Once indeed my mother, on my looking after her, when her back was turned, said, "'My dear son, I don't like your eye following my girl so intently. "'Only I know that sparkling lustre natural to it, "'or I should have some fear for my Pamela as she grows older. "'I look after her, madam. "'My eyes sparkle at such a girl as that. "'No, indeed. "'She may be your favourite as a waiting-maid, "'but I see nothing but clumsy curtsies and awkward airs about her, "'a little rustic affectation of innocence.' that to such as cannot see into her may pass well enough. Nay, my dear, replied my mother, don't say that of all things. She has no affectation, I am sure. Yes, she has in my eye, madam, and I'll tell you how it is. You have taught her to assume the airs of a gentlewoman, to dance and to enter a room with a grace, and yet bid her keep her low birth and family in view, and between the one character which she wants to get into, and the other she dares not get out of, she trips up and down, mincingly, and knows not how to set her feet, so tis the same in every gesture. Her arms she knows not whether to swim with, or to hold before her, 
nor whether to hold her head up or down, and so does neither, but hangs it on one side, a little awkward piece of one and t'other, I think her, and indeed you do the girl more kindness to put her into your dairy than to keep her about your person, for she'll be utterly spoiled, I doubt, for any useful purpose. Ah, son, said she, I fear by your description you have minded her too much in one sense, though not enough in another. Tis not my intention to recommend her to your notice. Of all men, and I doubt not, if it please God, I live, and she continues a good girl, but she will make a man of some middling genteel business very happy. Pamela came in just then, with an air so natural, so humble, and yet so much above herself, that I was forced to turn my head from her, lest my mother should watch my eye again and I be inclined to do her that justice, which my heart assented to, but which my lips had just before denied her. All my difficulty in apprehension was my good mother, the effect of whose lessons to her girl I was not so much afraid of as her vigilance for, thought I, I see by the delicacy of her person, the brilliancy of her eye, and the sweet apprehensiveness that plays about every feature of her face. She must have tinder enough in her constitution to catch a well-struck spark, and I'll warrant I shall know how to set her in a blaze in a few months more. Yet I wanted, as I passed, to catch her attention too. I expected her to turn after me, and look so as to show a liking towards me, for I had a great opinion of my person and air, which had been fortunately distinguished by the ladies, whom of course my vanity made me allow, to be very good judges of those outward advantages. But to my great disappointment, Pamela never, by any favourable glance, gave the least encouragement to my vanity. Well, thought I, this girl has certainly nothing ever real in her mould, all unanimated clay, but the dancing and singing airs my mother is teaching her will better qualify her in time, and another year will ripen her into my arms, no doubt of it. Let me only go on thus, and make her fear me, that will enhance in her mind every favour I shall afterwards vouchsafe to show her, and never question old humdrum virtue, thought I. But the tempter without, and the tempter within, will be too many for the perversest nicety that ever the sex boasted. Yet though I could not once attract her eye towards me, she never failed to draw mine after her, whenever she went by me, or whenever I saw her except, as I said, in my mother's presence, and particularly when she had passed me, and could not see me look at her, without turning her head, as I expected so often from her, in vain. You will wonder, Lord Davers, who, I suppose, was once in love, or you'd never have married such an hostile spirit as my sister's there. Go on, sauce-box, said she. I won't interrupt you. You will wonder how I could behave so coolly as to escape all discovery, so long from a lady so watchful as my mother, and from the apprehensiveness of the girl. But to say nothing of her tender years, and that my love was not of this bashful sort, I was not absolutely determined, so great was my pride, that I ought to think her worthy of being my mistress, when I had not much reason, as I thought, to despair of prevailing upon persons of higher birth, were I disposed to try, to live with me upon my own terms. My pride, therefore, kept my passion at bay. As I may say, so far was I from imagining, I should ever be brought to what has since happened, but to proceed. Hitherto my mind was taken up with the beauties of her person only. My eye had drawn my heart after it, without giving myself any trouble about that sense and judgment which my mother was always praising in her Pamela, as exceeding her years and opportunities. But an occasion happened, which, though slight in itself, took the head into the party, and I thought of her, young as she was, with a distinction that before I had not for her. It was this, being with my mother in her closet, who was talking to me on the old subject matrimony. I saw Pamela's commonplace book, as I may call it, in which, by her lady's direction, from time to time, she had transcribed from the Bible, and other good books such passages as most impressed her as she read. A method, I take it, my dear, turning to me, of great service to you, as it initiated you into writing, 
with that freedom and ease which shine in your saucy letters and journals, and to which my present fetters are not a little owing. Just as peddlers catch monkeys in the baboon kingdoms, provoking the attentive fools by their own example, to put on shoes and stockings, till the apes of imitation, trying to do the like, entangle their feet, and so cannot escape upon the boughs of the tree of liberty, on which before they were wont to hop and skip about, and play a thousand puggish tricks. I observed the girl wrote a pretty hand, and very swift and free, and affixed her points or stops with so much judgment, her years considered, that I began to have a high opinion of her understanding. Some observations likewise upon several of the passages were so just and solid that I could not help being tacitly surprised at them. My mother watched my eye and was silent. I seemed not to observe that she did, and after a while laid down the book, shutting it with great indifference and talking of another subject. Upon this my mother said, "'Don't you think Pamela writes a pretty hand, son?' "'I did not mind it much,' said I, with a careless air. "'This is her writing, is it?' "'Taking the book and opening it again, at a place of scripture. "'The girl is mighty pious,' said I. "'I wish you were so, child. "'I wish so too, madam, if it would please you. "'I wish so for your own sake, child. "'So do I, madam.' "'And down I laid the book again very carelessly. "'Look once more in it,' said she, "'and see if you can't open it upon some place that may strike you.' I opened it at, train up a child in the way it should go, etc. I fancy, said I, when I was of Pamela's age, I was pretty near as good as she. Never, never, said my mother. I am sure I took great pains with you, but alas, I to very little purpose. You had always a violent, headstrong will. Some allowances for boys and girls, I hope, madam, but you see I am as good for a man as my sister for a woman. No, indeed you are not, I do assure you. I am sorry for that, madam. You give me a sad opinion of myself. Brazen wretch, said my lady. But go on. Turn to one of the girl's observations on some text, said my mother. I did, and was pleased with it more than I would own. The girl's well enough, said I, for what she is. But let's see what she'll be a few years hence. Then will be the trial. She'll be always good, I doubt not. So much the better for her. But can't we talk of any other subject? You complain how seldom I attend you, and when you are always talking of matrimony, or of this low-born, raw girl, it must needs lessen the pleasure of approaching you. But now, as I hinted to you, ladies and my lord, I had a still higher opinion of Pamela, and esteemed her more worthy of my attempts. For, thought I, the girl has good sense, and it will be some pleasure to watch by what gradations she may be made to rise into love and into a higher life than that to which she was born, and so I began to think she would be worthy in time of being my mistress, which till now, as I said before, I had been a little scrupulous about. I took a little tour soon after this in company of some friends, with whom I had contracted an intimacy abroad, into Scotland and Ireland, they having a curiosity to see those countries, and we spent six or eight months on this expedition, and when I had landed them in France, I returned home, and found my good mother in a very indifferent state of health, but her Pamela arrived to a height of beauty and perfection, which exceeded all my expectations. I was so taken with her charms when I first saw her, which was in the garden, with a book in her hand, just come out of a little summer-house, that I then thought of obliging her to go back again, in order to begin a parley with her. But while I was resolving— she tripped away with her curtsies and reverences, and was out of my sight before I could determine. I was resolved, however, not to be long without her, and Mrs. Dukes, having been recommended to me a little before, by a brother rake, as a woman of tried fidelity, I asked her if she would be faithful, if I had occasion to commit a pretty girl to her care. She hoped, she said, it would be with the lady's own consent, and she should make no scruple in obeying me. So I thought I would waylay the girl and carry her first to a little village in Northamptonshire, to an acquaintance of Mrs. Duke's, and when I had brought her to be easy and pacified a little, I designed that Duke should attend her to Lincolnshire, for I knew there was no coming at her here, under my mother's wing, by her own consent, and that to offer terms to her would be to blow up my project all at once. 
Besides, I was sensible that Mrs. Jervis would stand in the way of my proceedings as well as my mother. End of Letter 30, Part 2《Letter Thirty, Part Three of Pamela, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Pamela, Volume Two, by Samuel Richardson. Letter Thirty, Part Three. The method I had contrived was quite easy as I imagined, and such as could not have failed to answer my purpose as to carrying her off, and I doubted not of making her well satisfied in her good fortune very quickly. For, having a notion of her affectionate duty to her parents, I was not displeased that I could make the terms very easy and happy to them all. What most stood in my way was my mother's fondness for her, but supposing I had got her favourite in my hands, which appeared to me, as I said, a task very easy to be conquered. I had actually formed a letter for her to transcribe, acknowledging a love affair, and laying her withdrawing herself so privately, to an implicit obedience to her husband's commands, to whom she was married that morning, and who, being a young gentleman of genteel family, and dependent on his friends, was desirous of keeping it all a profound secret, and begging on that account her lady not to divulge it, so much as to Mrs. Jervis. And to prepare for this, and make her escape the more probable, when matters were ripe for my plot, I came in one night and examined all the servants, and Mrs. Jervis, the latter in my mother's hearing, about a genteel young man, whom I pretended to find with a pillion on the horse he rode upon, waiting about the back door of the garden, for somebody to come to him and who rode off when I came up to the door as fast as he could. Nobody knew anything of the matter, and they were much surprised at what I told them, but I begged Pamela might be watched, and that no one would say anything to her about it. My mother said she had two reasons not to speak of it to Pamela, one to oblige me, the other, and chief, because it would break the poor innocent girl's heart to be suspected. Poor dear child, said she. Whither can she go to be so happy as with me? Would it not be inevitable ruin to her to leave me? There is nobody comes after her. She receives no letters, but now and then one from her father and mother, and those she shows me. Well, replied I, I hope she can have no design. It would be strange if she had formed any to leave so good a mistress. But you can't be sure all the letters she receives are from her father. And her showing to you those he writes— looks like a cloak to others she may receive from another hand. But it can be no harm to have an eye upon her. You don't know, madam, what tricks there are in the world. Not I, indeed, but only this I know, that the girl shall be under no restraint, if she is resolved to leave me, well as I love her. Mrs. Jarvis said she would have an eye upon Pamela, in obedience to my command, but she was sure there was no need nor would she so much wound the poor girl's peace as to mention the matter to her. This I suffered to blow off, and seemed to my mother to have so good an opinion of her Pamela, that I was sorry, as I told her, I had such a surmise, saying that though the fellow and the pillion were odd circumstances, yet I dared to say there was nothing in it, for I doubted not the girl's duty and gratitude would hinder her from doing a foolish or rash thing. This my mother heard with pleasure, although my motive was but to lay Pamela on the thicker to her, when she was to be told she had escaped. She was glad I was not an enemy to the poor child. Pamela has no friend but me, continued she, and if I don't provide for her, I shall have done her more harm than good, as you and your Aunt B have often said, in the accomplishments I have given her. "'And yet the poor girl I see that,' added she, "'would not be backward to turn her hand to anything "'for the sake of an honest livelihood, were she put to it. "'Which, if it please God to spare me, and she continues good, "'she never shall be. "'I wonder not, Pamela, at your tears on this occasion. "'Your lady was an excellent woman, "'and deserved this tribute to her memory. "'All my pleasure now is, 
that she knew not half my wicked pranks, and that I did not vex her worthy heart in the prosecution of this scheme, which would have given me a severe sting, inasmuch as I might have apprehended, with too much reason, that I had shortened her days by the knowledge of the one and the other. I had thus everything ready for the execution of my project, but my mother's ill state of health gave me too much concern to permit me to proceed, and now and then, as my frequent attendance in her illness gave me an opportunity observing more and more of the girl, her affectionate duty and continual tears, finding her often on her knees praying for her mistress, I was moved to pity her, and while those scenes of my mother's illness and decline were before me, I would resolve to conquer, if possible, my guilty passion, as those scenes taught me, while their impressions held, justly to call it, and I was much concerned to find it so difficult a task, for, till now, I thought it principally owing to my usual enterprising temper, and a love of intrigue, and that I had nothing to do but to resolve against it, and to subdue it. But I was greatly mistaken, for I had insensibly brought myself to admire her in everything she said or did, and there was so much gracefulness, humility, and innocence in her whole behaviour, and I saw so many melting scenes between her lady and her, that I found I could not master my esteem for her. My mother's illness increasing beyond hopes of recovery, and having settled all her greater affairs, she talked to me of her servants. I asked what she would have done for Pamela and Mrs. Jervis. Make Mrs. Jervis, my dear son, as happy as you can. She is a gentlewoman born, you know. Let her always be treated as such. But for your own sake, don't make her independent, for then you'll want a faithful manager. Yet if you marry, and your lady should not value her as she deserves, allow her a competency for the rest of her life, and let her live as she pleases. As for Pamela, I hope you will be her protector. She is a good girl. I love her next to you and your dear sister. She is just arriving at a trying time of life. I don't know what to say for her. What I had designed was, that if any man of a genteel calling should offer, I would give her a little pretty portion. But God spared my life till then. But were she made independent, some idle fellow might snap her up, for she is very pretty or if she should carry what you give her to her poor parents, as her duty would lead her to do. They are so unhappily involved that a little matter would be nothing to them, and the poor girl might be to seek again. Perhaps Lady Davers will take her, but I wish she was not so pretty. She may be the bird for which some wicked fowler will spread his snares, or, it may be, every lady will not choose to have such a waiting maid. You are a young gentleman, and I am sorry to say, not better than I wish you to be, though I hope my Pamela would not be in danger from her master, who owes all his servants protection, as much as the king does to his subjects. Yet I don't know how to wish her to stay with you, for your own reputation's sake, my dear son, for the world will censor as it lists. Would to God, said she, the dear girl had the smallpox in a mortifying manner, She'd be lovely, though, in the genteelness of her person, and the excellencies of her mind, and more out of danger of suffering, from the transient beauties of countenance. Yet I think, added she, she might be safe and happy under Mrs. Jervis's care. And if you marry, and your lady parts with Mrs. Jervis, let them go together, and live as they like. I think that will be the best for both, and you have a generous spirit enough. I will not direct you in the quantum, but my dear son, remember that I am the less concerned, that I have not done for the poor girl myself, because I depend upon you. The manner how fitly to provide for her has made me defer it till now, that I have so much more important concerns on my hands, life and strength ebbing so fast, that I am hardly fit for anything, or to wish for anything, but to receive the last releasing stroke. Here he stopped, being under some concern himself, and we in much more. At last he resumed the subject. You will too naturally think, my lord, 
and you my good ladies that the mind must be truly diabolical that could break through the regard due to the solemn injunctions of a dying parent they did hold me a good while indeed and as fast as i found any emotions of a contrary nature rise in my breast i endeavoured for some time to suppress them and to think and act as i ought but the dear bewitching girl every day rose in her charms upon me and finding she still continued the use of her pen and ink i could not help entertain a jealousy that she was writing to somebody who stood well in her opinion and my love for her and my own spirit of intrigue made it a sweetheart of course and i could not help watching her emotions and seeing her once putting a letter she had just folded up into her bosom at my entrance into my mother's dressing-room i made no doubt of detecting her and her correspondence and so i took the letter from her stays she trembling and curtsying with a sweet confusion and highly pleased i was to find it contained only innocence and duty to the deceased mistress and the loving parents expressing her joy that in the midst of her grief for losing the one she was not obliged to return to be a burden to the other and i gave it her again with the words of encouragement and went down much better satisfied than i had been with her correspondence but when i reflected upon the innocent simplicity of her style i was still more in love with her and formed a stratagem and succeeded in it to come at her other letters which i sent forward after i had read them all but three or four which i kept back when my plot began to ripen for execution although the little slut was most abominably free with my character to her parents you will censor me no doubt that my mother's injunctions made not a more lasting impression but really i struggled hard with myself to give them their due force and the dear girl, as I said, every day grew lovelier and more accomplished. Her letters were but so many links to the chains in which she had bound me, and though once I had resolved to part with her to Lady Davers, and you, madam, had an intention to take her, I could not for my life give her up, and thinking more honourably then of the state of a mistress than I have done since, I could not persuade myself since I intended to do as handsomely by her as ever man did to a lady in that situation, but that I should do better for her than my mother had wished me to do, and so more than answer all her injunctions as to the providing for her, and I could not imagine I should meet with a resistance I had seldom encountered from persons much her superiors as to dissent, and was amazed at it, for it confounded me in all the notions I had of her sex, which, like a true libertine, I supposed wanted nothing but importunity and opportunity, a bold attempter, and a mind not ungenerous. Sometimes I admired her for her virtue, at other times, impetuous in my temper, and unused to control, I could have beat her. She well, I remember, describes the tumults of my soul, repeating what once passed between us, in words like these, take the little witch from me mrs jervis i can neither bear nor forbear her but stay you shan't go yet be gone no come back again she thought i was mad she says in her papers indeed i was a little less she says i took her arm and griped it black and blue to bring her back again and then sat down and looked at her as silly as such a poor girl as she well did she describe the passion i struggled with and no one can conceive how much my pride made me despise myself at times for the little actions my love for her put me upon and yet to find that love increasing every day as her charms and her resistance increased i have caught a raging fit sometimes vowing i would have her and at others jealous that to secure herself from my attempts she would throw herself into the arms of some menial or inferior whom otherwise she would not have thought of sometimes i soothed sometimes threatened her but never was such courage when her virtue seemed in danger mixed with so much humility when her fears gave way to her hopes of a juster treatment then i would think it impossible so slight an opinion had i of woman's virtue that such a girl as this cottage-born who owed everything to my family 
and had an absolute dependence upon my pleasure, myself not despicable in person or mind, as I suppose she unprejudiced in any man's favour, at an age susceptible of impressions, and a frame and constitution not ice or snow. Surely, thought I, all this frost must be owing to the want of fire in my attempts to thaw it. I used to dare more and succeed better. Shall such a girl as this awe me by her rigid virtue? No, she shall not. Then I would resolve to be more in earnest. Yet my love was a traitor that was more faithful to her than to me. It had more honour in it at bottom than I had designed. Awed by her unaffected innocence, and a virtue I had never before encountered, so uniform and immovable, the moment I saw her I was half disarmed, and I courted her consent to that, which though I was not likely to obtain, yet it went against me to think of extorting by violence. Yet marriage was never in my thoughts. I scorned so much as to promise it. To what numberless mean things did not this unmanly passion subject me? I used to watch for her letters, though mere prittle-prattle and chit-chat, received them with delight, though myself was accused in them, and stigmatised as I deserved. I would listen meanly at her chamber door, try to overhear her little conversation, in vain attempted to suborn Mrs. Jervis to my purposes, inconsistently talking of honour, when no one step I took or action I attempted showed anything like it, lost my dignity among my servants, made a party in her favour against me, of everybody, but whom my money corrupted, and that hardly sufficient to keep my partisans steady to my interest. So greatly did the virtue of the servants triumph over the vice of the master, when confirmed by such an example. I have been very tedious, ladies and my Lord Davers, in my narration, but I am come within view of the point for which I now am upon my trial at your dread tribunal, bowing to us all. After several endeavours of a smooth and rough nature, in which my devil constantly failed me, and her good angel prevailed, I had talked to Mrs. Jervis to seduce the girl, to whom, in hopes of frightening her, I had given warning, but which she rejected to take to my great disappointment. To desire to stay, and suspecting Mrs. Jervis played me booty, and rather confirmed her in her coyness, and her desire of leaving me, I was mean enough to conceal myself in the closet in Mrs. Jervis's room, in order to hear their private conversation but really not designing to make any other use of my concealment than to tease her a little. If she should say anything I did not like, which would give me pretence to treat her with greater freedoms than I had ever yet done, and would be an introduction to take off from her unprecedented apprehensiveness another time. But the dear prattler, not knowing I was there, as she undressed herself, begun such a bewitching chit-chat with Mrs. Jervis, who, I found, but ill-kept my secret, that I never was at such a loss what to resolve upon. One, while I wished myself, unknown to them, out of the closet, into which my inconsiderate passion had meanly led me, another time I was incensed at the freedom with which I heard myself treated. But then, rigidly considering that I had no business to hearken to their private conversation, and it was such as became them, while I ought to have been ashamed to give occasion for it. I excused them both, and admired still more and more the dear prattler. In this suspense, the undesigned rustling of my nightgown, from changing my posture, alarming the watchful Pamela, she in a fright came towards the closet to see who was there. What could I then do, but bolt out upon the apprehensive charmer, and having done so, and she running to the bed, screaming to Mrs. Jervis, would not any man have followed her thither, detected as I was? But yet, I said, if she forbore her screaming, I would do her no harm, but if she not, she should take the consequence. I found by their exclamations that this would pass with both for an attempt of the worst kind, but really I had no such intentions as they feared. When I found myself detected, when the dear girl frightened ran to the bed, when Mrs. Jervis threw herself about her, 
when they would not give over their hideous squallings, when I was charged by Mrs. Jervis with the worst designs, it was enough to make me go farther than I designed, and could I have prevailed upon Mrs. Jervis to go up and quiet the maids, who seemed to be rising upon the other screaming, I believe, had Pamela kept out of her fit, I should have been a little freer with her than ever I had been, but as it was, I had no thought but of making as honourable a retreat as I could, and to save myself from being exposed to my whole family, and I was not guilty of any freedoms that her modesty, unaffrighted, could reproach herself with having suffered, and the dear creature's fainting fits gave me almost as great apprehensions as I could give her. Thus, ladies and my lord, have I tediously and little enough to my own reputation given you my character, and told you more against myself than any one person could accuse me of. Whatever redounds to the credit of my Pamela, redounds in part to my own, and so I have the less regret to accuse myself, since it exalts her. But as to a formed intention to hide myself in the closet, in order to attempt the girl by violence, and in the presence of a good woman, as Mrs. Jervis is, which you impute to me, Bad as I was, I was not so vile, so abandoned as that. Love, as I said before, subjects its inconsiderate votaries to innumerable meanness and unlawful passion to many more. I could not live without this dear girl. I hated the thoughts of matrimony with any body, and to be brought to the state by my mother's waiting maid. Forbid it, pride, thought I. Forbid it. Example, forbid it, all my past sneers and constant ridicule, both on the estate and on those who descended to inequalities in it. And lastly, forbid it my family spirit, so visible in Lady Davers, as well as in myself, to whose insults, and those of all the world, I shall be obnoxious if I take such a step. All this tends to demonstrate the strength of my passion. I could not conquer my love, so I conquered a pride, which every one thought unconquerable, and since I could not make an innocent heart vicious, I had the happiness to follow so good an example, and by this means a vicious heart is become virtuous. I have the pleasure of rejoicing in the change, and hope I shall do still more and more, for I really view with contempt my past follies, and it is now a greater wonder to me how I could act as I did than that I should detest those actions which made me a curse, instead of a benefit to society. I am not yet so pious as my Pamela, but that is to come, and it is one good sign, that I can truly say, I delight in every instance of her piety and virtue, and now I will conclude my tedious narration. Thus he ended his affecting relation, which in the course of it gave me a thousand different emotions, and made me often pray for him, that God will entirely convert a heart so generous and worthy as his is on most occasions. And if I can but find him not deviate when we go to London, I shall greatly hope that nothing will affect his morals again. I have just read over again the foregoing account of himself, as near as I remember, and my memory is the best faculty I have. It is pretty exact, only he was fuller of beautiful similitudes, and spoke in a more flowery style, as I may say. Yet don't you think, miss, if I had not done injustice to his spirit, that the beginning of it especially is in the saucy air of a man too much alive to such notions, for so the ladies observed in his narration. Is it very like the style of a true penitent? But indeed he went on better, and concluded best of all, but don't you observe what a dear good lady I had, a thousand blessings on her beloved memory. Were I to live to see my children's children, they should be all taught to lisp her praises before they could speak. My gratitude should always be renewed in their mouths, and God and my dear father and mother, my lady and my master that was, my best friend that is, but principally as most due, the first, who inspired all the rest, should have their morning, their noontide, and their evening praises, as long as I lived. I will only observe farther, 
as to this my third conversation piece, that my Lord Davis offered to extenuate some parts of his dear brother-in-law's conduct, which he did not himself vindicate, and Mr. B. was pleased to say that my Lord was always very candid to him, and kind in his allowances for the sallies of ungovernable youth, upon which my lady said, a little tartly, "'Yes, and for very good reason. I doubt not for who cares to condemn himself.' "'Nay,' said my lord pleasantly, "'don't put us upon a foot, neither, for what sallies I made before I knew your ladyship were but like those of a fox, which now and then runs away with a straggling pullet, when nobody sees him, whereas those of my brother were like the invasions of a lion, breaking into every man's fold, and driving the shepherds as well as the sheep before him.' Ay, said my lady, but I can look round me and have reason, perhaps, to think the invading lion has come off, little as he deserved it, better than the creeping fox, who with all his cunning sometimes suffers for his pilfering theft. Oh, my dear, these gentlemen are strange creatures. What can they think of themselves? For they say there is not one virtuous man in five. But I hope for our sex's sake, as well as for the world's sake, all is not true that evil fame reports. For you know every man trespasser must find or make a woman trespasser. And if so, what a world is this? And how must the innocent suffer from the guilty? Yet how much better it is to suffer oneself than to be the cause of another's sufferings. I long to hear of you, and must shorten my future accounts, or I shall do nothing but write and tire you into the bargain, though I cannot, my dear father and mother, I am, my dear miss, always yours, P.B. End of letter 30, part 3Pamela, Volume 2, by Samuel Richardson. Letter 31. From Miss Downford to Mrs. B. Dear Mrs. B., Every post you more and more oblige us to admire and love you, and let me say, I will gladly receive your letters upon your own terms. Only, when your worthy parents have perused them, see that I have every line of them again. Your account of the arrival of your noble guests and their behaviour to you and yours to them, your conversation and wise determination on the offered title of baronet, the just applauses conferred upon you by all, particularly the good countess, your breakfast conversation and the narrative of your saucy abominable master, though amiable husband, all delight us beyond expression. Do go on, dear excellent lady, with your charming troubles, and let us know all that passes. As to the state of matters with us, I have desired my papa to allow me to decline Mr. Murray's addresses. The good man loved me most violently, nay, he could not live without me. Life was no life unless I favoured him, but yet, after a few more of these flights, he is trying to sit down satisfied without my papa's foolish perverse girl, as Sir Simon calls me, and transpose his affections to a worthier object, my sister Nancy and it would make you smile to see how, a little while before he directly applied to her, she screwed up her mouth to my mamma, and, truly, she'd have none of Polly's leavings. No, not she. But no sooner did he declare himself in form than the gaudy wretch, as he was before with her, became a well-dressed gentleman, the chattering magpie, for he talks and laughs much, quite conversable and has something agreeable to say upon every subject. Once he would make a good master of the buckhounds, but now, really, the more one is in his company, the more polite one finds him. Then, on his part, he happened to see Miss Polly first, and truly he could have thought himself very happy in so agreeable a young lady, yet there was always something of majesty, what a stately name for ill-nature, in Miss Nancy, something so awful that, while Miss Polly engaged the affections at first sight, Miss Nancy struck a man with reverence, insomuch that the one might he loved as a woman, but the other revered as something more, a goddess, no doubt. 
i do but think that when he comes to be lifted up to her celestial sphere as her fellow constellation what a figure nancy and her ursus major will make together and how will they glitter and shine to the wonder of all beholders then she must make a brighter appearance by far and a more pleasing one too for why she has three thousand satellites or little stars in her train more than poor polly can pretend to won't there be a fine twinkling and sparkling think you when the greater and lesser beer stars are joining together but excuse me dear mrs b this saucy girl has vexed me just now by her ill-natured tricks and i am even with her having thus vented my spite though she knows nothing of the matter so fancy you see polly darnford abandoned by her own fault her papa angry at her her mamma pitying her and calling her silly girl mr Murray, who is a rough lover prowling over his mistress as a dog over a bone he fears to lose miss nancy putting on her brutish pleasantry snarling out a kind word and breaking through her sullen gloom for a smile now and then in return and i laughing at both in my sleeve and thinking i shall soon get leave to attend you in town which will be better than twenty humble servants of mr Murray's caste or if i can't that i shall have the pleasure of your correspondence here and enjoy unrivalled the favour of my dear parents which this ill-tempered girl is always envying me forgive all this nonsense i was willing to write something though worse than nothing to show how desirous i am to oblige you had i a capacity or subject as you have but nobody can love you better or admire you more of this you may be assured however unequal in all other respects than your polly darnford i sent you up some of your papers for the good couple in kent pray pay my respects to them and beg you will let me have em again as soon as they can by your conveyance our stamford friends desire their kindest respects they mention you with delight in every letter End of letter thirty one Letter thirty two, part one of Pamela, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Pamela, volume two, by Samuel Richardson. Letter thirty two, part one. The journal continued. Thursday, Friday evening my dear miss darnford i am returned from a very busy day having no less than fourteen of our neighbours gentlemen and ladies to dinner the occasion principally to welcome our noble guests into these parts mr b having as i mentioned before turned the intended visit into an entertainment after his usual generous manner he and lord davers are gone part of the way with them home and lord jackie mounted with his favourite colbrand as an escort to the countess and lady davers who are taking an airing in the chariot they offered to take the coach if i would have gone but being fatigued i desired to be excused so i retired to my closet and miss darnford who is seldom out of my thoughts coming into my mind i had a new recruit of spirits which enabled me to resume my pen and thus i proceed with my journal our company was the earl and countess of d who are so fashionable a married couple that the earl made it his boast and his countess bore it like one accustomed to such treatment that he had not been in his lady's company an hour abroad before for seven years you know his lordship's character everybody does and there is not a worse as report says in the peerage sir thomas atkins a single gentleman not a little finical and ceremonious and a mighty beau though of the tawdry sort and affecting foreign airs as if he was afraid it would not be judged by any other mark that he had travelled mr arthur and his lady a moderately happy couple who seem always when together to behave as if upon a compromise that is that each should take it in turn to say free things of the other though some of their freedoms are of so cutting a nature that it looks as if they intended to divert the company at their own expense the lady being of a noble family strives to let every one know 
that she values herself not a little upon that advantage, but otherwise has many good qualities. Mr. Brooks and his lady, he is a free joker on serious subjects, but a good-natured man, and says sprightly things with no ill grace. The lady a little reserved and haughty, though to-day was freer than usual, as was observed at the table by Lady Towers, who is a maiden lady of family, noted for her wit and repartee, and who says many good things, and with so little doubt, and really so good a grace, that one cannot help being pleased with her. This lady is generally gallanted by Mr. Martin of the Grove, so called to distinguish him from a rich citizen of that name, settled in these parts, but being covetous and proud, is seldom admitted among the gentry in their visits or parties of pleasure. Mr. Dormer, one of a very courteous demeanour, a widower, was another who always speaks well of his deceased lady, and of all the sex for her sake. Mr. Chapman and his lady, a well-behaved couple, not ashamed to be very tender and observing to each other, but without that censurable fondness which sits so ill upon some married folks in company. Then there was the Dean, our good minister, whom I name last, because I would close with one of the worthiest, and his daughter, who came to supply her mamma's place, who was indisposed, a well-behaved prudent young lady, and here were our fourteen guests, the Countess of C., Lord and Lady Davers, Mr. H., my dear Mr. B., and your humble servant made up the rest of the company. Thus we had a capacious and brilliant circle, and all the avenues to the house were crowded with their equipages. The subjects of discourse at dinner were various, as you may well suppose, and the circle was too large to fall upon any regular or very remarkable topics. A good deal of sprightly wit, however, flew about, between the Earl of D., Lady Towers and Mr. Martin, in which that lord suffered as he deserved, for he was no match for the lady, especially as the presence of the dean was a very visible restraint upon him, and Mr. Brooks too. So much awe will the character of a good clergyman always have upon even forward spirits, where he is known to have had an inviolable regard to it himself. Besides, the good gentleman has, naturally, a genteel and inoffensive vein of raillery, and so was too hard for them at their own weapons. But after dinner, and the servants being withdrawn, Mr. Martin singled me out, as he loves to do, for a subject of encomium, and made some high compliments to my dear Mr. B. upon his choice, and wished, as he often does, he could find just such another for himself. Lady Towers told him it was a thing as unaccountable as it was unreasonable that every rake who loved to destroy virtue should expect to be rewarded with it, and if his brother B. had come off so well, she thought no one else ought to expect it. Lady Davis said it was a very just observation, and she thought it a pity there was not a law that every man who made a harlot of an honest woman should be obliged to marry one of another's making. Mr. B. said that would be too severe. It would be punishment enough, if he was to marry his own, and especially if he had not seduced her under promise of marriage. Then you'd have a man be obliged to stand to his promise, I suppose, Mr. B., replied Lady Davers. Yes, madam, but, said she, the proof would be difficult, perhaps, and the most unguilty heart of our sex might be least able to make it out. But what say you, my Lord D., will you and my Lord Davers joined to bring a bill into the House of Peers for the purposes I mentioned. I fancy my brother would give it all the assistance he could in the lower house. Indeed, said Mr. B., if I may be allowed to speak in the plural number, we must not pretend to hold an argument on this subject. What say you, Mr. H., which side are you of? Every gentleman, replied he, who is not of the lady's side, is deemed a criminal, and I was always on the side, repeat and I was always of the side that had the power of the gallows. That shows, returned Lady Towers, that Mr. H. is more afraid of the punishment than of deserving it. Tis well, said Mr. B., 
that any consideration deters a man of Mr. H.'s time of life. What may be fear now may improve to virtue in time. Aye, said Lady Davers. Jackie is one of his uncle's foxes. He'd be glad to snap up a straggling pullet, if he was not well looked after, perhaps. Pray, my dear, said Lord Davers. Forbear. You ought not to introduce two different conversations into different companies. Well, but, said Lady Arthur, since you seem to have been so hard put to it, as single men, what's to be done with the married man who ruins an innocent body? What punishment, Lady Towers, shall we find out for such a one, and what reparation to the injured? This was said with a particular view to the Earl, on a late scandalous occasion, as I afterwards found. As to the punishment of the gentleman, replied Lady Towers, where the law is not provided for it, it must be left, I believe, to his conscience. It will then one day be heavy enough, but as to the reparation to the woman, so far as it can be made, it will be determinable, as the unhappy person may, or may not know, that her seducer is a married man. If she knows he is, I think she neither deserves redress nor pity, though it elevate not his guilt. But if the case be otherwise, and she had no means of informing herself that he was married, and he promised to make her his wife, to be sure, though she cannot be acquitted, he deserves the severest punishment that can be inflicted. What say you, Mrs. B? If I must speak, I think that since custom now exacts so little regard to virtue from men, and so much from women, and since the designs of the former upon the latter are so flagrantly avowed and known, the poor creature who suffers herself to be seduced, either by a single or married man, with promises or without, has only to sequester herself from the world, and devote the rest of her days to penitence and obscurity. As to the gentleman, added I, he must, I doubt, be left to his conscience, as you say, Lady Towers, which he will one day have enough to do to pacify. Every young lady has not your angelic perfection, madam, said Mr. Dormer, and there are cases in which the fair sex deserve compassion. Ours execration. Love may insensibly steal upon a soft heart. When once admitted, the oaths, vows, and protestations of the favoured object, who declaims against the deceivers of his sex, confirm her good opinion of him, till having lulled asleep her vigilance, in an unguarded hour, he takes advantage of her unsuspecting innocence. Is not such a poor creature to be pitied? And what punishment does not such a seducer deserve? You have put, sir, said I, a moving case, and in a generous manner. What, indeed, does not such a deceiver deserve? And the more, said Mrs. Chapman, as the most innocent heart is generally the most credulous. Very true, said my countess for such a one as would do no harm to others, seldom suspects any from others, and her lot is very unequally cast, admired for that very innocence which tempts some brutal ravager to ruin it. Yet what is that virtue, said the dean, which cannot stand the test? But, said Lady Towers, very satirically, whither, ladies, are we got? We are upon the subject of virtue and honour. Let us talk of something, in which the gentleman can join with us. This is such a one, you see, that none but the dean and Mr. Dormer can discourse upon. Let us then, retorted Mr. Martin, to be even with one lady at least, find a subject that will be new to her, and that is charity. Does what I said concern Mr. Martin more than any other gentleman, returned Lady Towers, that he is disposed to take offence at it? "'You must pardon me, Lady Towers,' said Mr. B. "'But I think a lady should never make a motion "'to waive such subjects as those of virtue and honour. "'And less still, in company, "'where there is so much occasion, "'as she seems to think, for enforcing them. "'I desire not to waive the subject, I'll assure you,' replied she. "'And if, sir, you think it may do good, "'we will continue it for the sakes of all you gentlemen.' "'Looking round her archly,' who are of opinion you may be benefited by it. A health to the king and royal family, brought on public affairs and politics, and the ladies withdrawing to coffee and tea, 
I have no more to say as to this conversation, having repeated all that I remember was said to any purpose. End of Letter 32 Part 1